I once saw him as perhaps no one else has ever seen him. I was walking over to him at Gaspra, along the coast and behind Yusupov's estate on the shore among the stones. I saw his smallish, angular figure in a gray, crumpled, ragged suit and crumpled hat. He was sitting with his head on his hands, the wind blowing the silvery hairs of his beard through his fingers. He was looking into the distance out to sea, and the little greenish waves rolled up obediently to his feet and fondled them as though they were telling something about themselves to the old magician. It was a day of sun and cloud, and the shadows of the clouds glided over the stones. And with the stones, the old man grew now bright and now dark. The boulders were large, riven by cracks and covered with smelling seaweed. There had been a high tide. He too seemed to me like an old stone come to life, who knows all the beginnings and the ends of things, who considers when and what will be the end of the stones, the grasses of the earth, of the waters of the sea, and of the whole universe from the pebble to the sun. And the sea is part of his soul, and everything around him comes from him, out of him. In the musing motionlessness of the old man, I felt something fateful, magical, something which went down into the darkness beneath him and stretched up like a searchlight into the blue emptiness above the earth, as though it were he, his concentrated will, which was drawing the waves to him and repelling them, which was ruling the movements of cloud and shadow, which was stirring the stones to life. Suddenly, in a moment of madness, I felt it is possible. He will get up, wave his hand, and the sea will become solid and glassy. The stones will begin to move and cry out. Everything around him will come to life, acquire a voice, and speak in their different voices of themselves, of him against him. I cannot express in words what I felt rather than thought at that moment. In my soul there was joy and fear and then everything blended in one happy thought. I am not an orphan on this earth, so long as this man lives on it. Hey everybody, thank you as always for watching Leaf by Leaf. My name is Chris, I am 38 years old, and I have just read War and Peace for the first time. I'm gonna keep these opening remarks very minimal because there's a lot of video coming behind me. But I just want to take a second to tell you sort of how this video is set up and why it's so long. What I attempted to do was capture my thoughts about War and Peace as I was reading it for the first time, without any recourse to any supplementary material, but just capture my raw thoughts. So every couple hundred pages, I took a break and got in front of this camera and just talked about my thoughts so far. And so you'll see as you watch through it how my thoughts change and evolve and merge and so on. And I thought that could be a really neat way to make sure that by the end of 1400 pages of reading, I actually touched on everything I wanted to touch on. And furthermore, touched on it with the energy of that visceral reaction. And the way this video is structured is in the order in which I read everything. And so you'll see that there is my choice of which translation, small clip talking about that, then the commentary of the book in chunks as I was reading it, and then you get to the critical texts, and then you get to the biographies, because that is exactly the way in which I read everything. A couple of opening remarks, and then I'll let you go into the video. One, taking time to read deeply and think widely about War and Peace and its gargantuan author really exposed me to how many incorrect assumptions I had about both book and author. Tolstoy's evolution from a young Dionysus to a family man to a novelist to a thinker to a prophet is as interesting as it is heartbreaking. His wife said, I lived with Lev Nikolaevich for 48 years, but I never really learned what kind of man he was. Tolstoy is indeed a very complicated figure, and he could only seem to deal with his life when he transmuted his problems through his characters. In other words, he handed his problems over to his characters to deal with. 
Hence that disparity between the artist and the man. The more evidence we possess about Tolstoy, the less he makes sense. He has a very poetic life, exemplified most notably in the fact that as a child, his brother showed him in the woods where there was a little green stick buried that had the key to paradise on earth. That is the very place that Tolstoy would be buried. And finally, war and peace unquestionably deserves its place and continues to justify its place to this day as one of the world's greatest novels. Since this is such a massive book, and I'll be spending a lot of time with it, it is very important to choose the right translation. So I want to talk just a minute about how I went about selecting the translation in which I will read War and Peace for the first time. I've had this massive, bulky, yet flaccid and floppy Pavir Volokonsky translation for a very long time, long enough to where there's a good bit of foxing on the leaves. Since all the other Tolstoy I've read and the Dostoyevsky that I've read is Pavir Volokonsky, I thought, I'll just follow in suit. But then the more I compared, the more I realized that this probably isn't going to be right for the first read. This one is about 1,200 pages. It includes footnotes in the pages, not notes moved to the back. It also translates the French in the footnotes. So if you can't read the deliberately incorrect French, I mean, it's close enough, but Tolstoy was trying to make a point with these Russians using a mix of proper and slang and just corrupted French and English and Russian. But if you don't want to continue to go back and forth with your eyes from the text proper to the translation at the bottom and then try to find your place again, I wouldn't choose this one. And again, the, something about it is just doesn't feel right in the hands. It's really just, like I said, flaccid. So much so to where the pages just want to curl so much. I really have to sit here and get them straightened up so that the text doesn't seem like it's on a geodesic or, a, or an arch. And early on in the very first chapter, when Prince Vasily bows down in front of Anna Pavlovna, it says that he presented her with his perfumed and shining bald pate. And I loved that. I love that rich word. Instead of just saying head or top of the head, pate is perfect and gives you the idea of that bald spot and, and the shininess of it and that it's been perfumed. Pate just goes perfectly. I also have a three volume hardcover set box set, in fact, that I got for my birthday years and years ago. It's the Mod Translation. Now, the thing about the Mod Translation is that this is the only one that has Tolstoy's stamp of approval himself. He knew the Mods. The Mods were good friends of his. They spoke impeccable Russian. They shared a lot of Tolstoy's views on life, though not all. Theirs runs about 1,600 pages, but it's split into these nice, little volumes that feel good in the hand and have really good kerning in the type. But this one says that Prince Vasily presented her with his bald, scented, and shining head. Both the Maud and the Pavir Volokonsky seek to be a more literal translation. But, you know, that kind of put me on the edge of these two, pate versus head. I just, I tend towards pate. And the French is handled in line, so it's translated in line. And then there's the Penguin Deluxe Edition of the newest Anthony Briggs translation. This is British English, so you're going to get things like frittered and ghastly and people calling each other chap and things like that. It isn't so overdone, at least not from what I've skimmed through and read so far. Is it, it isn't as overdone as some of the newer Penguin Deluxe translations of Proust, which I just... I can't abide by that, and that's why I feel like the Lydia Davis as Swan's Way was a wise choice, 
because that's absolutely the best person to translate Proust, but it wasn't a wise choice because it just so overtowers all the other volumes. Nonetheless, this one retains the word pate, which is apparently a big deal for me. It runs about 1,300 pages, so roughly 100 more pages than the Puvir Volokonsky, even though this one doesn't have footnotes because, well, it has notes, but they're moved to the back, and I'm not including all of the extra material in my 1300 page count but it translates the french in line but makes clear to the reader that so and so was using french or that they used an incorrect french or they mixed lofty russian with crude french this is because there are a lot of extra details in here briggs one of his main goals was to make a very smooth translation that would appeal to the widest possible audience and draw people in and make the ride smooth. Just a good reading experience. And I'm a sucker for Deckled Edge. It just has that stately, confident feel in the hand. And even though it is so chunky, it's made such that holding it isn't a burden at all. Furthermore, in this translation, Prince Vasily presents to Anna Pavlovna a perfumed and glistening bald pate. So all in all, between the Pavir Volokonsky, the Mods, and the Anthony Briggs, I determined that in the end, the smoothest read and the one with the most clarity of what's going on is going to be the one that I go with for my very first read of War and Peace. Because that first read of a book like this, well, first of all, we already know ahead of time that War and Peace is so important to world literature that we're not going to read it just one time. So for the first time, I'm going to go with the translation that makes the ride smoothest in terms of grasping the story and the characters and the setting and all of Tolstoy's elevated and deep thoughts about life. And then as I continue on with subsequent reads of War and Peace, I'll try out other translations. So for the purposes of this video, I will be using the Penguin Deluxe paperback of War and Peace translated by Anthony Briggs. All right, I have just read the first 200 pages of War and Peace for the first time. So I wanted to take a break before moving on in the book and share my thoughts so far. To be honest with you, I just started reading this the way that I used to read as a kid. And it's a way that I would like to try to start reading more and more because the story is so richly detailed and so textured. And it caused me to just sort of fall under its spell pretty much right from the start. We open in 1805 in a Petersburg Salon with a society woman putting on a soiree. Her name is Anna Pavlovna, and Prince Vasily is the first guest to arrive. And so it's the peace part of War and Peace. Yet right on the very first page, she mentions Napoleon's French army basically overthrowing Vienna and war between France and Russia being imminent. Sorry, it wasn't Vienna that was defeated. It was Genoa and Luca. So it's already there, both sides of this novel. But to be honest with you, you know, I was all poised to just be marking my book up and taking all these notes and so on. But really, these first 200 pages, I just sort of went back to childlike reading and just let the story carry me. And it has been so enjoyable. And it just so happens that I feel like with the scene that happens right at the 200 page mark in the Penguin Deluxe Anthony Briggs translation, it sort of felt right as a stopping point because in that moment was the most intense scene so far. And the intensity of that scene is the result of the culmination of every sentence leading up to it. And so it's just Tolstoy is weaving this world that's so sprawling already and sprawling in the sense of human psychology 
and in different situations. And you can see already so many of the different characters' desires and pursuits, their strengths and weaknesses, the different alliances that are forming, the plans that are being hatched either in the scope of warfare or in the sort of analogous realm of love. But first of all, I'll just talk a little bit about how I'm approaching this. And especially since, like I said, I'm sort of letting my critical, analytical, literary criticism infused brain sort of recede into the shadows and just letting the playful, curious, grateful reader come to the foreground. The way that I am taking notes and tagging things as I go along on this first read so as not to interrupt the smoothness of the of the journey and the magic of the story too much is I'm using a bunch of different colored post-it tabs, these little flag tabs, and the colors are corresponding to categories of things. And so, so far I've come up with seven categories that are kind of standing out to me. One is history. So this is ideas and thoughts that Tolstoy has put in here that have to do with history as a process, as a concept, as a philosophical idea. And so that corresponds to my blue tabs. Corresponding to my red tabs is Russia. So thoughts about Russia, the opening pages where Anna Pavlovna is saying that Russia is going to have to save Europe. Russia is going to be the savior of the Europe of, of Europe and so on. And then the big questions. So these big questions that from what I know of Tolstoy and his other work, these are the things that really preoccupied him. So those correspond to my green tabs. This is anything about life and death and God and love and fortune, fate, and so on. Thoughts, just striking thoughts that are dropped in or corresponding to my yellow tabs. Any literary references. So already there's been one to Lawrence Stern and another one to Homer's Iliad. So I've marked both of those with my orange tabs. War corresponds to my purple tabs, and then things about the characters correspond to my lime green tabs. Now, this is only the first 200 pages, so we may end up with more tabs. I might have to buy a larger uh, color assortment pack. And what I'm doing is I'm putting those categories on this title page that you get in here, and then writing the corresponding page numbers. And then on the left page that's blank, I'm just taking little notes about the different main characters as they come out, so, such as Prince Andrei Bolkonsky having a, a hero complex and being somewhat conflicted because he reveres Napoleon as a triumphant hero, while at the same time, you know, Bolkonsky is fighting for the Russians against Napoleon. Prince Andre, he has heroic aspirations, and he very much wants to take fate into his own hands. He sees that as a possibility. Pierre Bezukhov, on the other hand, is this easygoing, overgrown child who inherits a fortune at his father's death, doesn't really know what to do with it, so then Prince Vasily is ingratiating himself and sort of inserting himself as uh, Pierre's wealth management advisor. But he's also orchestrating some other things. And Pierre is sort of a fatalist. He's sort of kind of just letting fate have its way. He's not really interested, at least that I can tell, like uh, Prince Andre in taking his life by the reins and navigating it as he would see fit. So it's a good contrast between those two. Another thing I'm doing to supplement my reading of War and Peace is to read alongside it the daily thoughts of the world's sacred texts and wisdom that Tolstoy put together over something like a 12 or 15 year period. This was the work that he was the most excited about. He wanted to encircle himself daily with the greatest thoughts from the greatest thinkers in the world, from African, Chinese proverbs through Kant, Montaigne, all the Greek and Romans, Cicero, Epictetus, Confucius, John Ruskin, Thomas Jefferson, the Bible, Ralph Waldo Emerson, George Eliot. So all these different thinkers 
across the ages and across the world. He wanted to assemble them such that there is a daily reading. So this is almost like a devotional. This was the work that he was apparently the most excited about and did see it published in a couple of revisions in his time. And then thankfully Scribner put it out in a nice little hardcover here in an English translation for the first time. So I'm using the days corresponding to the days of the calendar that I'm reading War and Peace just to read them and get more in the mindset of what it was that this great author saw as the world's wisdom that nourished his soul. And as it would happen, the entry for October 13th, which was the day yesterday that I got to the 200 page mark and decided to make this video segment, we get this. A state system, no matter what kind of state system it is, functions at a far remove from the requirements of Christianity. In those countries where wise people are in power, their subjects do not notice the existence of their rulers. And that's from Lao Tzu. State violence cannot be destroyed by decree, only by truth and love. Maybe state violence was necessary for previous generations. Maybe it is even necessary now. But people should conceive of a kind of future government in which violence will not be necessary. And then for each day, he has this kind of highlight or closing thought. And the one for this day was, you should live in such a way that violence is not necessary for you. Of the supplementary material that comes with this edition of War and Peace, I have read the introduction and I've read just the first page of the afterword from the translator, Anthony Briggs. And I like how he says, Tolstoy begins his novel by throwing an evening party to welcome his characters and his readers. There is something enchanting about the way that this opens. Instead of opening with some high intensity war scene or something that's more has more immediacy for the grip, we see that Tolstoy, and especially, you know, in hindsight, that seeing how big this book is, Tol Tolstoy isn't interested in temporary, ephemerality, hit him hard and fast, hook him. No, he wants to invite us in and keep sort of wooing us and ushering us deeper and deeper and deeper into this narrative, into this time, into the characters' lives, into the thoughts that the author is going to start opening up for us. And it's just incredible to have something like this to read. These are the days where a novelist was seen as a figure to be revered. A novelist is a great thinker and someone who has the ability to really expose and put the truth of the world in front of us, to meet all of us exactly where we are. And it sort of ties into what I've said in my video about on reading big books, where I liken big books to long committed relationships. The more time you spend with characters, the more time you spend in a story, the richer each moment is going to be. It's just like TV shows of today. This is why we have so many seasons that keep going. As you get more and more acquainted with the characters and you get to know their personalities, what makes them tick, as you get to get in on the inside jokes and you have the history of the interactions of all the different relationships and what has happened, what hasn't happened, their longings, their sufferings, the more meaningful each new moment becomes. And so in the same way, we're forced with a book like War and Peace to sit back and take a deep breath and just cultivate our relationship. And the way we cultivate that relationship is the same way that we cultivate our relationships with people, you know, relationships that we want to work out for the long term. And that is just spending that time together each day, not thinking about just getting through or making it through this dinner or trying to get to the end. In fact, the way that we read this book, as in the way we pursue a loving relationship or friendship, is that really we don't want to get to the end. We want to stay in the story, in the relationship, in the commitment for itself.
It's amazing that already Tolstoy has just proven himself so adept at depicting the peace of high society and the rigors of warfare. The detail and texture and just the vividness and the depth of his psychological introspection across characters is astonishing. If he wants you to feel drowsy and overindulgent, you're going to feel that way. If he wants you to be terrified and almost ducking to dodge bullets and cannonballs, you're going to feel that way. Right at this 200 page mark, we're in the standoff against the French in 1805, and there are two characters who have separate scenes where Tolstoy sort of zooms in on them with the camera. One is with Rostov and one is with Tushin. And these zoom in moments are absolutely gripping. In fact, these are the types of moments from which saying that something is gripping got its name. Because it felt in that moment as if Tolstoy's hands reached out of the page and grabbed me on either side of my face and sort of just pulled me into the text and caused me to unblinkingly and white knuckledly live through it. And from the introduction, I think this really highlights those moments. Tolstoy was obsessed with the idea of writing a historical novel which would contrast the real texture of historical experience as lived by individuals and communities with the distorted image of the past presented by historians. So he's not wanting to just give us all the facts and everything from the standpoint of a historian of war and a time and place, but from the ground and from across an array of characters whose lives are going on, even when they don't have any direct connection with war, with these huge shakeups in history, because it isn't as if everybody's life gets put on hold. And it also made me establish a connection or sense a connection in what Tolstoy is doing with War and Peace to what William T. Volman is doing with his Seven Dreams series. Volman is not interested in adding yet another history book to the mix of these different skirmishes and flashpoints in the history and evolution of North America. No, he wants to get in there and make alive to us the rich texture of the span of human life that was going on at the times of these moments. So the big questions that have come up so far, how can one feel well when one is suffering in a moral sense? Can any sensitive person find peace of mind nowadays? And, you know, it really comes into contrast when you think about what's going on between Russia and Ukraine right now. The old moral question of, is it right to be settled and be relaxed knowing that there's such turmoil and devastation going on? I simply can't understand why men can't get by without war. Why is it we women don't want anything to do with it, don't need it? And this one is truthful, but wrapped in a little bit of humor. Oh, my dear Count, money, money, money. How much trouble it causes this world, said the Countess. But I do need it very much. We are all in God's hands. One man can die in his bed over the stove while God spares another in battle. It's yet another one of those big questions that comes up in ethics courses and the branch of morality. How can we be okay knowing that these people are starving to death over here and these people are overindulging in the most expensive restaurant in the world over here? I've kept faith with people, given them my love and sacrificed everything, but you can't succeed nowadays without being mean and horrible. Almost a little bit of Machiavelli in there. What do we mean by succeed? And are we saying that the ends justify the means? Here is an excerpt that I grouped under thoughts on history. Napoleon was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He's got some splendid soldiers. And besides that, he picked the Germans to attack first. You'd have to be pretty slow not to beat the Germans. Since time began, everybody has beaten the Germans. 
and they've never beaten anybody except each other. In our post-Double World War era from which we read this, it's quite a chilling pas passage to read. Thoughts on Russia. Like I said, Russia alone must be Europe's savior. And boy, we understand what Anna Pavlovna means there in this historical setting and what's going on, but just amazing to, to read this now. Russia has a complicated geographical identity, even to this day. It's so sprawling that it's partly in Asia and partly in Europe. And it's notable that at the time Tolstoy is writing, there's still this great debate between Slavophiles and Europhiles. And the Slavophiles view the ancient capital, Moscow, as representative of the Asianness or Slavicness of Russia. Whereas the people in the cultural capital of Russia today, St. Petersburg, they're more towards the figure who lent St. Petersburg his name, Peter the Great, who opened up the window to Europe and wanted to really Europeanize Russia. And just that seed of thinking of being the imperial savior and doing things such that you're the savior of a great mass of people. I'm putting this in contrast of United States history, too. News of Count Bezukov's death reached us before your letter. My father was very moved by it. He says the Count was the last but one representative of the great century. And the uh, Count Bezukov, who's dying here or has died, this is Pierre's father. And Pierre will inherit this vast fortune. But that era of the great century, this refers to the Russia of Catherine the Great. And I've already noticed several different descriptions of paintings or portraits of Catherine the Great in different drawing rooms and so on. Catherine is this emblem of a noble and mighty Russia. Some thoughts that really stood out to me so far. At a time of departure and change, thinking people usually find themselves in a serious frame of mind. At such a time, you tend to review the past and make plans for the future. And that just popped out at me because maybe it's the, the use of time of departure, and I can't help but connect that with a flight, arrivals and departures. But this is exactly how I get every time I travel, air travel. I get really serious and some of it is just some of it is just the sort of tension anticipation a little bit of anxiety you know making sure i've got all the documents i need making sure i packed everything i need getting through security and all of that i always get a, a little more tense and reflective and i do i start sort of reflecting on everything that's been going on and what i might want to do next as if that journey is sort of a, a a break and a change of pace in my timeline where i can take a moment to choose you know which path i want to take next but it might be small but it popped out to me i must cross that line but i can't i just can't do it and this is talking about Pierre crossing this line that will basically establish the fact that he is going to marry Prince Vasily's daughter, Elaine. And he's really, you know, ambivalent about this. But what I loved about this is that this actually echoes a divide, an invisible line in warfare between the, the opposing sides. And it got me really thinking about that dividing line appearing between love and between warfare and just how similar they are and how they are not. And so we go back to that dividing line in warfare. One step across that dividing line, so like the one between the living and the dead, and you enter an unknown world of suffering and death. What will you find there? Who will be there? There, just beyond that field, that tree, that sunlit roof, no one knows, and yet you want to know. You dread crossing that line, and yet you still want to cross it. You know sooner or later you will have to go across and find out what is there beyond it, just as you must inevitably find out what lies beyond death. Yet here you are, 
fit and strong, carefree and excited, with men all around you just the same, strong, excited, and full of life. This is what all men think when they get a sight of the enemy, or they feel it if they do not think it. And it is this feeling that gives a special luster and a delicious edge to the awareness of everything that is now happening. I can't convey to you just how intense the descriptions of not only these scenes, but what's going on in people's heads are. And here towards the end of the first 200 pages, these descriptions of the war scenes and the what's going through the characters' minds and what they're seeing is just chilling. I don't read a lot of war literature, war narratives. I mean, maybe Storm of Steel, The Naked and the Dead, not many. In the center, where the emissaries had come over that morning, the lines came, the lines meaning the French line and the Russian line of fighters, the lines came so close together that the soldiers of the two armies could see each other's faces and talk to each other. This reminded me of a moment when I was in Israel back in March, and we went to a very, very narrow section of the Jordan, and Jordan was right there. I mean, I, if I had just walked through the water 10 steps, I would have crossed from Israel to Jordan. And there were people, other, there were tourists on the Jordan side. There were armed IDF soldiers on this side and armed Jordanian soldiers on this side. And I mean, you could see, just like Tolstoy narrates here, I could see the color of their eyes. I could see their facial expressions. And just to think that dividing line is both there and not there, and it's so close. And I just thought, man, what would it feel like if we weren't at peace, but we were at war and they're right there? And I think that reading War and Peace is as close as I'll ever get or I'll ever want to get. With all the fearful clamor and banging and the need to concentrate and keep busy, Tushin never felt the slightest nasty touch of fear. And the idea that he might be killed or badly wounded never entered his head. Quite the reverse. He felt more and more buoyant. The moment he had first seen the enemy and fired his first shot now seemed a long, long time ago. Yesterday, maybe. And that little plot of earth where he now stood was a familiar place, and he felt at home in it. He missed nothing, thought of every last detail, and did everything as well as the finest officer could have done in his situation. But nevertheless, he was always in a state of mind not far from feverish delirium, or the abandonment of a drunk. The devastating sound of his own guns around him, the whoosh and bang of enemy shells, the sight of his gunners, red-faced and sweating as they rushed around the cannons, the sight of blood from men and horses and the puffs of smoke from the enemy across the hillside, inevitably followed by a cannonball soaring across and hitting the earth, a man, a horse, or a gun. All of this created for him a fantastic world of his own, which for the moment gave him immense pleasure. He imagined the enemy guns not as guns, but pipes, from which an invisible smoker blew puffs of smoke every so often. So I can tell you that after the first 200 pages of reading this book for the first time, I'm all in. I'm totally in thrall. I mean, this book has me by the throat and by the heart and mind. I'm just as interested now in the different pursuits of the high society in Petersburg and Moscow as I am in the warfare between the French and the Russians. I feel for Pierre. I feel for Andre. I want to know if Andre gets his wish in the ranks of the military. And I want to know what happens between Pierre and Ellen. And at the same time, I fear for both of their fates. And now I am at page 424. So I've read roughly another 200 pages since the first segment of the reading of the book proper. A couple of notes just in general. Tolstoy has this remarkable ability to draw me in emotionally to these characters and situations. So much so that with certain unfortunate events, deaths, duels, births, injuries, epiphanies, 
I find myself emotionally responding. And some of the time that I'm emotionally responding to what I'm reading, it seems so out of the blue. I, I didn't even realize I was so emotionally invested. And at this point, I can't really pinpoint what it is that Tolstoy is doing that is drawing me in like this and creating sympathy and even empathy for some characters and situations. And to be honest, I don't really want to analyze it and, and try to parse it out at this point. I'm just enjoying the fact that a novelist is doing what a great novelist does so well, and that is opens up the world of his characters, the reality of his characters in such a way to where it's part of my reality. Another thing I really like that keeps happening is something will unfold that just seems ordinary it's and, and familiar. It's something that we would expect. But then Tolstoy will add in one more little layer of complexity, or he will have already sort of front loaded us with some sort of psychological dependency or neurosis or some character's lack of confidence in a certain area or just something that's nagging at them internally, such that when something unexpected manifests itself, you make that connection. Ah, I understand where that manifestation is coming from. Just as a small example, Princess Maria. Princess Maria, I feel so bad for her. She is described as being fat and ugly and undesirable, and she and everyone around her know it, yet she yearns for a man's love in this mortal and physical life. And at the same time, she's ashamed of it. Her traditional Russian Orthodox morals are instilling her with shame at wanting this because these desires are something that should be renounced, that shouldn't be a part of a proper young lady. Yet her father, in front of everybody, including a young suitor, Prince Vasily, has brought his son Anatole, the one that from the opening pages with Anna Pavlovna, we saw that his response to Anna Pavlovna was more like, I know I'm a horrible parent and I know that Anatole isn't as great as Hippolyte, the other son. Nonetheless, once again, as with Pierre and Hélène, Vasily is making match, is playing matchmaker with his son Anatole and Princess Maria. And Princess Maria's father, the elder Bolkonsky, in front of everybody, including Anatole, who's there to visit her with his father Vasily, calls her ugly in front of everyone. He's disgusted by the fact that she's even tried to doll herself up at all, and it, he's saying it, it makes her look horrible. And this is such a, oh, such an uncomfortable moment, and I just feel so bad for Maria. Yet at the same time, this is an example of where Tolstoy has front-loaded us with the fact that, ironically, the elder prince, Volkonsky, loves Maria so much, he really doesn't want to let her go. He doesn't want her to get married. And it's amazing how we'll hurt those closest to us. That's a, an old saying, but here Tolstoy draws this out perfectly, and it's just one example of how he can sketch the interior of characters and then make those connections in those exterior manifestations. There are these different love triangles that are being woven and unwoven. One is between Dolokhov, Sonia and Rostov. So Rostov, that is Nikolai Rostov, is living in a house with his cousin, Sonia. And he's well aware of the fact that Sonia is in love with him. They haven't acted on this love at all. But it's a love that you can tell Rostov, it flatters him, I believe. And at the same time that he doesn't want to act on it, he appreciates it and wants to secure it and maintain it exclusively for himself. So a bit of pride and selfishness here. While his friend who comes over, Dolokhov, falls for 
Sonia and he even proposes to her and she rejects him. Well, he is well aware at this point that the rejection is coming from her love of his friend Rostov. Well, at the same time, there's a triangle between, like I said, Anatole, Prince Vasily's son, Maria Bokonsky, and Maria's sort of handmaiden or helper. I don't know exactly what you refer to her as, but it's a French girl, Mademoiselle Bourrienne or Amélie. And Tolstoy shows us that Anatole and Mademoiselle Bourrienne are both very much drawn to each other. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh, okay, I see where this is headed. Maria and Anatole are going to get married. Anatole and Bourrienne are going to take all kinds of opportunities to have all kinds of different escapades. And then Maria is going to find out she's already lacking the confidence that comes with good looks and so on she's already got an inferiority complex and you know she's just going to crush her and you, you it's that car accident you can't look away from well tolstoy switches it up on us a little bit and he goes ahead and has maria understand because she's a sharp girl she perceives and, and understands oh my goodness there is this strong chemical bond between anatole and my friend amelie and she loves Mademoiselle Bohien so much that she, Maria, doesn't want to deny her that love that can be had, that carnal, immediate attraction. And so Maria actually decides that she will stop at nothing to make sure that Anatole and her friend Amélie Bohien get to experience this love. And this says a lot about Princess Maria and really won me over and i'm just pulling for her so much she's smart perceptive she's humble and she wants to deny herself what could be had so that she can see others close to her achieve it and as we'll see as things move on this letting go of her own wants and desires the way that she could be filling her time in order to assist others namely her brother Andrei Volkonsky will just continue to develop. There's another triangle that forms here, and this one introduces Dolokhov again. And this is in the form of rumors that Dolokhov and Pierre's wife, Hélène, have been carrying on an affair that's well known by everybody. Well, this is repressed within Pierre to the point where he finally just loses it and challenges Dolokhov to a duel. And in that duel, Pierre goes so far as to wound. And in fact, as Tolstoy does over and over, he keeps whether someone has died or not ambiguous so that you're not really sure. And in fact, I'm still not totally sure that there was an affair going on between Dolokhov and Ellen. I think there was, but I'm not totally sure. In any case, this leads Pierre to nearly kill Dolokhov. And then he and Hélène split up. He gives most of his estate over to her and he goes off to be on his own. And now I can see the two points of an emerging triangle forming between Denisov and Natasha. I don't know who that third point of the triangle is going to be, but the attraction between Denisov and Natasha is definitely there. Now, in addition to these different triangles, what happens in the 200 pages that I've read now, roughly 200 to page 400? And this is what's drawing me in more than anything else and is exemplary in my mind of what we think of when we think about Tolstoy's writing and his pursuits in his life, his pursuits, his association with greatness and the soul and eternity and righteousness and good and wisdom. What he has done that makes me want to take the rest of the week and next week off work and just sit around and read War and Peace is that he has used three characters, Nikolai Rostov, Pierre Bazukov, 
and Andre Bolkonsky to set up and show us three different epiphanies or three different moments of revelation, three different turning points in these lives. And I can tell what he's doing is he is contrasting the paths that led all three characters there and then the paths they'll take on the other side of it. Andre Bolkonsky, as I've talked about earlier, was enamored with Napoleon, with greatness and glory and honor. He wants to be praised by the masses. Well, he ends up wounded during the battle at Austerlitz, and he's taken prisoner by the French and even comes into contact with his hero. Now, this is where the old adage, never meet your heroes, comes into play. Because while he's wounded, he is staring up at the sky, which sort of opens up before his eyes and unveils the concept of infinity, this infinite sky. Well, suddenly, in this epiphany, this revelation, this turning point, suddenly, Everything that Napoleon stands for, for Andrei Bolkonsky, is shattered. Valor and honor and majesty and greatness, these all are suddenly senseless. And Napoleon is seen as a useless little fellow. Now, Tolstoy makes, like I said, ambiguous whether Andrei Bolkonsky dies or not. The camera sort of leaves him in a hospital there where a French doctor has said there's nothing to be done for him, he's gonna die. Pierre Bezukov, like I said, ends up in a duel challenging Dolokhov, whom he believes is his wife's lover, nearly mortally wounds him and then breaks up with Ellen and then goes off to be on his own. This sets his turning point into motion. And, you know, I just so feel for Pierre because he never really wanted any of this life to begin with. He inherited all the wealth and all of the crushing responsibility that came with it. He inherited, you know, all these estates and workers and taxes and all these different things. And we'll see as we progress on that he has to become a businessman, something he is not interested in at all or cut out for. And Vasily pulled the wool over his eyes to get him to marry Ellen. He never really wanted to do that. And so now it's just sort of all sort of crashing down around him, you know, and he's not really sure what to do with his life. Well, he then meets a Freemason, and this Freemason points him to faith and the creed of Freemasonry. And so we see that in the midst of the despair that Pierre is feeling, he now sets his eyes on faith as the path to take. This will be brought into stark contrast when he eventually goes and visits Andre Bolkonsky. And we see that the path that Andre has taken is atheism, maybe naturalism. And now he has decided that whereas Pierre has found the key to happiness and meaning to be living for other people, Andre believes that the key to it all is to close yourself off, insulate yourself only with those who are closest to you, who you love the most, and lead this individualist life where you're only thinking about yourself and those very closest to you, which in Andre's estimation is really the same thing as yourself. And they will begin a dialogue or a debate between their two new ways of approaching life that reminds me of white and black in this outstanding novel in dialogue by Cormac McCarthy called The Sunset Limited. I could go on and on about this, but this takes the whole atheist and believer debate and presents it as only McCarthy could do, and with an ending that is McCarthyan in every sense. In the same way that someone said that Cormac McCarthy thinks like white but wants to think like black, it could be said that Tolstoy believes like Pierre but wants to understand why 
Andre thinks like he does. And so I'm excited now to see how these two characters progress with their different views. And the third epiphany comes with Count Nikolai Rostov. Like I said, his friend Delokov gets rejected by his, by Rostov's cousin, Sonia. While Tolstoy spins this thing such that Delokov's hurt and rejection and Rostov's pride come together over a gambling tournament or just gambling over cards. And Rostov is driven into massive debt. And he knows that he has to go and confess what he has done to his father, who is clearly not going to be happy about it. But when he shows up at the house and he's carrying this weight of the debt that he's come into, but yet also the fact of to whom he is indebted and why makes it even weightier. In the midst of it, his sister Natasha begins to sing and the singing opens up to infinity the way that the sky opened up to infinity for Andre. Now music has unlocked it and causes this turning point for Nikolai Rostov. And now at page 425 or whatever, we haven't cycled back to Rostov yet the way that we have with Pierre and Andre. So I'm very excited to see where it goes. And now I'm just going to touch on some different notes that I've taken during this reading. Rostov and his friend Berg come into contact. And this is what Tolstoy says. And he says all this, and it's only about the way that they're going to greet one another. But it points to something that I think is a major theme in this novel. It says, With a young person's dislike of well-trodden ways, the urge to avoid imitation, to express oneself in a personal and original way, not to do the conventional things that older people did, often hypocritically. Nikolai, that is Nikolai Rostov, felt like doing something special on meeting his friend, Berg. He wanted somehow to pinch his arm or give him a little shove, anything rather than kiss him, which was what people always did on these occasions. Boris, oh sorry, this is Boris, not Berg. Boris was quite the opposite. He embraced Rostov in an easy, friendly manner and gave him the usual three kisses. Now, I love that Tolstoy takes time to explicate and give texture to the interior of a character just in how he's going to greet a friend. But I think this also points to that tension between traditionalism and progressivism. Again, this novel hinges on a huge turning point for Russia. There's going to be a revolution and a clear break from traditional ways and the love and appropriation of French culture and the assertion of a new Russian culture. And I want to set this in contrast of the amazing and really highly implausible coincidence of Andre Balkonsky, who is presumed dead and lost, him showing up at his home right at the moment that his wife is giving birth to their son and then her death. I found even myself, who is a very open and sympathetic reader, somewhat bulking at this and just thinking, oh, this is kind of melodramatic. But in light of all this extra narrative around something as simple as how you're going to greet a friend, it occurred to me that what that amazing coincidence is, is just like the Dickens novels of the time. This is stemming out of the traditional novel writing and traditional devices. And we now, who are reading it on the other side of modernism's cry to make it new, make it new, what we're coming into contact with is that tension between traditionalism and progressivism that really pervades the whole book. Tolstoy is thinking about the rendering of history, which can only ever be done in retrospect and the faultiness of memory. His version of the battle at Schorngraben was the usual version of a man who has been in a battle. He tells it 
as he would have liked it to have been, or as described by someone else, or in a version that just sounds good. Anything but the way it really happened. Rostov was an honest young man who would never tell a deliberate lie. He set out with every intention of describing exactly what had happened, but imperceptibly, unconsciously, and inevitably, he drifted into falsehood. He couldn't just tell them that they'd been trotting forward together when he fell off his horse, sprained his arm, and then ran as hard as he could into a wood to get away from the Frenchman. Besides, to tell everything exactly as it happened would have demanded enough self-control to say only what happened and nothing else. To tell the truth is a difficult thing, and young people are hardly ever capable of it. So we get that Tolstoy and aphorism that's inserted after one of his sketches. Here's Prince Andre before his epiphany. If I want glory, if I want to be famous and loved by everyone, it's not my fault that I want this, that this is all I care for, the one thing I live for. Yes, only this. I won't breathe a word of it to anybody, but my God, what can I do if I care for nothing but glory and the love of men? Death, wounds, the loss of my family, nothing can frighten me. This is that vigor of youth before things that he's railing against actually happen. I know many people are dear and precious to me, my father, my sister, my wife, my nearest and dearest, yet how terrible and unnatural it may seem. I would give them all up for one moment of glory, triumph over men, to be loved by men I don't even know and never shall know, to be loved by these people there. This is that exuberant, vigorous enthusiasm that will be tested. As it so happens, once he's wounded and sees infinity open up in the sky, he thinks, no, up to now, I have known nothing, absolutely nothing. And this seems like an expected proclamation of someone who has had their dreams and aspirations seriously and nearly mortally challenged. They start to rethink things. That's nothing new. But then this is what he says in that same breath or, or internal uh, thought breath. But where am I? This is a huge question. And then again, like I said, he comes into contact with his hero, Napoleon. But at that moment, Napoleon seemed to him such a tiny, inconsequential creature compared with everything that was now transpiring between his spirit and that lofty sky blue infinity with its busy clouds. Looking Napoleon straight in the eye, Prince Andre mused on the insignificance of greatness on the insignificance of human life, the meaning of which no one could understand, and most of all, the insignificance of death, which no living person could make sense of or explain. No, nothing is certain, nothing but the nothingness of all that we can understand and the splendor of something we can't understand, but we know to be infinitely important. Again, we see the Russian spirit developing here, when news came through of defeat at Austerlitz, all Moscow was nonplussed. This was a time when the Russians had become so used to victories that news of a defeat was rejected as unbelievable by some people, while others said there must be some special reason behind such a strange event. As far as literary allusions go, we get a nice quotation from Molière. And now it's Rostov's turn. This is when he's having his epiphany that echoes Andre's epiphany with the sky, but this time with his sister Natasha singing. The duality and capacity of man to have multiple selves is sort of drawn out here. Oh, the beauty of their singing in thirds. Oh, the lovely tremolo. Rostov felt a thrill of something nobler in his soul and that something was detached from everything in the world and higher than anything in the world. Gambling debts, the Lokovs, honor, what were they compared with this? Rubbish. There you get that British English. You can murder and steal and still be happy. What a statement. Here we get a glimpse of Pierre's ruminations. What's bad and what's good? What should we love and what should we hate? What is life for and what am I? What is life? What is death? 
What kind of force is it that directs everything? He kept asking himself, and there were no answers to any of these questions except one illogical response that didn't answer any of them. And that response was, you're going to die and it will be over and done with. You're going to die and you'll either come to know everything or stop asking. And then this is one of those places where we kind of, we've heard these things before, but then Tolstoy steps in and just adds one more nugget in there. And it says, but dying was horrible too. And here he does it again. Nothing has been discovered, Pierre said to himself again, and nothing has been invented. The only thing we can know is that we don't know anything. And that is the summit of human wisdom. But then here we go with Tolstoy ratcheting up a bit. Everything within and around him struck him as confused, senseless, and disgusting. And yet, in his very disgust at everything around him, Pierre found a source of nagging enjoyment. This is a specific character trait that is familiar to us, but it sets Pierre apart from all those who simply ruminate on the familiar grounds. And now Pierre has come into contact with the Mason, and the Mason is saying to him, down the ages from our forefather Adam to our day, we have been working towards this knowledge and are still infinitely distant from the attainment of our goal. But in our lack of understanding, we see only our own weakness and his, God's greatness. What this is pointing to is that for this Mason, understanding God, understanding our life and what it's for and meaning doesn't come from attaining something or grasping something that is an answer, a, a definite answer. The very meditation on the infinite and on God produces in us the right ratio between the infinite and ourselves. And that right ratio is basically 100 to zero, as much as possible. It is recognizing our weakness and fallibility and meaninglessness in face of his greatness that produces meaning. If we set happiness up as a goal and strive after it, we'll never attain it. And furthermore, if that same goal, which for Andre would be glory and praise by everyone around him, we'll never achieve it. And even if we do, we'll never be satisfied with it. However, if we let that go and let our own earthly pursuits go and decide to focus instead on higher powers, we will still remain infinitely distant from the goal, but will be satisfied and happy. And Pierre, of course, at this point, is just primed to hear this stuff. Pierre's heart thrilled to these words as he gazed with shining eyes into the mason's face. He listened without interrupting or asking any questions, and with all his soul, he believed what this stranger was saying to him. Whether he was believing rational arguments coming from the mason, or trusting more like a child in the persuasive intonation, the sense of authority, the sincerity of the words spoken, the quavering voice that sometimes seemed on the verge of breaking down, or the gleaming aged eyes grown old in that conviction, or the tranquility, the certainty and true sense of vocation radiating from the old man's whole being and striking Pierre very forcibly, given the state of his own debasement and despair. Whatever was happening to him, he longed to believe with all his soul, and he did believe, and he felt a joyful sense of calm, renewal, and return to life. And so this is uh, both a literary allusion and just the next step on Pierre's path, but he spends many long days rereading a volume of Thomas a Kempis. And there's a footnote that I haven't looked at, but I'm willing to bet that that is probably the imitation of Christ. We end up back at one of Anna Pavlovna's soirees, and there's this comment that Pavlovna makes. This is sort of tying in with her earlier comment that Russia is going to have to be the savior of Europe. This time she says, Europe will never be a sincere ally of ours. In Pierre's journey, we are now seeing that he has bought in to the Freemasons. He has attended services and he 
has gone through the preliminary rites of passage, which I very much enjoyed reading. There's all this mystery around Freemasonry, and it's 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 rare that I've read things that go on during these set up ceremonies. And one of the big first steps is for Pierre to rethink how he is treating his servants, all the serfs, and he wants to liberate them. And he ends up saying to himself how easy it is, what little effort it takes to do so much good, and how little we trouble ourselves to do it. However, Tolstoy has complicated this because he has already shown how one of Pierre's assistants has already seen that Pierre is not a shrewd businessman, and he has just this good, tender, and childlike heart for all of his workers. And this helper has seized on that moment for his own gain. And what we're seeing is that at the very time that Pierre thinks he is doing something so good and liberating for these people, he's actually hurting them just as much. This is a very, very complicated manner. And it makes me think of Haiti. And in my video on William T. Volman's Poor People at the beginning, I talk about a trip that I went on to Haiti and about what I learned about different philanthropists and aid and people trying to help out there, but actually hurting the people long term. It's very complicated and, and just sad. It's sad to think that someone with a ton of money and a heart that's in the right place could take good actions that hurt the people intended to save. And finally, Pierre and Andre come into contact and their different paths are clashing against one another. Andre says, what's right and what's wrong is something we can't decide. People keep making mistakes and they always will, especially when it comes to right and wrong. And Pierre retorts with anything that harms someone else is wrong. But Andre is ready to take that on too and shows how it's just not, these aren't these aren't universals. Right and wrong is just not universal. Here I am alive, and it's not my fault. The, the lottery of birth argument. So I have to try and get by as best I can without hurting anybody until death takes over. And he's very resolute, very secure in this thinking. Whereas Pierre immediately answers with, but how do you live on with ideas like that? You could just sit there without moving not taking part in anything. So now at roughly a third of the way in at 425 pages, man, what, what a world that Tolstoy is crafting here. What a mix of situations and characters. And yet how nuanced, how detailed, how sensitive. Just an incredible, incredible reading experience so far. All right, now I have read roughly the next 230 pages or so. This is from about page 425 where I left off last time to now page 665 and actually also brings me to the end of volume two. The quality of the writing that's coming out for me now that I am roughly halfway through is steadiness, the absolute steadiness of Tolstoy's storytelling. The writing has the steadiness of a surgeon. Nothing is rushed or forced. Tolstoy can get deep into the minutia of intrapersonal and interpersonal dealings, but yet without muddling the narrative velocity and not losing the reader. Every time I sit down with this book, Tolstoy teaches me how to take a deep breath and relax and disengage from my racing, harried life and let him guide me along. It's almost like I'm on a gondola and the gondolier is just really taking time and singing this song and I barely hear and feel the 
lapping of the water that we're disturbing because the pace is so finely tuned to enhance my experience of the song. In this case, Tolstoy would be in the gondolier. We are now at peace. We're at a truce between the French and the Russians. And in fact, the Tsar Alexander and the Emperor Napoleon are allies and friends. And the characters through whose eyes we're seeing, such as Rostov, it's, it's disorienting for them to suddenly see all the French and Russians, the French insignia and flags and the Russian insignia and flags all now commingling like great friends. And in fact, it'll go beyond just the fact of the two being in a truce and now being allies, and they will turn against the Austrians. So now we've gone from Russia being an ally of the Austrians and fighting against the French to Russia being allies with the French and fighting against their old ally, the Austrians. So we get this really disturbing sense of the vicissitudes of war. And in fact, if I could give one word to this chunk of text, it would be vicissitudes. Rostov has determined that he operates better as a human being within the rigid framework of the military. So, you know, on the heels of his gambling debt that he's racked up with Dolokhov and the mess he's made of his financial stance with his father and the grief that's brought on or the, the, the psychological tension that's brought on with that little pseudo triangle of Dolokhov, Rostov and his cousin Sonia, he just determines that there's too much freedom in the world outside the rigidity of the military framework. And he does not operate well. And this gets at the, I think, uh, Kierkegaardian concept of anxiety being rooted in too much freedom. Yes, Kierkegaard said that anxiety is the dizziness of freedom. So his mindset is, hey, I'm committed to this soldier thing. I'm going to be the absolute best soldier I can be. Yet, like I said, when he goes back, everything is kind of upended. Andre visits the Rostovs in their country estate where he has this really interesting symbiosis, this metaphorical anthropomorphism of an old oak tree. And he sees it when it's in its full flush and he sees it when it's barren. And he, it really speaks to him about his own state. At the same time, while he's there, he has a sort of indirect brush with Natasha. And so now, like so many other men, he finds himself drawn to her. And so right on the heels of where we left him previously at loggerheads with Pierre in terms of the way that they're going to approach life, suddenly between the oak tree and Natasha, Andre is having yet another massive change of heart. Likewise, Pierre's illusions of masonry are being shattered and he determines that he can't put stock and faith in the sort of external man-made ritual around freemasonry but rather he needs to focus inwardly on his personal and personal spiritual development as part of this he ends up yielding to the collusion around him to get him and Elan back together. She's now this high society woman who is highly sought after. And Pierre is unfortunately just seen as sort of the bumbling human shambles that shuffles around her. Maria, the, the saintly princess Maria Bolkonsky, Andre's sister, has two passions in life. And one is to take care of her nephew. And the other is religious devotion. She is going to yield her life 
to suffering, just like Christ. Her life is about serving others and not seeking her own selfish pleasures. But in this chunk of text, I think it's Natasha who takes center stage for the reader as much as for most of the men and women around her. She ends up secretly engaged to Andre, whose father is totally against the marriage. And so the pact, the agreement that they come to, is that they will have this secret engagement for one year while Andre goes off on his Western European tour for health. The doctors have prescribed this uh, getaway to different parts of Europe for him to take in the air and take in the spas or whatever and, uh, and restore his health because his, uh, his health is flagging. He's got wounds that aren't healing properly physically and, of course, spiritually and emotionally. But he tells Natasha that during this time, she's a, a totally free person. And if someone comes along and catches her fancy, then she has total right to go after that and break off the engagement with Andre. And towards the end, of course, of this uh, painstaking wait, as any great novel would do, she comes into contact, not seeking it out, but she comes into contact with Anatole. This is Prince Vasily's son, who was previously brought around Princess Maria. Of course, he fell in for Mademoiselle Bourrienne, but at the opera, Anatole has eyes for Natasha, and it just totally disorients her and flusters her, and honestly, it, it thrills her. It is astonishing how Tolstoy manages to paint the whole scene of the night at the opera through the eyes of this Natasha as a debutante. How Tolstoy can take on the mind, the feelings of a roughly, I guess, 16-year-old girl going out into the opera with her bare shoulders exposed and her neck exposed for the first time and seeing such opulence in other women, especially Pierre's wife, Ellen, whom Anatole is there to see. And wouldn't you know it, but Anatole and Ellen Bazukov collude to bring Anatole and Natasha into even closer contact. Nothing happens really, but this just wrecks Natasha in good and bad ways. We can sense so strongly her yearning for Andre to return and her absolute anguish in the wait. And then now we take on and feel, we empathize with these emotions that get stirred under the gaze of Anatole. Yes, we know that Anatole is not a good guy. He's a bad boy. Natasha is the virgin jewel. Natasha surveys her feelings painstakingly and comes to the conclusion that she must not be in love with Andre because of the intensity of her feelings now for Anatole. And I'll leave it at that. And, and I'll just say that I don't know if I've ever been so wrapped up in drama. Tolstoy presents this with such verisimilitude and intensity, that's sort of the recurring word here, that I found myself at one point literally saying out loud, Natasha, no. In this novel, already halfway through, Tolstoy pulls off what today would take a team of writers. And again, I have to go back to my assertion that it's the vicissitudes that Tolstoy captures that's making this work so engrossing, so intoxicating. The vicissitudes of war, the vicissitudes, therefore, between nations, the vicissitude between human beings, the vicissitudes of nature, such as the oak tree. And it's at such a level, such a low level, such a deep level, let's say, such a subtle level sometimes, 
Yet at the same time, you can turn one page of this book and everyone's lives have changed. There's such pronounced movement, life in all of its different variations. Life has such pronounced movement in this book that I find myself constantly re-energized to continue on. Natasha represents an ideal and so many different men as they're now growing up into adulthood and going through such altering experiences are seeing that ideal in Natasha. It's, a, it's their ideal reflected back to them from Natasha. And it's the ideal of youth and vigor and beauty and freedom and the allure of vulnerability. We've seen Denisov drawn to Natasha. We've seen Boris drawn to Natasha. Now we see Anatol and Andre drawn to Natasha. Tolstoy offers a very, very strong ending to volume two. And there in the middle, high above Preshestensky Boulevard, amidst a scattering of stars on every side, but catching the eye through its closeness to the earth, its pure white light and the long uplift of its tail, shone the comet, that huge, brilliant comet of 1812, that popular harbinger of untold horrors and the end of the world. But this bright comet with its long shiny tail held no fears for Pierre, quite the reverse. Pierre's eyes glittered with tears of rapture as he gazed up at this radiant star, which must have traced its parabola through infinite space at speeds unimaginable and now suddenly seem to have picked its spot in the black sky and impaled itself like an arrow piercing the earth and stuck there with its strong upthrusting tail and its brilliant display of whiteness amidst the infinity of scintillating stars. This heavenly body seemed perfectly attuned to Pierre's newly melted heart as it gathered reassurance and blossomed into new life. I mean, the writing is, of course, astonishing. It's brilliant. But what's happening here, I believe, is that Tolstoy again bolsters his story to a factual event, this time a factual celestial event of the comet of 1812. And so then he shows how even the objective event can be subjectively and contradictorily interpreted. So again, for most people, this is the harbinger of untold horrors in the end of the world. But for Pierre, this is something that is symbolizing and confirming what's going on within him. This time, something brilliant that's melting within him. So it's another anthropomorphological event that's taking place, such as the one between Andre and the oak tree. I'll give a glimpse ahead just because I've gone ahead and, and read some of the next volume, volume three. This is setting us up. This ending, this brilliant ending with the comet is setting us up for much more detail into the opposing interpretations of historical events that will open up volume three. So I'm gonna go through my highlights by category from this chunk of the text. In terms of Russia, by 1809, the rapport between the two world sovereigns, as Napoleon and Alexander came to be called, had become so close that when Napoleon declared war on Austria, a Russian corps crossed the frontier for joint action alongside their old enemy Bonaparte against their old ally, the Austrian emperor. So close indeed that high society began to talk of a possible marriage between Napoleon and one of Alexander's sisters. But aside from foreign policy, Russian society was much preoccupied at this time with internal changes taking place in all government departments. So again, the, the detailed vicissitudes. Tolstoy isn't interested in leaving us with just the broad strokes. He wants to show the fine stippling and shading. Meanwhile, life itself, the ordinary life of real people with their personal involvement in health and sickness, hard work and relaxation, their involvement in thought, science, poetry, 
Music, love, friendship, enmity, and passion went on as usual, far removed from the political considerations, such as being for or against Napoleon, and all questions of reform. We also get a glimpse of the transition away from serfdom. On one of his estates, 300 serfs had been given the status of free farm laborers. And we get a parenthetical statement, one of the first examples of this in Russia. In the middle of a letter that Princess Maria is writing, she says that her father cannot stand the idea of Bonaparte hobnobbing on equal terms with all the sovereigns of Europe, especially our own, the grandson of the great Catherine. So again, that point back to this golden age of Russia with Catherine the Great and the fact that the Tsar Alexander is the grandson, an ancestor of Catherine, and who should now be hobnobbing, as, uh, as Briggs translates it, with someone as pernicious and non-Russian as Bonaparte. He had the unfortunate capacity, this is Pierre, that many men have, especially Russians, for seeing and believing in the possibility of goodness and truth, yet seeing the evil and falsehood in life too clearly to be capable of taking any serious part in it. Now we read that there is a decline in the popularity of Tsar Alexander's regime, which coincided with a surge in anti-French sentiment and Russian patriotism. So, you know, we know where all this is headed. We know that we're headed towards a declaration of war in 1812. But it's still amazing to see all the different factions of ideas and feelings between Russians and French. As for the big questions that come up, Pierre writes in his diary, but we often imagine that the best way to achieve this aim is to remove all the difficulties from our lives. Sir, it is the other way round, he said. That's right, um, Pierre is quoting what someone else told him. Only amidst the cares of this world can we achieve the three great aims of one, self-knowledge, for a man can know himself only through comparison. Two, greater perfection, and this can be achieved only through struggle. And three, the attainment of the greatest virtue, the love of death. Only the vicissitudes of life can show us all its vanity and promote our innate love of death, or rather, rebirth into new life. It's not that we, not that they necessarily love death, but that they love the concept of death representing a rite of passage into the new, renewed, eternal life. But I really liked this because I think often we think to ourselves, oh, if I could just get away and go out and get lost and secluded in the middle of the woods or on a mountaintop for a while, I could clear my head and I could sort of regenerate, rejuvenate and bring things about my life and the way I'm living into better clarity. We want to withdraw from all the busyness of our everyday lives and it's sort of um, grasp this ideal that will change us and then we can come back down from the mountain, so to speak. But what this is saying is that actually it's more beneficial that we stay in the midst of our everyday cares because it is only really the tension and contrast of these minutiae and the struggle between our ideal and the application of that ideal, the chasm between theory and praxis that we really gain and benefit and develop and grow. In other words, don't save reading something like War and Peace for this fantasy of going away for a whole summer to some island house all by yourself. Unless you're extremely fortunate, that's probably not going to happen. And if you go on this advice, then you'll actually get more benefit out of reading War and Peace right in the midst of how you find yourself in life right now at its busiest, just taking 30 minutes a day. Natasha was indeed having the happiest time of her life. She was at the very peak of happiness. When a person is transformed into someone completely good and kind and rejects the slightest possibility of evil, misery, and grief. 
And I just took a note. The only thing I wrote in the margin there is, why is this? Why is it that just at this one moment, she's at the happiest time in her life? She's right on that cusp of moving from girlhood into womanhood. And just for that time, she's transformed into someone completely good and kind and rejects all the possibility of evil, misery, and grief. Is that a time, a state of mind maybe, that we can grasp again in life? Is it something that we can seize hold of and learn to live in? Or is this some configuration of chemicals within us that only allows for it at this one moment in life? Just like with Rostov, who experienced his sister Natasha singing right on the heels of him leaving with so much shame and guilt over the gambling debt he racked up with Dolokhov. So too, Andre gets to experience Natasha singing. And it says the main thing that was bringing him to the verge of tears was a sudden vivid awareness of the dreadful disparity between something infinitely great and eternal that existed within him and something else, something constraining and physical that constituted him and even her. The disparity struck him with a mixture of anguish and bliss while she was singing. He thought to himself, why do I go on struggling? Why do I keep on toiling at this narrow, cramped drudgery? When life lies open before me, the whole of life with all its joys. And he thinks to himself, Pierre was right. If you want to be happy, you have to believe in the possibility of happiness. And I do believe in it now. So again, this is quite a change from where we left him. Let the dead bury the dead, but while ever there is life, you must be happy. Again, this is in a letter that Princess Maria is writing. She says, only religion can make clear to us what man cannot comprehend without its aid. Why and for what purpose good and noble beings capable of happiness, doing no harm to others, indeed essential for the happiness of other people, are called away to God, while wicked, useless, and dangerous people are left among the living, a burden to themselves and everyone else. This is an eternal question of why would God choose to take the life of a young five-year-old girl in a car accident, but allow someone like Jeffrey Dahmer to live on and do what he did over so many years. Do you know what I think, said Natasha in a whisper, moving up close to Nikolai and Sonia as Dimmler finished the nocturne and sat there faintly rippling the strings as if he didn't know whether to stop playing or begin a new piece. I think you can go on remembering, remembering, and remembering until you can pre-remember things that happened before you were ever in this world. That's metempsychosis, said Sonia, who had been good at lessons in remembering everything. The Egyptians used to believe that our souls have been in animals and will go back into animals again. No, listen, I don't think we've ever been in animals, said Natasha, still whispering even though the music had finished. But I do know for certain we were once angels somewhere beyond, and we came here, and that's why we can remember everything. Please, may I join you, said Dimmler, coming over quietly and sitting down beside them. If we've been angels, why did we fall down so low, said Nikolai. No, it's not possible. It's not a question of being low. Who said anything about being low? The reason I know what I used to be is this, Natasha replied with great conviction. You know the soul is immortal. Well, if I'm going to live forever, that means I've lived before. I've been living all through eternity. Yes, but it's hard for us to conceive of eternity, said Dimmler, who had joined the young couple with a slightly scornful smile, but was now talking just as quietly and seriously as they were. Why is it hard to conceive of eternity, said Natasha. There will be today, there will be tomorrow, and there will be always. And there was yesterday and the day before. And so just in that little excerpt, you can see why this young and exuberant and passionate Natasha with this seemingly boundless mind is becoming this source of an ideal for so many people. It's that youthful energy and wonder and drive and infatuation with the mystery of life. 
But I don't know if there's a name for this theory or this idea, but this is something that I've long thought and I've read in a couple of other places, this idea of us having already lived forever and having been angels once before and chosen with God to enter into this life as human beings so that the so that love can be perfected through the trials and tribulations of this life. In terms of war during this segment, like I said, there's this strange tableau where Rostov strolled around the town staring at the French and their uniforms and taking in the streets and houses where the Russian and the French emperors were staying. In the town square, he watched as people began setting up tables and preparing for the banquet. He saw banners draped across the streets showing the Russian and French colors and the letters A for Alexander and N for Napoleon in huge monograms. There were flags and monograms in all the windows too. Rostov stood there on the corner for quite some time, watching the celebrations from a distance. His anguished mind was seething with problems that couldn't be resolved. His soul was alive with fearful doubts. He remembered Denisov with that new expression on his face and the way he seemed to have given in and the hospital with all those torn off arms and legs, the filth and disease. He remembered the stench of dead flesh in the hospital so vividly that he had looked around wondering where the smell was coming from. And he also kept remembering Napoleon with his little white hands, all smugness, and now being treated with affection and respect by the Emperor Alexander. What were all those torn off legs and arms for? And why had those men been killed? Then he remembered Lazarev, being rewarded while Denisov got punishment instead of a pardon. He caught himself indulging in such strange ideas that they frightened him. And so this is, of course, that collision between war as this objective event between two sovereigns in history and a very real tearing apart of lives between different everyday people. And in this scene, Tolstoy paints it such that I felt I was really in the mind of Rostov and it really hit me. I could almost, I was there seeing these two sovereigns, Alexander and Napoleon, just having a good time and getting ready to enjoy a banquet. And it's like, you think to yourself, did it really take all this death and disease and terror to just change your moods towards each other. This is Prince Andre musing on the oak tree. He's right, that tree, a thousand times right, mused the prince. Other people, young people, they can keep that sham going. But he and I, meaning the oak tree and I, know what life is. Our lives are over and done with. The tree had stirred up a host of new ideas in the prince's soul, which held no hope, though their bitterness was sweet. On the journey there, he seemed to have reconsidered his entire life and come right back to his first conclusion, which was as reassuring as it was devoid of hope, that he needn't bother with anything new. All he had to do was live out his life without doing any harm, free from worry and any kind of desire. Well, that very last statement, any free from any kind of desire, is of course going to be challenged with the introduction of Natasha. As Natasha is in the throes of her wait for Andre to return, she's spending time talking with her mother about it, lying in bed together. And there are these details that Tolstoy includes that I think is just exemplary of the level at which he can paint these compositions. It says that Natasha didn't let her go on. She pulled the countess's large hand over and kissed it on the back and on the palm. Then she turned it over again and started kissing it all over, one knuckle after another, and in the spaces between, then back to a knuckle. And as she did so, she whispered, January, February, March, April, May. And just that detail that she's uttering the names of the months of the year as she kisses each knuckle. That's amazing in and of itself, but Tolstoy keeps connecting back to it. So after some exchanges, some dialogue between the two of them, then all of a sudden Natasha goes, Oh, please don't laugh, cried Natasha. Look, the bed's shaking. You're just like me. We're both gigglers. Stop it. 
She snatched her mother's hands, took one and kissed a knuckle on her little finger. That was June. And then she went on to the other one with July and August. It's amazing. And on top of it, she starts saying things like this. Mama, does he really love me? What do you think? Did men love you like this? And he's so nice. He really is nice. Though he's not really my type. He's a bit sort of narrow, like a clock on the wall. What a thought. Do you know what I mean? Narrow, you know, all gray and pale. You do say some silly things, said the Countess. Natasha persisted. Don't you understand? Nikolai would. Now, take Bazukov, meaning Pierre. He's blue, dark blue with a bit of red, and his shape is square. So we see that she has the, uh, an artist's mind. She has a painter's mind, a poet's mind. She's able to see people as represented in what in music would be something like tone color. And then a little bit later, it says that Natasha snatched up her slippers and skipped off to her room in her bare feet. But she couldn't get to sleep. She kept worrying about no one ever being able to understand everything that she understood, everything deep inside her. This is the romantics curse, but it's also something that poets can harness to bring us some of the greatest poetry in the world. I really liked this passage right at the beginning of volume two, part four. According to biblical tradition, the absence of work, idleness, was a condition of the first man's state of blessedness before the fall. The love of idleness has been preserved in fallen men, but now a heavy curse lies upon him, not only because we have to earn our bread by the sweat of our brow, but also because our sense of morality will not allow us to be both idle and at ease. Whenever we are idle, a secret voice keeps telling us to feel guilty. If man could discover a state in which he could be idle and still feel useful and on the path to duty, he will have regained one aspect of that primitive state of blessedness. This has me pegged to a T. I've left out so much more that I noted down for this segment of roughly 230 pages, 240 pages. This, this is a, an endless, bottomless book, and I can't believe I'm only halfway through reading it, and it has opened up so much of the world before me, this world and possible other worlds before me to consider. Tolstoy, perhaps only rivaled by Proust and a few others, presents to us the vicissitudes of being in this life in a way that justifies literature's supreme place in our lives. All right, now I've read the next 400 pages, which is the entirety of part three of this book's four parts. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about everything that happens in part three. This takes me from roughly page 665 to 1035. We open up with thoughts on war and history, which harkens back and connects to some of those ideas that were introduced earlier in the book. And this will usher in what's going on on the national scale a little more than what's going on in the interpersonal relationships of our key characters. This drama is still unfolding, but now Tolstoy begins to assert more of his own convictions and ideas and give us more insight into the politics of war. This coincides, of course, with the 1812 event, the 1812 pivotal event of France crossing into Russia and leading to war between the two of them. France will be, continue to press into Russia with Moscow in their sights. Almost everyone whom we've met so far will flee from their country estates or from Moscow to go and seek shelter in other places. We find Natasha in this section recovering from the fiasco between her and Anatole and Andre. She becomes very, very ill and struggles to regain health, but she also begins to experience spiritual stirrings that will culminate in a 
beautiful episode towards the end of this section. Pierre becomes a frequent visitor there with Natasha. He's pretty much the only one that she can tolerate. Lo and behold, just like all the other men, he starts to fall prey to her love and beauty. So between the epiphany he had at the close of part two, when he saw the comet in the sky, and now his falling under the spell of Natasha, add to this a little foray or dabbling in numerological prophecy where he concocts out of his own name and title a numerologically complementary sign that coincides with 666 from the book of Revelation that people have proven by numerology that Napoleon is that Antichrist. With all these things kind of swirling around him and bubbling up inside of him, he feels now more than ever that it is his destiny to accomplish something mighty, something great that will allow him to achieve true happiness. He's not sure what this is. He does feel, however, that given his admittedly contrived, I mean admittedly by me, the contrivance of the prophecy that connects Revelation and Napoleon and Pierre. Nonetheless, he, he knows it has something to do with that maybe, but he's not really sure what it is. But this is now his quest. Nikolai Rostov is having his illusions of being in the military checked and shaken. And at the same time, he ends up in a chance encounter with Princess Maria that leaves them both romantically shaken or unsettled. We now start to hear or see a little bit of Petya Rostov. This is Natasha's younger brother. He's 15 years old and he wants more than anything to join the war. His mother does not want this in any way, shape, or form, and he's too young. Nonetheless, he figures out how to press his way into the Kremlin where the Tsar is visiting and we get these scenes of the crowd, this nationalistic frenzy of the crowd and their adoration for Alexander there at the Kremlin that is just, well, it caused me to hold my breath for many different reasons. But like everything else that Tolstoy paints, it's just so real and so immediate. For Maria, her chief oppressor, has died. She's totally at odds with Mademoiselle Bourrienne. Andre, of course, is away at war. And now the peasants that live on their estate aren't responding to her goodwill or what she feels is a blessing to them quite the way that she thought they would. Andre, again, has another brush with death. This time in the midst of his delirium, he has a brush with his enemy, Anatole, and then later, Natasha, his love. And just like Pierre, Andre, once again, these two are just in locked counterpoint with each other. He has an epiphany concerning love and the importance of love, but not just human love or physical love or heart love, but this is a divine love or what the Bible would call agape love. So let me go through this section just straight through in linear order and pick out some things that really caught my attention. So again, we closed off with this beautiful vignette that incorporated the comet there in 1812 with Pierre. And what he does again is he shows the objectivity versus the subjectivity of historical events and interpretation. And so now we turn a couple of pages and we're in volume three, part one, and we echo again the opening pages of volume two, and we get this meditation on war and history. And war began. In other words, an event took place which defied human reason and all human nature. Millions of men set out to inflict on one another untold evils, deception, treachery, robbery, forgery, counterfeiting, theft, arson, and murder, on a scale unheard of in the annals of law courts down the centuries and all over the world, though at the time the men responsible 
did not think of these deeds as crimes? What led to this extraordinary occurrence? What causes lay behind it? Historians, in their simple-minded certitude, tell us that the cause of this event were as follows. The violence done to the Duke of Oldenburg, non-observance of the continental system, Napoleon's megalomania, Alexander's obstinacy, mistakes made by diplomats, and so on. And what he is leading up to in these pages, and again, this is bringing out Tolstoy, the rhetorician, the thinker, the man of staunch convictions. And so you're going to get that sort of cantankerous old man, I know better than all these scholarly whippersnappers type of mode here. But given the pathos and the ethos that Tolstoy has built up for himself over the half of this novel so far, you can't help but listen and you can't help but entertain what he's saying. Now, if I were a military historian or just a historian in general, I might really chafe at some of this because some of it is sort of savage how he gets at the idea that you can pin these kinds of events on one single thing or micro historians as we now call them military strategists and so on tolstoy's out to just rip all this stuff apart and the zeitgeist the spirit of the age and that zeitgeist changes from age to age and furthermore the zeitgeist usually becomes incarnate in one figure. The zeitgeist of this era is, of course, Napoleon. But Tolstoy is not having it about this whole zeitgeist concept or a single man's will causing all of these different events. And he's at pains to present to us his argument for why. At the same time, Tolstoy definitely has his own conception, his own philosophical conception of history, what it is. And from what I'm seeing, his conception of history is very much tied to his ideas about God and a divine nature, an objective nature, a platonic ideal, a providence. Historical fatalism is the only possible explanation of irrational phenomena like these. That is, phenomena with a rationale beyond our comprehension. Phenomena like these, again, referring to the excerpt I read just a moment ago about the acts that men commit in war. The more we try to explain away such phenomena in rational terms, the more irrational and incomprehensible they become for us. And so, again, historical fatalism. This is, again, the idea of a divine hand working things that the human will can't understand. Each man lives for himself, using his freedom to get what he wants, and he feels with every fiber of his being that at any particular time he is free to perform an action or refrain from doing so. But the moment any action is taken, it becomes an irrevocable piece of history, with a significance which has more to do with predetermination than freedom. This gets at a thought that I've had for a long time about determinism or fatalism versus free will. And I think that it's both at the same time. From the perspective of a creator who created time and is therefore outside of time, so everything's eternal and everything is, in a sense, happening all at the exact same time. Past, present, and future are all superimposed because there is no time. And if they're all powerful, omnipotent, and so on, they know the beginning from the end, they know everything's headed, then absolutely from the perspective of a being like that, there is no such thing as free will. Everything is determinism. But somehow for us finite and temporal and corporeal creatures, we are inside that created time. And so for us, it is a simulation of free will. Now this simulation is so good that we only despair over it if we think on it way too much. But for the most part, it's just something that we feel to be true. I can do whatever I want at any moment. So again, like Tolstoy says, each man he feels with every fiber of his being 
that at any particular time he is free to perform an action or refrain from doing so. And I like the way he puts this next part of it. He takes that free will and puts it right inside the fatalistic and deterministic framework. It says, but the moment any action is taken, then it becomes an irrevocable piece of history. So that's what history is. History is the sequence of all of those moments of all of our choices within a virtual free will that's situated with inside a fatalistic superstructure. History is its own agent. History, says Tolstoy, the amorphous unconscious life within the swarm of humanity exploits every minute in the lives of kings as an instrument for the attainment of its own ends. And so history is so much its own agent that even kings or Alexander and Napoleon are subjected to it. They can't overcome it. Because again, although on a conscious level, a man lives for himself, that simulated free will, he is actually being used as an unconscious instrument for the attainment of humanity's historical aims. A deed once done becomes irrevocable, and any action comes together over time with millions of actions performed by other people to create what we call historical significance. He isn't calling it God. He isn't calling it providence, I don't think, in this passage, though in other places he has referred to providence. But this is essentially where his thoughts are. And again, he's dismissive of this idea of the zeitgeist that concentrates within one person and that one person changes the course of human history. Tolstoy says, when it comes to events in history, so-called great men are nothing but labels attached to events. And like real labels, they have the least possible connection with events themselves. Every action they perform, which they take to be self-determined and independent, is in a historical sense quite the opposite. It is interconnected with the whole course of history and predetermined from eternity. And so we start off this part with all of those weighty and heady thoughts. But just like everything else, this perfectly sets us up. He's paving the way for us and introducing the themes and the ideas that are going to underpin or drive the narrative. I love that Tolstoy is constantly connecting back to different moments that he's put in this narrative, because just as all of us live on throughout our lives, we're constantly ruminating and reflecting back on certain flashpoints and key moments. And this one is connecting back to that first moment early in the book when Andre is wounded and he's staring up at the sky and he has a brush with the infinite. This time, however, we get that it was as if the infinitely receding firmament that had once arched above him had suddenly turned into a low, fixed vault bearing down on him, perfectly clear, but containing nothing eternal or mysterious. And so again, with these vicissitudes and just the beautiful verisimilitude with how things actually happen in life. In movies, and this is partly because of their short duration, and of course there are exceptions, but let's just say the blockbusters. You know, usually a character will have this massive epiphany. Something will cause that and they'll know exactly what they need to do and there's the self-discovery and then it ends and everything's great. Well, that's not actually how it pans out for most people. And just like Andre here, he has had that moment where everything opened up before him and he felt this crossing over. But now the same type of feeling is almost rendering opposite. It seems almost silly and strange that we ever were moved by it. I loved this little excerpt because this excerpt for me also brilliantly describes the structural patterns of this book overall. It says, he had known circumstances like these before, but then they had been all intertwined, and now they were all unraveled. 
a series of disparate and senseless eventualities coming upon him one after another. It's exactly what this book is. It's a brilliant series of intertwinings and unravelings. If he had learnt one lesson from his military experience, it was that in matters of war, the most carefully considered plans count for nothing, as he had seen at Austerlitz. Everything depends on how you react to unexpected and unpredictable enemy action. Everything depends on who takes charge and how. And in this third part, we'll also get a lot of insight into what it's really like for people on the ground. The soldiers, yes, but then also the decision makers. And Tolstoy is at pains to show how complex and uncertain these things happen in the moment. Tolstoy obviously has a lot of disdain for armchair historians who are sitting back with the coziness of hindsight and they're able to look at everything as it did happen or could have happened and say, oh, if this person had just made this decision instead, or because they made this decision, they must have thought blah, blah, blah. But Tolstoy wants to show us that for the general or whatever rank that's a decision maker, when you're in the heat of war and you need to make decisions, you can't ever step back and be objective about it and distance yourself from it and lay maps out and things like that. No, you're constantly doing this stuff on the fly, hoping that you're getting it right. There's this somewhat extended section where Tolstoy is describing for us all the different types of people, all the different types of Russian factions and their beliefs and how this played into the politics of war. He says that the first party are military theorists who believe there was such a thing as a science of warfare a science with its own immutable laws, precise laws laid down by the pseudo-science of warfare. And he tells us that most of these are Germans. The second party was diametrically opposed to the first one. All you had to do was stop thinking, stop sticking pins and maps, just go out and fight, thrash the enemy, keep him out of Russia, and keep men's spirits up. The third party are those who kept trying to reconcile the first two tendencies. The fourth tendency are the men who displayed sincerity with all of its merits, and deficiencies, and he gives examples. The fifth group supported Barclay de Tully, and they believed that you can't win a war without unity in the high command. The sixth party, the Benigsonites, said the exact opposite, and they're saying basically that Benigson is preferable over Tully. The seventh class were the people who always circula circulate around monarchs, especially the young ones, and there were plenty of them around Alexander. Their adored czar should set aside his needless diffidence and publicly proclaim that he was placing himself at the head of the army and taking over the staff as commander-in-chief. But the eighth and largest group, vast in size, outnumbering the others 99 to 1, consisted of people who didn't want peace or war. All they wanted, the thing that mattered to them, was making as much money as they could and enjoying themselves. And that really stirred my thoughts a little bit, thinking about the money machine that fires up around war. A ninth party. It was the party of older, more reasonable men, experienced politicians, who were able to stand back from the many conflicts of opinion, take an objective view of all that was going on at headquarters, and consider various ways of getting out of the mess of uncertainty, confusion, and weakness. The members of this party said that the Tsar's job was to govern the country, not lead the troops. And we get a lot of insight about this conflict around the emperor's space, whether he should take command of the army or not. We get a lot of acerbic jabs at Germans and, of course, Frenchmen, Poles, Italians, Englishmen, the noble and proud Russian spirit is here. But Tolstoy, in one of what seemed to be just a rant about all the others, does have enough humor to throw the Russians into the mix for their own faults as well. Only a German could be self-assured on the basis of an abstract idea, science, the supposed knowledge of absolute truth. 
A Frenchman is self-assured because he sees himself as devastatingly charming, mentally and physically, to men and women alike. An Englishman is self-assured on the grounds that he is a citizen of the best organized state in the world. And also because he is an Englishman, he always knows the right thing to do, and everything he does, because he is an Englishman, must be right. An Italian is self-assured because he gets excited and easily forgets himself and everybody else. A Russian is self-assured because he knows nothing and doesn't want to know anything because he doesn't believe you can know anything completely. We're taking the perspective of Prince Andre here towards one of the political figures, but you kind of get the idea that there's a little bit of self-awareness in Tolstoy writing this, but he says, he looked ridiculous. His sarcasm was offensive, but you had to admire his boundless devotion to an idea. We're told that a good military commander has no need of genius or outstanding qualities. And again, this is Tolstoy being very dismissive of all the adoration around Napoleon. Quite the reverse. He needs to be devoid of the finest and noblest of human attributes. Love, poetry, affection, a philosophical spirit of inquiry and skepticism. He needs to be narrow-minded, totally convinced that what he is doing is very important. Otherwise, he would never have enough staying power. And only then will he become a valiant military commander. God forbid that he should be like a human being, a prey to love and compassion, hesitating over right and wrong. It is obvious why a theory of genius should have been fabricated for them by the people of old. Such men and power are the same thing. We get this scene in war where Rostov comes into contact with a French soldier. And the French soldier looked up at Rostov, recoiling in horror. This pale, mud-stained face of a fair-haired young man with a dimple on his chin and bright blue eyes had no business with battlefields. It was not the face of an enemy. It was a domestic, indoor face. And later, Rostov galloped along with the rest, conscious of a nasty feeling inside, an aching round his heart. It was as if he had suddenly seen something, something vague and confused that he couldn't account for, in capturing that French officer and hitting him with his sword. And this is a representation of something that stirred the memory of a poem I read back in an undergrad class. I think it was by Wilfred Owen, and it might have been called The Man He Killed, or perhaps it was the Latin phrase dolce et decorum es pro patria mori, sweet and fitting it is to die with one's country, or maybe those are both the same poem. Pretty sure it was Wilfred Owen, but he talks about how when these two opposing soldiers come into contact with each other, he looks at the other soldier and realizes, hey, this just is someone that I could see myself having a drink with at the pub. And it's a very, very unsettling feeling. And the adrenaline of warfare completely dissipates into the horror of it. Like I said, Natasha is having these spiritual stirrings and she attends a service at a Catholic church and she listened to the words of the service, trying hard to follow and understand. When she did understand, her personal emotions merged in every shade with her prayers. When she didn't, she had an even sweeter sense that the desire to understand everything amounted to pride. No one could ever understand anything and all she had to do was believe and give herself up to God. And at moments like this, she had a sense of him guiding her soul. This gets at an ages old theme of the idea that all of our human thinking, all of our need to understand and rationalize clouds up the communication line between us and the creator, us and the divine. I think about the Tao Te Ching, where Lao Tzu says, the Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao. And there is something powerful, something moving and changing about an individual 
surrendering their pride, letting go of the need to understand, the need to rationalize, and just surrendering to the cloud of unknowing, a letting go. This is quite a shift from the exuberant, bubbly, charismatic girl running around the estate in her slippers and excitedly playing the piano and singing and talking with her mother at night. Now, when we start part two of volume three, we do get that word providence. We're again back in the mode of Tolstoy, the rhetorician, who is giving us this sort of essay on the war, on Napoleon, and so on. And I have to say, at first, I expected War and Peace to read maybe a little bit more like The Man Without Qualities, where you've got this narrative that's going, but it's constantly interspersed and suspended while Musil gives us these philosophical essays. I have to say that even though there are more of them in volume three than the first two volumes, when they appear, it's still just a couple of pages. And from what I see, it's all directly integrated to the novel as a whole. And so it's most welcome. And I hope that there's more of it in volume four. In this one, he says, moved ostensibly by fear or vanity, pleasure, indignation, or reason. And acting on the assumption they knew what they were doing and were doing it for themselves, they were actually nothing more than unwitting tools in the hands of history, performing a function hidden from themselves, but comprehensible to us, meaning us now looking back on this history. This is the unavoidable fate of all men of action, and the higher they stand in the social hierarchy, the less freedom they have. It was Providence, capital P, that compelled all those men striving for the realization of their own personal ambitions to work cooperatively towards an outcome of immense significance of which no single individual, parenthetically he says, not Napoleon, not Alexander, even less anybody actually involved in the fighting, had the slightest inkling. We get this a fortiori argument that is an argument from strength, an argument from force, and it's where you use something that's even more forceful than the thing you're arguing for to bolster its validity. He says, not only was this entirely unforeseen, but on the Russian side, every last effort had been made to prevent the only thing that could have saved Russia. And on the French side, despite Napoleon's depth of experience and supposed military genius, every effort was made to push on to Moscow in late summer, the one thing that would guarantee disaster. And so what he's saying is that it was not, there's no way that they could have known, either side could have known what the outcome was going to be or what the best decision was, because both of them made decisions that went entirely against their goal and yet culminated in the most unlikely outcome. It's pretty crazy when you really start to take in all the details of what Tolstoy is saying here, these events in 1812 are pretty insane. He goes on to show the post hoc ad propter hoc of later historians. And he says, but all these hints that what eventually happened was foreseen on both sides, the French and the Russian, are put forward now only because they have been justified by these subsequent events. And now here's Pierre with his latest epiphany. He rejoiced in a new awareness that everything that makes for happiness in life, comfort, wealth, even life itself, was nothing but trash to be thrown away with pleasure when you compare it with, well, something else. What that something else was, Pierre could not have said. And he didn't even try to work out who or what he was taking such exquisite pleasure in honoring by the ultimate sacrifice. He wasn't at all worried about why he wanted to start making sacrifices, but the idea of sacrifice itself was a source of new delight. So we can see this arcing of epiphanies going towards this direction of sacrifice and laying our own needs and wants down. We connect to Natasha, who's sacrificing that need to understand and control, and now we're seeing a similar parallel with Pierre. 
Tolstoy comes back in with this. The ancients have left us examples of epics with all the historical interests focused on particular heroes. And I immediately thought of Achilles and Odysseus. And nowadays we cannot get used to the idea that this kind of history is meaningless at, pre at the present stage of human development. There exists another clearly defined, universally familiar, and totally false account. All of the historians describe events as follows. And then we get this quick summation of the way in which the events of 1812 are described. And then Tolstoy just comes in and says, this is the historical version of events. And it is totally wrong, as anyone can tell if he is prepared to go into the matter. Again, that orneriness comes out when he says, if we can take time off from worshiping Napoleon's military genius and look at his actual instructions. <laughs> and he breaks down this real document that we have of Napoleon's instructions that he sent during battle. And he goes almost line by line, does textual analysis on it and, and just totally breaks it down. But it isn't just the French historians or the French leaning historians. He also speaks up and says to those historians who maintain that Russia was formed by the will of a single man, that being Peter the Great, and France was turned from a republic into an empire, and the French army reached, marched into Russia all by the will of a single man, Napoleon. The argument that Russia retained power because Napoleon had a bad cold on the 26th of August must seem highly persuasive. This sardonic sharpness that I don't typically care for, but it's almost like Tolstoy has claimed or proven the right to be able to do it. Plus, he's totally against war and totally against glorifying history's tyrants. So I'm for that too. Because war, as he describes some of the aftermath in one sentence, everything he saw blended into a single overall impression of naked, bloodstained human flesh. Once again, this insight, this far-ranging, boundless insight that Tolstoy has into every single facet of humanity at every single level of development across seemingly every demographic. Although he has painted Pierre's wife, Hélène Bzukov, as this highly sought after high society woman with lots of privilege, Tolstoy still has enough awareness of the plight of women and the way they were viewed and treated in his day to where Hélène says at one point, not being a man, I cannot show ingratitude. And that really seized my attention when I think about the idea of Tolstoy that I have in my mind as this gruff, hard man even though he's proven again and again in these pages with his different female characters that he's in touch with the fairer sex and he is indeed a very sensitive and highly alert person it just this really took me by surprise and i don't think that it, it didn't come off to me as mocking as in he's sort of almost mocking the way that he imagines a woman like this would speak and now as Tolstoy is wrapping up volume three, these final pages are incredible. And Andre is having his next epiphany. Yes, a new kind of happiness was revealed to me. One of the inalienable rights of man, happiness beyond materialism, beyond all external material influences, happiness known only to the soul, the happiness of loving. It is within the conception of all men, but it can be fully determined and ordained by God alone. But how did God ordain this law? And what about his son? Yes, it is love. His thoughts were lucidity itself, Tolstoy tells us. But not the kind of love that loves for a reason, a purpose, a cause, but the kind of love I felt for the first time when I was on my deathbed and I saw my enemy and loved him. I experience the feeling of love that is the essence of the soul, love that seeks no object. I can feel it now, that blessed feeling, to love your neighbor and love your enemy, to love everything, to love God in all his manifestations. You can love someone dear to you with human love, but it takes divine love to love your enemy. That's why I felt such joy 
when I knew I loved that man, and he's referring to Anatole at this moment and something that happened earlier. When you love with human love, you can change from love to hatred, but divine love cannot change. Nothing, not even death, can destroy it. It is the essence of the soul. Just like Pierre, just like Natasha, where now our characters are coming to sense that this is something outside the material world that they're seeking. And love indeed seems to be what everything is tying back to. For Tolstoy, it is clear that love is the highest realization of human beings. And even though the language is such that Tolstoy is writing to guide the reader through and see through the language to the content. It's not calling attention to itself as an aesthetic object. And, you know, that's typically what I love, but that's just, I know enough to know that's not what this book is about. But nonetheless, he can still paint such a picture. This is Pierre trying to rescue a child from a burning house there in the midst of Moscow with the whole city on fire and Frenchmen looting everywhere. The sounds of walls and ceilings breaking apart and crashing down. The sizzling hiss of the flames and the wild shouts of the crowd. The sight of billowing clouds of smoke belching out in great black swirls or shooting up in scattering showers of gleaming sparks. Flames licking up the walls in big, thick, red sheaves or covering them with what looked like golden fish scales. I love that. The blistering heat, the choking smoke, and the speed of everything rouse Pierre in the way that only a huge fire can. All right, now I have finished book four. And this goes from about page 1035 or 1035 to page 1260, 1260. And after that, we have the epilogue. So now I have finished the book proper. Although, I mean, I always consider prologue, epilogue, everything around the book. And certain books, Infinite Jest, for example, even the appendices or footnotes are part of the book. But technically, I've now finished the story proper, I suppose. And what a story it has been. In fact, the end of this came so abruptly. I hadn't looked ahead like I normally do to see where this book ended and the next one, or in this case, the epilogue began. So when I turned the page and all of a sudden I realized, oh, that's it. Now I'm at the epilogue. It felt so abrupt. And I've read that there is no real beginning, middle, or end. I think I shared that in an earlier clip. It's from the little preface or introduction to this Penguin Deluxe Edition. But now I see what they mean. I mean, to, to me, I feel like there is a beginning with the, you know, opening up at the salon there with Anna Pavlovna and Prince Vasily. But I definitely didn't expect it to end where it ended. And I was so disturbed by this because I'm so enthralled with these characters. These characters seem so real to me that I had to go ahead and, and just peek ahead at the pages in the epilogue and scan for familiar names like Pierre and Andre and Rostov and Princess Maria and especially Natasha. Luckily, I did see those all over the place. So I kind of was able to breathe again. And this might sound like hype or hyperbole when I say these things about how invested in these characters and how invested in the story I am and so on. But just to give you a small, small example, there have been moments where Tolstoy has recorded a very perfunctory moment, such as a character jotting something down on a piece of paper. And in the moment that I'm reading that, I will suddenly think to myself, oh man, I, that, that, how do I explain this? The character is so real to me. And the, their act of jotting something down on a piece of paper is so present for me that it really seems as if this is a historical person 
And I wondered to myself, where is that piece of paper now? Is that piece of paper still somewhere out there, somewhere in Russia with this character's handwriting on it? And I think about how that character couldn't have foreseen that someone like me would be reading a book about the moment that that character is writing that slip of paper. And then all of a sudden I realized this is a fictional character. Like this is a work of fiction, but it seems so utterly real. Anyway, let's talk about book four. We're moving now from Moscow over to Petersburg where all of the aristocrats and nobles have gathered together and where many people have fled and there's lots of uncertainty around what's going on. And as we've started to get glimpses of, Tolstoy's objective of cutting Napoleon down to size and really exposing the propaganda and hype engine about Napoleon's supposed greatness and genius, and Tolstoy taking to task so many of the historians who are putting out books and writings about what took place at the beginning of the 19th century. And in fact, at the beginning of each of the parts of book four or volume four, we'll open up with these meditations, this rhetoric from Tolstoy. And at one point he says, the battle of Borodino, along with the subsequent occupation of Moscow and the flight of the French without further conflict is one of the most instructive phenomena in history. We may wonder why Tolstoy is so obsessed with talking about these events, but as he has it right here, he truly feels that this is a most instructive event in history. And as we read through this section, he will narrate the historical progression of the Russians taking over Moscow, burning Moscow to the ground, essentially, the Russian army retreating, but then the French starting to retreat back towards home, especially as the harsh winter sets in, and the Russian army basically coming and staying on their heels and pushing them out. And we'll get insight into the guerrilla warfare tactics that Russia took that were highly effective. And that is used by Tolstoy as an example of how what we conventionally think is the best way to win a war, basically the most numbers, the most force, basically everything that Napoleon had at his disposal is not necessarily a guaranteed victory. And this is just one of many points that Tolstoy will make where he shows that there's a disparity between what we think is common sense and what really happened. We remember that the close of book three, Pierre has rescued the child from a fire there in Moscow and then been taken prisoner by the French. And I had to wonder to myself as I entered this new part of the novel, is that the great task and sacrifice that Pierre felt for himself? Is Tolstoy's angle here that it was something as unexpected and simple as rescuing some stranger's child from a fire? And ironically, it is as a prisoner of war that Pierre will start to have the most revelation he's had in the entire novel. And in this way, it is only when he is a prisoner that he finally becomes and senses that he is truly free. He learns more about happiness and gratefulness while a prisoner than while he was free. Poor Prince Andre, his body and mind have in a sense become a theater for all of the big questions that war and peace has stirred up. Life, death, pain, suffering, God, war, goodness, and love. All these are now concentrated in the throes of Prince Andre. All I will say about Petya Rostov, the 
younger brother of Natasha, who has so gallantly and excitedly gone off to a war post. His vignette that Tolstoy gives him reminds me of one of my favorite Ernest Hemingway short stories, The Short Happy Life of Francis Mackimer. And you could really call this section the short happy life of Petya Rostov. Natasha is continuing her rite of passage, her ceremony of innocence, her break from the innocence and exuberance of youth to the weather-worn, cautious existence of adulthood. Death now is something that has become a reality. It has come close to her, but it has also bonded her now to Princess Maria. And this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship. Another thing that the essayist Tolstoy does in this novel, as he's stepping in and continuing to develop his thoughts on history and war and all the events around 1805 and 1812, is he wants to save and clean up and clarify the name of Kutuzov, the commander of the Russian army there in 1812. His name has been sullied by historians and Russians, but Tolstoy takes pains to show what a great man Kutuzov really was. The more intimately anyone was involved in the unfolding Russian drama of the day, the more easily its meaning escaped him. In Petersburg, and out in the provinces a long way from Moscow, ladies and gentlemen put on their militia uniforms, bewailed the fate of Russia and the loss of her ancient capital, and talked of self-sacrifice, and so on. But in the army, which had retreated beyond Moscow, scarcely anybody talked about or thought about Moscow, or gazed at the burning city and vowed to get his own back on the French, because they were all thinking about payday, or the next halt, or marry the canteen girl, or things like that. This is Tolstoy continuing to develop this argument about lived experience versus recorded experience. He gets us into the mind of soldiers in battle. And there's this one line, he says, it was beyond belief. They were the only ones who knew what life meant to them. So they couldn't understand or believe that it could be taken away. So simple, yet so profound. As I'm reading through this leading up to that wonderful statement, I'm thinking about, you know, what these soldiers must have been going through and these prisoners must have been going through. And then I read that and I think to myself, that's it, that's it, that's exactly it. To me, I'm the only one who knows, who really knows what life and what being alive means to me. So I can't think, I can't imagine what it must be like to suddenly realize some outside entity, some external person, can and is going to take my life away from me. Can fate have brought us together so strangely only for me to die? Can the truth about life have been revealed to me only to show I've been living a lie? I had this same thought as I was reading this passage about this particular character. And I just, it's the same thing with Pierre at the close of book three. Like I said just a moment ago, there are these moments where you think to yourself, is this it? Is this all my life was for? Could it be that it's just for this one thing? And what a thought to think that the meaning of your life, or let's say getting the revelation of what your life is for, what if that only comes at the very end? What a cruel, cold irony that is on your deathbed you finally understand what you were meant to do, but now you're out of life to do it. Love gets in the way of death. Love is life. Every single thing I understand, I understand only because I love. Everything is, everything exists only because I love. Everything is bound up with love and love alone. Love is God and dying means me, a tiny particle of love 
going back to its universal and eternal source. And then a narrator steps in and says, these thoughts seemed comforting enough, but they were only thoughts. There was something missing. I love how Tolstoy, over and over and over, he delivers something and you feel like, oh, okay, this is pretty conventional. Like, of course they're thinking that, or of course that. But then he comes in and adds this one little piece that keeps the whole structure somewhat off kilter. He's not going to let us get completely settled. It is difficult to see any profound wisdom or genius in this maneuver, meaning Napoleon's maneuver. It requires little mental effort to work out that the best position for an army not under attack is where its supplies are most readily available. This is again where he's continuing to break down bit by bit everything that happened, everything that went on. And in this particular case, proving that it was just common sense, not military genius. Even if the position of the Russian army did begin to improve from the time of that maneuver, it doesn't follow that the improvement was necessarily caused by it. And this is the beginning of a, a long chain of thoughts that Tolstoy will develop about causation. Everybody was undermining everybody else, mainly over the course of the war which all these men thought they were in control of, though in practice the war ignored them and went its own inevitable way. And so just like history for Tolstoy, war is its sort of own entity, its own consciousness with its own will. And now Tolstoy brings in the concept of bias in history. We cannot say with any certainty what degree of real genius Napoleon showed in Egypt, where 40 centuries looked down on him and his glory because all his famous exploits in that country are described for us exclusively by Frenchmen. We can arrive at no certain judgment of his genius in Austria and Prussia, since any information about his achievements in those places has to be extracted from French and German sources. And the inexplicable surrender of entire formations without a fight and fortresses without a siege is bound to predispose the Germans towards the concept of genius as the sole explanation of the war as it was waged in Germany. But we, thank God, have no reason, we meaning the Germ uh, we meaning the Russians, we thank God have no reason to invoke his genius to cover our shame. We have paid for the right to look the facts simply and squarely in the face, and we are not going to give up that right. The Napoleon that comes down to us as the motive force behind this movement, just as primitive people saw the figurehead on the prow of a ship as the motive force driving the ship, the Napoleon who was active at this time was like a child in a carriage who pulls on the straps inside and thinks he is doing the driving. <laughs> and more and more as I'm reading this, I'm starting to take it with a bit of a sense of humor because just like that passage exemplifies some of this is, is highly amusing that Tolstoy will come up with these sort of hilarious and therefore bolstered and impactful comments on Napoleon and historians and professors and so on. We're swinging to Pierre now. And it was now that he attained the peace of mind, the feeling of being at ease with himself, that he had been struggling vainly to achieve so long. This is while he's a prisoner. A surfeit of luxury takes all the pleasure out of satisfying our basic needs, and maximum freedom in the choice of occupation, which had been provided for him through education, wealth, and his position in society, makes the actual choice of an occupation extraordinarily difficult because it destroys the need and desire for any such thing. He's starting to ruminate now on how excess and comfort, a surfeit of luxury, really makes the attainment of happiness and contentment much, much more difficult. The more I read about Pierre's development of his thinking about life, the more I understand why Gandhi considered himself one of Tolstoy's disciples. There's a moment after a character dies and they're at the ceremony after the funeral. And the two characters, Tolstoy delivers the feeling between them like this. 
When they did speak, it was about the most trivial things, and both of them in equal measure avoided any reference to the future. To admit the possibility of a future seemed like an affront to his memory, the deceased's memory. That's exactly how it feels when you're mingling with people at a funeral after the burial and so on. And it, again, it just shows how powerfully and simply Tolstoy can capture something. To admit the possibility of a future seemed like an affront to the deceased's memory. Like to, to admit that you can go on with life now. It's funny how we feel that way. And with Natasha, we get that other side of life, which she had never given a thought to in days gone by because it had always seemed so remote and unbelievable, was now closer, more natural to her and more understandable than this side of life, where there was nothing but emptiness and desolation or pain and humiliation. So again, like I said, death seems closer than even life for Natasha. And now she's seeing that here there in this world, there's nothing but emptiness and desolation or pain and humiliation. What a, what a shift from that that youthful vigor that youthful vibrance unfortunately just gets tarnished but a mere 20 pages later natasha's wound was healing the internal wound she had believed her life was over but suddenly love for her mother had showed her that the essence of her life love was still alive within her when love reawakened life awakened and we're headed more and more towards love again as the reason to stay in this life because constantly it can feel like what good is it to live especially during times like these recorded by Tolstoy but it's for those moments of love those moments of love for Tolstoy are the reason to keep on living such is the lot not of great men, since that term remains unacknowledged by the Russian mind. So again, that pride in Russians' views of things, and also the tearing down of the great man theory. Uh, this is sort of contra Thomas Carlyle and others who believed in the great man theory that history is basically a series of different great men with powerful wills like Napoleon. But Tolstoy doesn't see it that way at all. History is not something that is created by and driven by great men. And again, for example, like Kutuzov, who has been totally overshadowed by the overblown Napoleon. This simple, modest, and therefore truly great figure could never fit the false mold invented by history for the European hero, the putative leader of men. Here's more of Pierre's thoughts. What comes next then? What am I going to do? And immediately he knew the answer. Nothing. I'm just going to live. Oh, it's marvelous. The one thing that had tormented him in earlier days, the constant search for a purpose in life, had ceased to exist. The ending of his search for a purpose was more than a chance event or a temporary development. He now sensed that it did not and could not exist. And it was the lack of any purpose that gave him the complete and joyous sense of freedom underlying his present happiness. So for Pierre, this is now a letting go of the search instead of engaging with the search. In days gone by, he had sought him, capital H, by setting purposes for himself, lowercase h. That search for a purpose had really been a seeking after God. And so it's not just that he's putting the search aside, it's just that the object of his search, meaning, is actually the wrong object. In short, this final book of War and Peace proper, here before we hit the epilogue, was even better than I expected and wanted it to be. Tolstoy obviously has many different objectives for this utterly ambitious book, and all of them come into play in this final book. Boy, we are now in the epilogue, and the first part of the epilogue continues the story. 
of the people, the different relationships, the different marriages, the children, the friendships, Maria, Natasha, Pierre, Nikolai Rostov, we get a continuation of the story and we jump 20 years into the future. And again, we get that interspersing of Tolstoy's thoughts on history with this continued story. And then finally, in the second part of the epilogue, because of course, War and Peace would have an epilogue that has two parts made up of many chapters, but the second part of the epilogue will be dedicated exclusively to Tolstoy, the rhetorician and essayist, delivering his final thoughts that he's been leading up to. This first part of the epilogue really confirms and highlights the fact that for Tolstoy, it's clear that life in all of its pain and suffering and senselessness and heartache is worth living for those moments of love. And those moments of love are glimpses at the divine. I would never have believed it. Never, she murmured to herself. This is uh, Countess Maria. That anyone could be as happy as this. Her face glowed with a happy smile, but at the same moment, she gave a sigh, and a gentle sadness showed in the depths of her eyes. It was as if there was a different kind of happiness, not like the happiness she was feeling here and now a form of happiness beyond human existence, and it had come to her in an involuntary memory just at that moment. So not only do we get, we get three things here. One, like I said, Tolstoy is great at delivering something that is just going to seem kind of pat and conventional, but then twisting it and making sure that the stability of this whole structure isn't such that we're just on completely level ground. But he also then gives that glimpse of a hand at work behind the ephemeral things here. And he does it so simply. Like it says, her face glowed with a happy smile, but at the same moment she gave a sigh and a gentle sadness showed, showed in the depths of her eyes. With Pierre, we get this. After seven years of married life, Pierre felt happy and secure in the knowledge that he wasn't a bad man. And he felt this because he could see himself reflected in his wife. In himself, he could sense the good and bad all mixed up together, the one obscuring the other. But in his wife, he could see a reflection of nothing but good. Anything that fell short of that was discarded. And this reflection was not achieved by logical thought processes. It came from a different source, a mysterious realm of direct personal experience. Here in the epilogue, Rostov, he is now left with these massive debts that nobody knew his father had racked up. And so we get this irony and this parallel way earlier when Rostov came back from losing and racking up gambling debts to Dolokhov and, and Rostov came home with so much guilt and shame and confessed it to his father. But he ends up marrying rich and over time all of his financial problems are resolved. But then Rostov becomes obsessed with the agricultural way of life and with the way of life of the peasants. And I know enough about Tolstoy to know there's a strong parallel to some of the way that Tolstoy himself went, lowering himself from his noble beginnings, his noble roots, and integrating with the peasant way of life. Maria, let's say, ends up in a tenuous relationship with her husband, and you can sort of see parallels to Sonia Tolstoy here. What's so interesting is that we see in the novel that Tolstoy, the writer, is completely aware of all the little dynamics from all the different perspectives. He can put himself directly in the mind of the wife or the husband. He has the capacity to completely see and understand all of these little nuances. There's a disparity then, once again, between the way that someone would like to live versus the way that they actually live. 
Natasha lets herself go and just focuses totally on devoting herself to her family. And for Pierre, he basically does the same thing. He still goes away on business in Petersburg, but he's totally devoted to his family. And he and his wife establish a really good, clear understanding of what they're getting into before they get married. We get Denisov back in here, and I didn't realize how much I missed him and liked him until this epilogue. There's something about that endearing, childish accent. And ever since I started reading this book and, and came across Denisov talking to Nikolai Rostov and calling him Wostov, Wostov, I think about that. I, I say Wostov to myself all the time now, though it shows Anthony Briggs brings in different accents and so on to really differentiate all the characters. But he's just, he's finds fault with everything. He's argumentative and forceful, high energy, but yet with that childish accent, it's sort of like the overgrown and oversized Pierre, who is actually a very gentle and caring soul. It's these physical elements that don't coincide with the internal elements. And that can often make a really endearing character as we see. If we assume, as historians do, that great men lead humanity towards the achievement of certain goals, such as the supremacy of Russia or France, it becomes impossible to explain the phenomena of history without having recourse to concepts like chance and genius. And Tolstoy now is in the final stages of his arguments that, that are a continued essay throughout the book. And here he's specifically taking on and tearing down the concepts of chance and genius. Chance set up the situation. Genius exploited it, history tells us. But what is chance and what is genius? The words chance and genius denote nothing that actually exists, and therefore they cannot be defined. All they denote is a degree of attainment in the understanding of phenomena. I don't know why a certain phenomenon occurs. I believe I never can know why, so I end up not wanting to know, and I talk about chance. I observe a force producing an effect out of all proportion to the general run of human quality. I don't understand why this happens, so I talk about genius. At one point, Rostov, as husband, makes the statement that I've got to build up our fortunes in my lifetime, and that's all there is to it. And to do that, you have to have discipline. You have to be hard, he would declare, clenching his fist with great passion. We understand this, and we understand the truth of it, but unfortunately, the way that Rostov seems to be going about this is at the expense of what his marriage could be. Pierre and Rostov are in a little bit of an argument, and we get the, narr the narration that Pierre took the opposite line, and since his intellectual capacity was sharper and more versatile, Nikolai was soon at a loss for words. This made him angrier than ever because deep down he felt convinced, not by reason, but by something stronger than reason that his point of view was the right one. And that something stronger than reason is pride. And Tolstoy is getting at pride as that fuel that makes some people deep down feel so convinced that they are right and that it can be a stronger fuel than reason, which is quite a statement at this time, especially because here we are not too far, what, 60 years, 70 years or so after the French Revolution and the Age of Reason and the Enlightenment. And of course, at the end of the epilogue part one, we see Andre's child, whom his sister Maria has been raising this whole time. And we get his thoughts that I ask only one thing of God, let what happened to Plutarch's men happen to me, because he's reading the lives of the noble Romans and Grecians by Plutarch, and let me do what they did. No, I'll do more. 
everybody will know me and love me and admire me. And suddenly Nikolai's chest was choked with sobs and he burst into tears. Here in this closing vignette, this closing tableau of the young 15 year old offspring of Prince Andre reading Plutarch's lives and thinking everybody will know me and love me and admire me, we see that the same aspirations that Andre and Rostov and Pierre all began with at the beginning of this novel and grappled with throughout their entire lives, this same thing is a seed that is passed down to and repeated now in the current generation. And then we slide into the final portion of the novel, Epilogue Part 2. This is devoted exclusively to the finishing of the interspersed essay that acts as a, a stitching, a binding of the novel War and Peace. You might have thought that modern history, having rejected the ancient's belief in a man's subjection to a deity, and the direction of peoples towards predetermined ends would have turned away from the outward manifestations of power to look for the causes that lie behind it. But modern history has not done that. It has rejected the views of the ancients in theory while continuing to follow them in practice. And essentially, again, he's getting at the ancients saw a deity at work, a, a god outside of time guiding human affairs. And now modern history does not see that. However, they see this genius cropping up in great men. And so Tolstoy wants to show that, okay, the theory has changed, but the practice really hasn't. It's still basically the same. And he wants to step back and show there's still got to be some force, some driving force. And chapter two, we'll just start off with the sing single sentence. What kind of force is it that moves nations. And when Tolstoy really gets down into the details of, just think about it, just because this great general says to do something, why do hundreds of thousands of people react? At the beginning of chapter six, Tolstoy once again gives us, without any ambiguity, his thoughts on the matter. Only the will of a timeless deity could possibly affect a whole series of events occurring over years or centuries, and only a spontaneous deity could by sheer willpower direct the movement of humanity. Man acts within time and is involved in events. There is no such thing as a command that comes from nowhere or one that embraces a whole series of events. Every command flows from an earlier one and never relates to a whole series of events, being always limited to a single moment within those events. And there are two things that Tolstoy is bringing out here, and that is the causal chain that begins all the way at the beginning with what I believe is Aristotle called the unmoved mover. There are two questions that Tolstoy feels are the most crucial when it comes to the philosophy of history. What is power and what is the force that determines the movement of peoples? And this has been answered by historians, but Tolstoy is far from satisfied with the answer. And he wants to show us why he's unsatisfied and why it has to be something other than what's being claimed. And so now I have, for the first time in my life at 38 years old, I have read War and Peace. And for just my final thought on the reading of the book proper, I'll quote from the book itself, because this is how I feel. And the more she absorbed herself in this subject, mind, body, and soul, the more the subject expanded before her very eyes, and the skimpier and more inadequate her resources for coping with it seemed to be. So she ended up concentrating them totally on this one subject and still didn't manage to do all that seemed necessary. This is exactly how I feel trying to dig out within me everything that I want to say about this book from this first reading. Every time I come up with something or think about something, the book just expands and expands, and the more and more I feel inadequate to talk about it. But the best news is that I get to read it again.
Now I'm going to go through some secondary material relevant to Tolstoy and War and Peace. First off, there is Clifton Fadiman's Lifetime Reading Plan. This is one of the greatest guides to getting a list and insight into what Fadiman and others of his ilk consider the greatest books ever written and why, and why you should spend a lifetime reading them. This one is actually the new Lifetime Reading Plan, which has John S. Major coming in and kind of extending it into Eastern literature as well as Western. Of War and Peace, Fadiman says, however its greatness may be defined, it is not connected with obscurity, with difficulty, or even with profundity. Now, while I disagree with profundity, because I think it is connected very much with profundity, and obscurity and difficulty are terms that were clear to Fadiman, and at that time, however, with someone like me, I'm drawn to difficulty and obscurity and complexity. However, this does get at a truth that was immediately apparent to me, and that is just the accessibility and readability of War and Peace. That thousand books to read before you die, James Mustich says of War and Peace, it is eminently, even obsessively readable. That nails it. He also says that even Napoleon comes across as a minor figure in the overwhelming landscape of Tolstoy's imagination. Now, that is a great formulation to give a sense of the vastness and the stature of War and Peace. However, it does sort of, what it sort of ignores to a degree is the fact that Tolstoy was very deliberate in shrinking down Napoleon in War and Peace. In Schmidt's The Novel, A Biography, Tolstoy says Virginia Woolf is the greatest of all novelists, her touchstone. Edmund Wilson calls Tolstoy one of the greatest impersonators in literature. A bad student at school, a soldier, and a would-be writer, Tolstoy was deeply affected by his meetings in Paris in 1860 and 1861 with Victor Hugo, who had recently completed Les Miserables. Here was a work on a scale and with a clarity that Tolstoy found inspiring. Without, now this is quite a claim by Michael Schmidt, without Les Miserables, War and Peace might not have been written. Well, he does hedge it with might not. Its impact, War and Peace, on American fiction, in particular on Norman Mailer's, is acknowledged by Mailer himself. And Christopher Isherwood confesses, I love Tolstoy's furious essays. In the Lectures on Russian Literature by Vladimir Nabokov, he says of Tolstoy that Tolstoy is the greatest Russian writer of prose fiction. It would seem at first glance that Tolstoy's fiction is heavily infected with his teachings. Actually, his ideology was so tame and so vague and so far from politics and, on the other hand, his art was so powerful, so tiger bright, how awesome is that, so original and universal that it easily transcends the sermon. That is a wonderful formulation. And about Tolstoy's new religion, Nabokov says that it's a neutral blend between a kind of Hindu nirvana and the New Testament, Jesus minus the church. He discovered a method of picturing life which most pleasingly and exactly corresponds to our idea of time. What really seduces the average reader is the gift Tolstoy had of endowing his fiction with such time values as correspond exactly to our sense of time. When I read this after having read War and Peace, this was a revelation. This was exactly something that I experienced but couldn't quite formulate and I needed a Nabokov to help me. Tolstoy's prose keeps pace with our pulses. His characters seem to move with the same swing as the people passing under our window while we sit reading his book. In Harold Bloom's The Western Canon, Bloom starts off his whole section on Tolstoy and heroism with this, the best introduction to Tolstoy I have found is Maxim Gorky's reminiscences based upon his visits to the 72-year-old novelist who earlier in 1901 was living in the Crimea in poor health and recently excommunicated from the Russian Orthodox Church. As soon as I read that, and I'd read it before, but now it's relevant because I'm reading Tolstoy 
War and Peace for the first time, but I immediately sought out a beautiful little hardcover of Gorky's reminiscences. Tolstoy must be read in the company of Homer, the Yawist, Dante, and Shakespeare, as perhaps the only writer since the Renaissance who can challenge them. It's a big statement from Bloom. The greatest of all writers in Russian, an eminence Tolstoy is unlikely ever to lose. Interestingly, Bloom goes on to herald Haji Murat as the highest, as the apex of Tolstoy's artistic creation. And I have read that novel, and it's very slim, but it is wonderful. Though, I'm not sure I can totally agree that it puts War and Peace and Anna Karenina in shadow. This is from Maxim Gorky's Reminiscences. If he were a fish, he would certainly swim only in the ocean. His silence is impressive. Surely he has some thoughts of which he is afraid. Tolstoy is the sounding bell of this world. He always greatly exalted immortality on the other side of life, but he preferred it on this side. Of war and peace, he himself said, without false modity, it is like the Iliad. Pushkin and he, there is nothing more sublime or dearer to us. And he pins that right before he learns that Tolstoy is dead. In fact, the next paragraph is just one sentence that says, Leo Tolstoy is dead. This completely alters the next part of the reminiscences. And I read a bulk of it at the very beginning of this video. It's excruciating. In his questions, he was merciless. In his answers, reserved, as becomes a wise man. One must have heard him speak in order to understand the extraordinary, indefinable beauty of his speech. It was, in a sense, incorrect. Socks? What are you doing? Is my cat in this frame? <laughs> I don't know what he's doing. Where was I? One must have heard him speak in order to understand the extraordinary, indefinable beauty of his speech. It was, in a sense, incorrect, abounding in repetitions of the same word, saturated with village simplicity. See you later. The effect of his words did not come only from the intonation and the expression of his face, but from the play and light in his eyes, the most eloquent eyes I have ever seen. In his two eyes, Leo Nikolaevich possessed a thousand eyes. The old magician stands before me, alien to all, a solitary traveler through all the deserts of thought in search of an all-embracing truth, which he has not found. I look at him, and although I feel sorrow for the loss, I feel pride at having seen the man, and that pride alleviates my pain and grief. Give War and Peace a Chance by Tolstoy scholar expert Andrew Kaufman. Andrew Kaufman is a very accessible and charismatic writer in this work for general audiences. Its subtitle is Tolstoy and Wisdom for Troubled Times. And it really reminded me of what Sarah Bakewell does for Montaigne in her book. I think it's called How to Live, 21 Questions About Life Answered by Montaigne's Essays, something like that. But she intertwines just as Andrew Kaufman does here as an internationally recognized Tolstoy scholar who is still close friends with family members of Tolstoy and teaches Russian, I think he's at UVA, and he also has a program, Books Behind Bars, where he and some of his students go to local prisons there in Virginia, and they take stories, including the death of Ivan Ilyich from Tolstoy, and even War and Peace into the prisons, and help with literacy and cultural connection, and it's just amazing some of the stuff that, that this guy does, but he basically gives us this wonderful synthesis of biography, history, philosophy, and literary appreciation to highlight the wisdom in War and Peace that makes the book universal and timeless. I'm looking here because I wrote that out and I wanted to deliver it exactly as it was. Plus, it has a bunch of fun facts, quips, and anecdotes. And again, this is what Sarah Bakewell did in her 
book for general audiences on Montaigne. I highly, highly recommend that. In Tolstoy's combination of skepticism and hope that I have always loved most about his work, that childlike curiosity about everyone and everything he sees, coupled with a wise awareness of who's who and what's what. I love his courage to believe in human goodness, even when his rational mind offers a thousand reasons why he shouldn't. The word for peace in Russian is identical to the word for world, or cosmos, mir. Pronounce mir. <laughs> Works better if you're seeing it on the page. So when Russians hear the title of the novel, they are hearing not just war and peace, but war and the world, which in fact captures an essential dimension of this novel missing in the English rendition. Books like it when, rather than merely studying them, you engage with them deeply, personally, bringing your entire self to the reading experience, both you and the book expanding to dimensions you'd never have thought possible. Acute anxiety led him to the verge of suicide, no Xanax in those days. He even asked his wife to hide the knives, guns, and ropes in the house for fear that he might kill himself. We're jumping way ahead to the Tolstoy around the time of the composition of Anna Karenina here. I've found that he was actually the happiest he'd ever been in his life during the composition of War and Peace, but sunk to his lowest with Anna Karenina. His famous contemporary, the novelist Ivan Turgenev, implored Tolstoy to stop moralizing and return to what he did best, being a great artist. But Tolstoy didn't take kindly to this advice from an erstwhile friend long since turned into a foe Tolstoy had once challenged to a duel. And when I get to my comments on the biography of Tolstoy by A.N. Wilson, we get more into this really contentious relationship between Turgenev and Tolstoy. Henry James aptly called Tolstoy a reflector as vast as a natural lake, a monster harnessed to his great subject, all of life. James also called War and Peace a loose, baggy monster, which perplexes me as much as it perplexed Harold Bloom. Just so we're clear, Henry James is one of my favorite prose writers of all time. This moralist who preached celibacy in and out of marriage had, in fact, a voracious sexual appetite and sired an illegitimate child by a local peasant girl. I must have a woman, he wrote in his diary when he was 25. Sensuality doesn't give me a moment's peace. His gambling sprees continued, as did his merrymaking, his drinking binges, his womanizing, and his laziness. And we'll get a lot more glimpse into that in A.N. Wilson's biography. Tolstoy wrote about the joys and tribulations of love as beautifully as any writer ever has. Yet, he was sadly ill-equipped to master that complex emotion through the course of his own life. Often tender as a kitten, he could suddenly spring into the towering narcissism of a lion. Indeed, his life and conduct justified all too well his parents' decision to name their son Leo, or in Russian, Lev, and that Leonine ferocity, killingly attractive to his admirers across the globe, nearly destroyed his wife, who on multiple occasions during their stormy 48-year marriage attempted suicide. His renunciation of the copyright on all of his works written after 1881. This is just some of the craziness that started happening towards the end of his life. He started getting convicted of the fact that he was making money off the royalties and the copyrights of his work. And his wife, Sophia, was adamant. She was business-minded. She was incisive. She was economical. She was level-headed. She was very prudent and knew, hey, we've got to do certain things to keep ourselves afloat here. And in fact, it would be his wife who got Tolstoy to stop serializing War and Peace and to sell it as a book. The Russian Orthodox Church, which to this day refuses to officially withdraw the edict of excommunication placed on Tolstoy back in 1901, or to forgive the writer for his withering attacks on the church. The characters who come to recognize how little they know about what will happen, Tolstoy suggests, are actually the ones who know the most. As any Russian reader in the 1860s would have known, the heated political discussions taking place in the epilogue of War and Peace are harbingers of the future Decembrist uprising that would occur only a few years after the novel's ending. 
Even, even Turgenev told a friend, to my own deep disappointment, I must confess that this novel seems to me positively bad, boring, and unsuccessful. And then Kaufman comments, it's all a matter of how we view its strangeness. War and Peace is certainly no fathers and sons. Turgenev's elegantly structured novel, which, as it happens, put Tolstoy to sleep when he read it one evening on Turgenev's drawing room sofa. In 1862, the government raided his Yasnaya Pollyanna school for fear that Tolstoy is planting subversive ideas in young peasant minds. Tolstoy's genius, the formalists, pointed out, the Russian formalists, lies in his uncanny ability to make our familiar, everyday world suddenly seem strange, and therefore fresh. Make it strange was a credo of the, uh, of the time there in, in literature. Like Cezanne, who is said to have painted an apple in such a way that it seemed as though you were looking at one for the very first time, Tolstoy portrays life with an almost disconcerting truthfulness. Indeed, War and Peace thrusts readers raised on more polished literary fare out of their familiar paradigms and into a brave new fictional world, which, for all its strangeness, somehow starts to feel more real than reality itself. I felt precisely this as I read War and Peace. A good 2.5% of this Russian national epic, in fact, happens in French. The overabundance of French in the book made complete sense to him, for it highlighted that French way of thinking he believed had been had pervaded Russian high society ever since Peter the Great westernized Russia at the beginning of the 18th century. Never furnishing his readers with the sort of potted biography other 19th century novel novelists often did when introducing a major character. I noticed this lack of exposition, um, but I forgot to mention it during my commentary. Many Soviet soldiers given the 1812 sections of the novel to read in their barracks during World War II later claim to have been stirred more by Tolstoy's descriptions of warfare than by the actual battlefield events unfolding before their eyes. At 23, he traveled with his brother Nikolai and joined the army in the Caucasus with the aim of changing his libertine ways and winning some glory on the battlefield. But war turned out to be far less glamorous than he'd imagined and his high hopes for personal transformation, no match for the seductive gypsy girls and enticing po poker tables he encountered. Open Tolstoy's diaries from his 20s, and you'll find a morbidly entertaining portrait of a young man in a seemingly constant state of crisis. Moreover, should our efforts fail to pan out in the end, as is so often the case, does it follow that our lives have been a waste? This is some of the Tolstoyan wisdom that's imparted in the topic of success in War and Peace. In his 70s, Tolstoy asked to be buried on the spot where, as a boy, he and his brother Nikolai had discovered a little green stick, a stick on which, they believed, was inscribed the secret to universal happiness. Overwhelmed by the kingdom of God is within you when he first read it at the age of 25, Gandhi was transformed by the independent thinking, profound morality, and the truthfulness of Tolstoy's vision. Consummately bad planner that he is, Pierre ricochets pinball-like from one experience to the next, but he also happens to lead a rather fascinating life, a life that will lead him to the sort of abiding happiness that eludes many of the novel's more pragmatic characters. That's because Pierre is a genuine seeker, and as such, he can teach us something about living with deeper purpose in a world that, if it doesn't turn us into unthinking egoists, is just as likely to turn us into overthinking nihilists. Tolstoy would have agreed then with one of his favorite American writers, Henry David Thoreau, who compared happiness to a butterfly that eludes you the more you chase it, only to come and sit softly on your shoulder as soon as you turn your attention to other things. Wow, that, I love that. Of Homer's Iliad, a book that Tolstoy loved and read often, and to which he, is on, he on one occasion proudly compared to War and Peace. I guess that's redundant, because I already pointed that out. Whenever his writing wasn't going well or he was out of sorts, Tolstoy himself would get his guns, pack his bags, call his huntsmen, and head off for the woods for a day or more. He'd kill anything, fox, hares, wolves, even bears. 
In fact, once he was almost mauled to death by one of this last bears, a mishap he later recounted in an adventure story for children. In the last 20 years of his life, Tolstoy tormented his wife with his priggish extremism, foolhardy decision-making, impracticality, name-calling, and threats to leave her, which in 1910 he finally made good on. While Tolstoy was railing in his later years against the evils of capitalism, the church, and private property, the fact that his wife made sure their own home at Yasnaya Polyana would not be dispossessed and that her children had food, clothes, and a future. She set up a publishing business, for example, to bring in family income from Tolstoy's writings, a venture of which Tol Tolstoy disapproved, believing it immoral for the family to profit from his labors. And so they fought ad nauseum about everything from copyright ownership to the education of their children. This man who gave world literature some of its most beautiful scenes of human intimacy was surely one of the most love-challenged men who ever lived. Such an interesting irony. But rather than working through these issues in therapy as one might do today, Tolstoy did what any self-respecting 19th century Russian novelist would have done. He gave the problems to his characters to deal with. Tolstoy saw the family as society's primary social unit. When families break down, he observed, societies break down, and life itself falls apart. The shift from agrarian to industrial economy, with the latter's emphasis on individualism, competition, and consumerist gratification, was having its effect. What's more, the so-called woman question was heating up, 19th century Russia's equivalent of what today would be called feminism. Freedom, alas, isn't all it's cracked up to be, as the 19-year-old Natasha realizes while suffering from a severe case of opinionitis. Unable to choose between the juicily romantic Anatole and the jaded but morally superior Prince Andre. He'd lost both his parents by the age of nine. He witnessed wartime slaughter while serving as a soldier in the Caucasus and in the Crimea. In 1856, his brother Dmitri died of consumption, and in 1860, another brother, Nikolai, died of the same disease. For weeks after his soul-wrenching panic attack during that land-buying trip in 1869, Tolstoy himself was on the verge of suicide. He lost five of his young children, either to disease or complications in childbirth. So he was no stranger to the tragedy of this mortal life. Tolstoy is perhaps the most universal of all the great Russian writers, and death his most accessible theme. Buddhism and Hinduism deeply influenced the author. Tolstoy needed Andrei Bolkonsky to illustrate the fate of a man who never quite learns how to integrate his high ideals with ordinary reality, who never learns how to allow his genuine insight into that greater something out there to deepen his appreciation of this messy world down here. Moved by the Basquiat way of life, Tolstoy even began to adopt some of their customs. Studying the Quran, for example, smoking hashish, and getting drunk on kumis, an alcoholic drink made from mare's milk. He believed that smug claims about knowing the truth almost certainly never succeeded in leading us there. War and peace challenges intellectual arrogance of all stripes, shows life to be infinitely more complex than acknowledged by any of our beliefs and theories, so often motivated by blind self-interest. Indeed, a character's certainty about something is a pretty good indication of his or her being wrong about it, or at the very least, insufficiently right. Historians, whose books Tolstoy read by the hundreds in preparation for writing War and Peace. And yet, for all of these things, this is a man who was often reduced to tears while listening to Bach. He knew well the power of music to affect listeners, even long after the performance has ended. Not surprisingly, he is equally attuned to the ways in which every human life, even as it eventually fades back into the whole, leaves its indelible trace on the world in often unpredictable ways. Now I'm going to go on to some critical works. First, we'll start with Harold Bloom's interpretations, the modern critical views. He comes right out of the gate in his introduction to the collection of essays with Tolstoy, as befits the writer since Shakespeare who most has the art of the actual combines in his representational praxis the incompatible powers of the two strongest ancient authors, the poet of the Iliad and the original teller of the stories of Abraham, Joseph, 
Jacob, and Moses in Genesis and Exodus. Pierre, in his comic aspects, reflects the Shakespearean rather than the Homeric or biblical naturalism. In Freedom and Necessity, a reconsideration of War and Peace by Paul de Brechny, there's an interplay of Tolstoy's theory of history at the macro or national level and the micro or individual level. And the rhetorical fallibility of his argument is dredged out here. But what Paul here, Paul D means by freedom and necessity is basically free will, which he sees Tolstoy as attributing to history and necessity being ter determinism, which he ascribes to individuals. Percy Lubach was wrong, surely, in claiming that in War and Peace, Tolstoy had written two novels in one. Rather, as the dialectic of war and peace unfolds in Tolstoy's novel, the reader becomes increasingly aware of the essential unity of the private and the public in the Russian author's world. Whose doing it is, his groping for a philosophy of history and his analysis of the individual characters are both generated by a desire to find an answer to Pierre's question, whose doing is it? What gives the novel viable organic unity is that principles of historical analysis are applied to the portrayal of individual characters and a sense of freedom informs the depictions of historical events. The new turns the characters encounter in their destinies may be as treacherous and temporary as those in the destiny of the nation. Tolstoy's depiction of history, although its guiding principle is claimed to be a theory of necessity, gravitates nevertheless towards expressions of free will and reasserts moral values. Conversely, his characters, who should in theory be the main vehicles of individual moral freedom, tend actually to be clad in iron necessity. This is a really good and nuanced take on what I saw in my reading of War and Peace as the supreme and absolute authority of necessity or determinism. But there are many, many examples in this essay that bolster the author's conclusion that there's both. There is determinism and free will. But then again, now that I think about it, I think I did say in my commentary something about when you're outside of time, everything has to be determinism. If you're outside of time and you're the author, the creator, and if you're inside of it, everything has to be free will or that really good illusion of it. Vitality rather than freedom. When the great globe of sky opens above Andre and Napoleon shrinks to toy size, the change brought about is not the loss of freedom, but the loss of a sense of importance in earthly things. In Robert Louis Jackson's essay, The Second Birth of Pierre Bezukhov, it's about that moment of Pierre's rebirth that occurs with his meeting Platon Karataev in jail, and Tolstoy describes it in terms of a literal birth, utilizing each of the five senses as opposed to just the intellect. This was very interesting and illuminating. His meeting with Platon Karataev after the executions, this is when Pierre is a uh, French prisoner, signals his psychological and spiritual recovery, recovery and the beginning of a new phase of his life. It is in this state of almost complete physical and mental prostration that Pierre becomes aware of a little man sitting near him and looking at him. His awakening or return to normal consciousness begins at this point, like I said. His awakening begins with the stimulation of the most primitive sense, smell. Just as an infant recognizes its mother by its sense of smell, so Pierre first recognize, recognizes Platon Karataev. On the symbolic plane, a very distinct mother surrogate for him by a strong smell of sweat. And another scholar I noted here, because I can't remember who it is, but another scholar connects this smell to the strong drink, the um, kumis, that he would drink with the baskiers. Um, and and uh, it was that strong mare's milk that Tolstoy would drink for the experience of a sort of spiritual and physical cleansing. Nonetheless, it's characterized by a strong smell of sweat. And this could be, I think the scholar, the other scholar uh, notes that this could be our signal or Tolstoy's way of signaling that Platon Karataev is this wise figure linked to the 
baskiers that Tolstoy would go and, and cleanse with. This is amazing. Let me drink some water because this is amazing. Tolstoy's juxtaposition of the insoluble questions of death and injustice with the pragmatic forces of life, here the instinctive need for and enjoyment of food, points to one of his most fundamental observations, that the vital life processes, the unconscious egoism of life, are totally different to moral, are totally indifferent to moral and intellectual questions of life and death, or to the sense of the absurd in human existence. In the chapter on the execution of Da Vici Field, for example, Tolstoy provides a chilling example of the way man's vital life processes remain numb even to the terrible reality of death. A prisoner, literally seconds before his execution, adjusts the tight knot of his blindfold. Then he leads back against the bloody stake, but feeling himself uncomfortable in this position, he straightened himself. That's a quote of a detail from uh, War and Peace. Placed his feet evenly and leaned back more comfortably. In this extraordinary detail, Tolstoy captures the terrible sense of the absurd and, at the same time, man's organic inability to face the reality of his own death. Pierre's munching of the potato at a moment of terrible moral anguish philosophically is of the same order as the prisoner's seemingly trivial but deeply instinctive concern for comfort a moment before total extinction. Here, the blindfold one may note in passing, as an image speaks eloquently not only of man's quite conscious unwillingness to look in the face of death, but of the quite natural and unconscious blindfold afforded by the egoism of life, a capacity guilelessly to embed, as it were, an everyday image in a deep substratum of anthropological or philosophical thought is characteristic, of course, of Tolstoy's unsurpassed art. This final moment in the shed, however, is not without a certain ambiguity, the kind that is characteristic of all resolutions and denouements in War and Peace. And I think I mentioned that and, uh, in my commentary, and, and I articulated it as something like every time we get something that rings true to life, Tolstoy puts one more element of ambiguity or complexity in there. In The Recuperative Powers of Memory, Tolstoy's War and Peace by Patricia Cardin, memory is the primary instrument for creating the novel, she argues. Memory is also the grounds on which we can conceive of a reality higher than the senses. This essay discusses one of my favorite passages in War and Peace, and it's the passage where Natasha is talking about the sense of of having lived forever, the sense of immortality, and having been alive before. And it's pawned off as metempsychosis by another character. And she's like, no, 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 I'm not talking about um, transmogrification. I'm talking about immortality as a human. I've lived before I was born. Escaping the burdens of mortality becomes intimately tied up with writing the novel. Thus, Tolstoy embarks upon his great meditation upon the powers that sustain life and hold death at bay. He is 35 years old, and the task will occupy the next seven years of his life. A novel de longue Hélène from the epic of the 1810s and 20s, and she's quoting him from a diary entry, implies a sustained retrospective movement. It will of necessity be dependent upon the collective operation of memory that forms history. Memory was also to provide the basic stuff of plot. At the heart of War and Peace is the imagined world of the past at Yasnaya Pollyanna, Tolstoy's family home. The two principal families of the novels, of the novel, the Rostovs and the Balkonskis, transparently recreate the characters and conditions of life of the Tolstoys and the Volkonskis. Though Tolstoy has preserved his author's license to change much and even to add fictional characters to the families. It wasn't until I started reading A.N. Wilson's biography that I realized just how autobiographical War and Peace is. Since we seem to hold notions like immortality of the soul and afterlife, where can we have gotten them if not through the operation of memory? For how could we conceive ideas of which we have no previous knowledge? And of course, we're getting right at one of the Socratic dialogues that Plato gives us, the Mino. Memory proves to us every day the existence of a reality 
not evident to the census. And I took that from the scholarly essay and put it in my commonplace book. Dimmler's appearance on the scene names the occasion's tonality. It is musical. It is nocturnal. For Madame, for Madame Rostova asks Dimmler to play a nocturne by field, and as he plays, dusk falls, and the silver rays of the moon shine into the sitting room. And above all, Dimmler is German. It was the Germans who had most exalted music as the expressive language of the soul. But Tolstoy does not belong to the interior decorator school of novelists, <laughs> and he means to do more than furnish the scene with the appropriate accessories. It's wonderful. That we remember things in our current existence because we knew them in the past existence is the very soul of Platonic doctrine. In the Mino, Socrates points to memory to answer the question, how can we seek for what we are totally ignorant of? Ah, so there it is. The Platonic doctrine of remembering thus underlies the shape that War and Peace took as a novel. If the Rostovs pick up the thread of life as it flows out of the source, the Balkonskis are connected to the continuum at its other end, where in death it rejoins eternity. This is a collection of critical essays specifically on War and Peace edited by Brett Cook, and I found much to love in here. Here are some excerpts from the preface to the volume by Brett Cook. In his hands, that is Tolstoy's hands, fiction became emboldened to question the structure of our universe and expand our sense of our own nature. The French invasion is also a Roman Catholic intrusion into Russia, something that a Russian Orthodox, as Tolstoy was when he wrote the novel, would be sensitive to. And then in the leading essay by Brett Cook called On War and Peace, Tolstoy consulted many historical accounts his in-laws sought out materials for him, and he visited Russia's newly opened national libraries himself. He interviewed surviving eyewitnesses who were alive 50 years after the events to better grasp the flavor of the period. And he drew on passages of period letters and private materials, including his mother's diary. Transcripts of actual speeches and documents are included in the text of War and Peace. He conducted a personal inspection of the Borodino battlefield at Borodino and argued for a revised version of the positions and movements of the opposing armies, even providing a map. Tolstoy goes further to disarm the famed leader, that is, Napoleon. Given the scale of the battle, a commander cannot even follow the course of action except in a crude manner. What the distance does not conceal, dust and smoke will. And in fact, we get that very highly conspicuous presence of fog and smoke to the degree that makes you wonder how much of Dickens's Bleak House, wherein the fog is essentially its own character um, that Tolstoy was maybe drawing on. Making it strange, the defamiliarization of something we take for granted is a major stylistic principle, not just in the scene where Natasha visits the opera, but throughout the text. Tolstoy writes his novel to make the experience of reading approach that of actual life. Time and again, the reader is given no guidance, but rather is disoriented and forced to adjust his or, on his or her own, thus acknowledging and presumably re-examining the conventions we live by. Tolstoy arrays his major female characters in a one-dimensional and, to be frank, sexist scale, ranging from chaste to promiscuous, with Princess Maria and Hélène at those opposing poles. Yet more, all are poised on the cusp of finding husbands and becoming mothers. Only Princess Lisa is married and pregnant at the opening of War and Peace. We should think of Tolstoy's book, like all art, as a mechanism for productive thought. That is a great one sentence assertion of the book. In Janet Tucker's essay, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and Napoleon, she says that in two of their most celebrated works, Tolstoy's War and Peace and Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment, there are significant shared themes. And in fact, it's been so crazy for me to find out that these two novels were serialized at the same time in the same magazine. We'll get into more of that when I get to the biography. No single individual more readily crystallizes or encapsulates the dangers of Western culture to Russians as Napoleon. For both Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, 
one striking young protagonist picks up and embodies the, the, Neo the Napoleonic theme within the Russian context. For Tolstoy, that character is, of course, Prince Andrei Bolkonsky. Andrei worshipped Napoleon. And then for Dostoevsky, it was, of course, Raskolnikov, who himself was quite ready to transgress as one of the elect. Janet Tucker also points out that Petersburg is Raskolnikov's field of battle. War and peace ends in the Russian countryside, a haven of Russianness, serving as a Russian closing frame to and commentary on the, artific the artificial Frenchified atmosphere of Anna Scherer's salon at the beginning. While there is no Napoleonic invasion looming, nevertheless, Dostoevsky, like Tolstoy, presents a sense of imminent danger to Russia. Dostoevsky perceived this danger chiefly in the Russian acceptance of Western philosophical currents, principally utilitarianism and utopian socialism. Napoleon figures most significantly for Raskolnikov, for whom he represents a bold and inspiring leader fully capable of overstepping the boundaries and codes of acceptable behavior for ordinary people, as Raskolnikov himself wants to do, and get away with it. Tolstoy ridicules Napoleon's assumption that he can change the course of history. Dostoevsky attacks Raskolnikov's supposition following the Napoleonic model that he can and has the right to control society and alter fate. Platon Karataev, Kutuzov, Pierre, and Natasha serve as counterweights to Napoleon in War and Peace. So too do the Bolkonskis, the old prince, Princess Maria, and eventually a redeemed Prince Andre. Dostoevsky juxtaposes Sonia and Lizavita, who embody Russian Orthodoxy and the concept of sobornost, orthodox, communi orthodox communality, to the extreme individualism of Svidrigailov. Tolstoy privileges space, identifying spatial breadth with intrinsic Russianness. Platon Karataev, the enormity of the Russian countryside, the sky that, however foreign, is linked with the sky of home. Dostoevsky instead privileges time. He expands time, slows it down, stops it, and causes it to swell beyond the confines of his novel, particularly in chapter two of his epilogue. In Olga Slivitskaya's essay, The Poetic Nature of War and Peace, she shows that Tolstoy uses the conjunction of the person's psychological condition and the world or nature, natural condition, to bring us to the edge of a blurred border where only poetry can take over. She seizes on one of my favorite scenes where we have that anthropomorphism of the oak tree with Prince Andre. This scene is Sir psychological, sir, as in the French for above or on top of, inasmuch as it is the object of the author's consciousness giving witness from the objective world that everything is mutable, that June, the month of June, is inevitably different from the early spring. What dominates in this scene, man or world, the projection of our consciousness or the world beyond our consciousness, psychology or ontology. One thing is clear, Tolstoy's major theme is the interaction, or as he puts it, the unity of the human soul with the world surrounding it. Poetic, in the original Russian, is one of the most common words in the novel. As a point of departure, we cite Tolstoy's statement, Nature greatly exceeded its aim by giving man a need for poetry and love, if its one law is expediency. Thus, on a preliminary basis, one can define the poetic as everything that exceeds its aim and is not limited by expediency. That's a great definition of really good poetry. It exceeds its aim. She excerpts this enumeration, this sort of list of things that goes through a character's mind, and she says that this narrative enumeration is such that every detail is immediately situated with items of a completely different nature, Hence, one does not simply blend into the other. Everything in the list is quite distinct, as if very clearly cut out. Everything exists separately, but everything together flows into one image. 
Each detail attracts attention and, for this reason, becomes all the more important. But on the borders of each detail, that usual erosion of the outlines and imperceptible transitions are missing. Distinctions are preserved everywhere. That is some of the best articulation of what makes reading War and Peace so great. E.M. Forster says, what rules in Tolstoy's epic is not time, but space cast by the unbounded expanses of Russia. With openings into something higher, poetry clearly presents itself, obedient not to the laws of the epic, but to the laws of the lyric. This promotes the poetic aura of the novel in its aesthetic integrity. It's a, just a brilliant essay that's worth seeking out. In Ronald D. LeBlanc's essay, The Russian Homer, Food, Eating, and Scenes of Dining and War and Peace, he points out, as far as food, eating, and scenes of dining are concerned, the epilogue reads more as an abandonment or even the repudiation of the Homeric element rather than as its apotheosis. As noted at the outset of this essay, Tolstoy is reputed to have celebrated the instinctual animal life of human beings in War and Peace, glorifying in a nearly pagan way the joy of living spontaneously and instinctually. The author's treatment of food and eating in the second half of the novel, however, especially in the epilogue, hardly seems to come from the pen of the Russian Homer. It seems instead to anticipate the asceticism of the post-conversion Tolstoy, who waged a veritable holy war against the human body and its enjoyment of physical pleasures, preaching abstinence in both one's diet and one's sexual life as a way to attain to moral and spiritual happiness. And in Jeff Love's The Philosophy of History, he takes on what are usually termed the boring bits or the skippable parts of War and Peace. That is the chapters on Tolstoy's conception of history and especially the second part of the epilogue. And Jeff Love wants to do nothing less than show us why they are completely necessary and integrated with the novel and shouldn't be skipped. In the 18th century, the notion of a philosophy of history gained currency as a description of a critical practice that attempted to define the essence of history. And he goes on to talk about Hegel as one of the big figures of philosophy of history. Opponents of Hegel's, who claimed that there is no inner logic to history, include the German thinker author Schopenhauer, who played a prominent role and would have considerable influence on Tolstoy. So we've got these two figures pitted against each other. To explain events whose causal nexus is endlessly complex is in fact impossible by definition. Thus, explanations that tie events to the actions of specific individuals are necessarily false or misleading because they are incomplete. What is more, this falsehood is a flattering or comforting one, suggesting that human beings have the power to shape their destiny rather than to be shaped by it. A necessarily inscrutable it. This, later point, this latter point emerges clearly much earlier in the novel at the Battle of Schoengraben. We observe this battle through the eyes of Prince Andrei Bolkonsky, who admires and believes in Napoleon's power as a military strategist and tactician of genius. Prince Andrei is astonished by what he sees at this battle. Nowhere does he discern traces of a strategic plan being carefully realized in the action of the battle. The intent of the presiding general seems to be everywhere thwarted or ignored or transformed by chance. Of these generals, Bagration is extraordinary. He does not direct the battle, nor does he lead in any conventional way. To the contrary, he acts as if he were directing and leading it, and his soldiers are encouraged by this semblance of authority. That is, Bagration's soldiers depend on his meeting certain expectations of authority, which reflect their own assumptions about the capacity of the individual to do something to change the battle. If one, however, takes the narrator's consideration of the frailty of historical accounts seriously, these expectations are not only false, but ridiculous as well. There is, however, abundant evidence that the novel presents another positive argument, which hints at the peculiar narrative characteristics of the novel itself. We attain a calculus of history in order 
to grasp historical events more fully. One may argue that War and Peace as a novel is exactly this weaving together of various patterns of motions, cliches, or myths that aim to reveal not the causes for events, but the laws that govern them. And I think that's very insightful because Tolstoy goes out of his way to show on the one hand that for each event, each historical event, there are causes that lead up to it, determined causes. But he wants to show that it's so complex, we can't really point to what those causes are. And so as Jeff Love points out, really the more important element of what Tolstoy is doing is trying to get at the laws of this historical calculus. The utmost refinement of the apparent enmity of freedom and law. They are opposites that attract, neither having sense without the other. Moreover, freedom is not nothing. It is an infinite plenitude to which reason attempts to give articulate form, though it cannot succeed in doing so finally or completely. Thus, the inevitability of the unknowable, the free. This is the basis for their mutual dependence. Whatever escapes form remains as content, pure inexhaustibility. Thus, since reason and consciousness are mutually dependent, their relation does not and cannot collapse. Indeed, the tension that pulls them together, an attraction of opposites, creates a dynamism that is central to history and to narratives of history as well. We are both tempted to know and repelled by the limitations knowledge places on freedom. That is such a beautifully wrought passage. There's a lot of overlap with other anthologies of essays on Tolstoy and War and Peace in this one, edited by Malcolm Jones called New Essays on Tolstoy, which of course new is sort of anachronistic now. But one of the early essays is by Henry Gifford and it's about translating Tolstoy. And he basically compares Robert Bridges, The Mods, Constant Garnett, and Rosemary Edmonds across a sampling of Tolstoy's work. And he proves by literal rendering. And so it's really of interest to me as someone who did meager comparisons and investigations without you know, recourse to the original Russian to figure out which translation to go with. And even though this one is written at a time when it can't take the Pavir and Polakonsky or the Briggs translation into consideration, it still was really insightful into Tolstoy's writing. And in fact, he proved to me by these literal renderings into English how interesting Tolstoy's syntax really is in the original Russian. Makes me almost want a literal English translation, even though it would read very clunkily to the masses. He uses Matthew Arnold's On Translating Homer as a sort of guide through this essay. And he quotes Arnold where he says, the simplest frame of mind possible, meaning we need to come to the translation of Tolstoy with the simplest frame of mind possible. But in this essay, we're told that that will be complicated by an awareness that the English reader has formed certain expectations based on what he regards as the appropriate idiom for a modern novel. If Tolstoy seems to him outlandish or pedantic, he will feel lit down by the translator. And I mean, it's a pretty simple, straightforward thought, but I've never really taken time to think about how with a figure like Tolstoy and someone such as myself at 38 years old, coming to War and Peace for the first time in 2022, all of my different expectations, however conscious or unconscious. Gifford does say that the Norton Critical Editions of War and Peace and Anna Karenina did well to use the mod rendering. It is the soundest we have, again, at the time of writing, which is probably in the 70s or 80s. And Tolstoy himself admired their work. About Constant Garnett, though, she has been much praised as a translator in one respect immoderately so. It is now well understood that her Russian was not dependable. The appeal of Constant Garnett, however, consists in her sensibility. She can write with the delicacy of touch which the mods, for all their diligence and good sense, seldom achieve. So I like these nuanced contrasts that we get here. Constance Garnett may also be commended for her refusal to tamper with Tolstoy's syntax. She had an ear for the cadencing of prose to the same degree as Bridges. 
but she would accept the angularities in Tolstoy and not shrink from his repetitions. That right there has made me think that I might read War and Peace in the Garnett translation next. Aylmer Maud and his wife were qualified in everything except a creative sense of language to make the ideal translation. They had long lived in Russia. Louise Maud was born there. They knew Tolstoy intimately, and Aylmer Maud understood and appraised with an independent mind the ideas and aims of Tolstoy. They have little sense of colloquial idiom, however, and certainly not the inventiveness to match the elliptical and wary speech of the Russian peasant. Of Edmunds, the dialogue in particular is much more convincing than that contrived by the Mods. Tolstoy himself was an indefatigable reviser, always prone to jettison whole sentences in proof. Ideally, his translator should approach the text with a similar resolve to make every word justify its presence. Miss Edmonds is sometimes lax about detail. And we're given an example of the fact that hands are expressive for Tolstoy. So are lips. The first thing that a translator should note is Tolstoy's lifelong preoccupation with different kinds of rhetoric. R.F. Christian claims that he used in War and Peace every device of arrangement and balance known to Cicero and Demosthenes, and shows, for example, how he would set his clauses in groups of three. How interesting. His peculiar syntax. More than most writers of prose fiction, Tolstoy would ignore the conventional order of words for the sake of registering his impressions more faithfully. For example, Tolstoy will delay the appearance of a noun by a cluster of adjectives or by participial clauses. The priorities of Tolstoy's syntax in any sentence, its weight, speed, and where possible its rhythm, all need to be reproduced if you're doing a translation. And sufficient to itself, as a particular scene may be, the translator must never forget the linkages to other scenes in the novel, which has been constructed with an internal organization so close and so richly ramified as to deserve the name Shakespearean. And of course, parenthetically, we add, Gifford adds, though Tolstoy would doubtless not have cared for it, meaning to be compared with Shakespeare. Long ago, Maurice Baring observed, there is perhaps nothing so difficult in the world to translate as stories dealing with Russian peasants. The answer for us today cannot lie in the use of a dialect, meaning in English we can't fall back on a dialect, really. But the translator should at least try for an English that is the genuine mother tongue, not an uneasily assumed demotic. Russian peasant speech is of a kind to stir up the sense of potentialities in our own language. With persistence and a little daring, the appropriate idi idiom could even now be devised. D. H. Lawrence, about this time, praised Tolstoy for his marvelous, sensuous understanding. Louise Maud has blurred or omitted a few details, which in these moments of high tension are all significant. Rosemary Edmonds avoids all these mistakes, but she cannot bring herself to accept the flatness of Tolstoy's expression. And we close the essay with this. Both Louise Maud and Rosemary Edmonds fall back, not unworthily, on a translation that goes, it happens to everybody. Everybody does it. And Gifford tells us, the four simple Russian words are characteristic of Tolstoy and his passion for the essential. The note of determinism, as so often with him, is to be heard. They are also characteristic of the Russian language, which like our own has its inimitable brevities. It is in such small but crucial points that the translator meets his supreme challenge. And unless he can snatch a grace beyond the reach of art, he will inevitably be defeated. The last critical or scholarly text that I read about War and Peace or about Tolstoy was George R. Clay's Tolstoy's Phoenix, Meaning and Method in War and Peace. I can't remember who recommended this to me, but it was either on Goodreads or Instagram or somewhere somebody recommended this to me because I hadn't discovered it on my own. And I just want to thank you so much. It's very slim. It's about 120 pages. 
And it's not really written in an academic or a scholarly mode. It's written by George R. Clay, who is a fiction writer, a reviewer, he's had work published in The New Yorker, and so on. So you get more of that mode. He's writing for a wider, more general, popular audience. However, he does go deep in two modes that could be considered literary theory or literary criticism, those two modes being textual analysis. So the first part of it digs into textual analysis in a very interesting and illuminating way. And then he goes into psychoanalytic literary theory and applies that to the principal characters and some of the secondary characters in War and Peace. Overall, I was very impressed by this book and I'm glad that I did get this onto my plate. He says early on in the book that his target audience is writers and maybe readers who want to go a little bit deeper. But I thought it interesting that this was targeted at fiction writers, especially as it's published by Northwestern University Press. And he talks a little bit about the evolution of how this work came together. But what I think works for this so well is the fact that George R. Clay is clearly very enamored by Tolstoy and especially War and Peace. He obviously loves reading the book, loves the book, and that really comes through and makes the text addictive. But as a writer, he's breaking down Tolstoy's methods in War and Peace for other writers. So this is a really interesting slant on Tolstoy criticism. A couple of notes, he mostly uses the mod translation he knits together a veritable treasury of material on or about or indirectly about Tolstoy and War and Peace. In the midst of opposing schools of thought as to whether or not War and Peace has a unifying theme or is just this patchwork of disparate parts, Clay asserts that the book has a phoenix design of death and resurrection, and he develops this so well and shows how at the micro and macro scales Tolstoy is using this phoenix, the mythological creature that represents death and rebirth, over and over and over. From my point of view, he has three key assertions that stood out to me. One is narrative mobility, the oscillation between perspectives in War and Peace. And you can see that that narrative or perspective Mobility is of utmost importance to Tolstoy. Also, all the main protagonists come to understand the indivisibility of opposites, like sorrow and joy, war and peace, and so on. And then finally, each character has a hubris, a unique hubris that Tolstoy uses as the linchpin for his phoenix design for each person. Even when I read stuff that I thought, well, that's kind of obvious, the way in which Clay articulates it and puts a vocabulary or, or a small lexicon around it was really a delight and gave me a new way to see and appreciate the book. It opens up with this brilliant textual analysis where he's looking at sentences and phrases within sentence, sentences that are keys to Tolstoy's method of how in War and Peace he created such a lifelike novel. The trick here is that he doesn't particularize. He generalizes in a way that makes us do the particularizing for him. And it's brilliant how he shows us by various sentences and these phrases that Tolstoy employs to put himself sort of at distance from the character and generalizes in such a way to where he prompts us to do the particularizing for that person. And he does this across such an array of different characters and different situations that, as Clay points out, this gives us a cross-section that covers most of humanity, hence the universal appeal of the work. By inserting his categorizing phrase, Tolstoy sacrifices some of the directness, or therefore intensity, with which we identify, but he gains a specific perspective. In effect, gently detaching his character's behavior and placing it in a broader context. A context wide enough to include the reader along with everyone else in this 
particular situation. The viewpoints that he gives are neither quite inside nor quite outside his character's psyche. It is, so to speak, on the threshold, a position that Tolstoy achieves by balancing immediacy with overview. And I think in my commentary while I was reading the book, I said something about how Tolstoy does this thing where he zooms in on different characters and then pans back out. And this is put, I think this is what I was getting at, is he zooms in, but he doesn't go all the way in. And this is really well put that there's this threshold between particularity or being inside the character and outside the character that Tolstoy has mastered sort of balancing and hovering on that threshold so that it constantly keeps us ready to move from one perspective to another, hence what I said about mobility or narrative mobility being of utmost importance, but also allows these sort of promptings to the reader that makes us recognize situations and things about the character that we can connect with our own personal memories. In the same sentence, we are inside Natasha's psyche, feeling with her, outside, noting what she wears, then up above, understanding why she walks the way she does, and from that understanding, generalizing about the paradoxical nature of all women. So this is about a very specific passage. But nonetheless, what Clay is showing is that furthermore, we get all these different positionings. It's not just on that threshold. We can sometimes, he even showed we're in a, the same sentence somewhere or a paragraph somewhere. We get six different characters, perspectives and take on one other character's action. I like this. Clay refers to it as a double exposure. And he says to achieve this double exposure, Tolstoy positions us almost simultaneously inside and outside his character. He says that, as already mentioned, from that position, he can shift more easily from one character's viewpoint to another's, thereby increasing his opportunities to tell while showing and to show while telling. And I made a little note that says, I noticed this often when I was reading War and Peace, but it never irked me. And what I meant by that is that there were times when I felt like Tolstoy was breaking that rule that we all have, you know, show, don't tell. Yet then he would tell and not show and show and not tell, sort of, you know, vacillating between the two. And it was done in such a way to where it never did irk me. It drew me into the story and the character even more. While adding his own explanation for Natasha's pause, he renders it dramatic by fusing no less than three viewpoints. Natasha is the one who, while pausing, asks herself whether she might kiss Andrew. Prince Andrew sees her pause as if that is indeed what she is asking herself. We, the readers, see her pause, him watching her pause, and get not a double, but a triple image. The third being whatever associations we may bring to the transaction. Owing to Tolstoy's composite viewpoint, or in this case, a triple exposure, subjective intensity has been exchanged for transactional intensity. I love that because all that Clay is showing is summed up in that. Tolstoy chooses to make things less intense by getting more into the character's head. But what he gains from that is a closer and richer transaction between reader and writer. Clay goes on to talk about Tolstoy's perpetual present. He says that Tolstoyan time, like nature's, does not run out. It runs on. It is not tied to a particular hero or heroine's destiny, but to the cycle of generations. He decided to keep his narrative open-ended and to portray a representative generation flanked by the parents they are replacing and the children who will replace them. Thus, he is constructing a universal era unfolding within a perpetual present. And then he goes on to talk of how Tolstoy implements description. It is not that Tolstoy neglects to describe the clothing, buildings, or landscape which we need to visualize, but he doesn't describe them for their own sake, merely to create an atmosphere or to decorate the Napoleonic era. 
Nothing is isolated. If a pair of Natasha's shoes is mentioned, it is not to tell us what young ladies of style wore during the Empire period, but because the shoes are Natasha's favorite pair, and she has worn them in her determination not to care that Prince Andrew seems to have forgotten she exists. And so this is contra the usual trappings we would expect in a historical novel. External aspects are just what he would have us ignore, responding instead to the sensuous details, such as in this passage Clay is using as an exemplar where it has tap and creak, and to the timeless responses that lend immediacy, prevent contemplation, and fuse past to present by releasing our own memories. So again, Tolstoy's method is calibrated such that he will fire our own memories, and thus the whole reading experience will be transactional. War and Peace spans historical eras in part by sticking to issues and conflicts that are psychological, or perhaps moral, but not social. They are rooted most often in family life, a context so basic that it is familiar to virtually every reader. Tolstoy's rejection of plotted adventures with climactic endings frees him from the clearly defined characterizations required by such endings, allowing him to portray his protagonists with the dynamic ambiguity that he apparently felt was necessary to truthfulness. Tolstoy makes sure that we meet them as we meet people in real life, knowing hardly anything about their past, noting only their most obvious features, and sensing what other people think of them. This gets at uh, other places where I've read and talked about how War and Peace lacks that usual exposition and backstory for characters. And so like Clay is saying, that's just another element of Tolstoy's incredible verisimilitude by letting us come to characters the same way we would come to a person in real life. And then Clay moves into his idea of the phoenix, the mythical creature representing death and regeneration, death and rebirth, as being the thread that holds everything together in War and Peace, or as he calls it in his chapter title, a string for his pearls. So we not only have key designs for both stories, of war and of peace, but they are the same. With admirable economy, the historical phoenix pattern of the invaded Russian people's fall and rise is enacted within the biological phoenix cycle of the defending generation's rise and gradual decline as its parents die off and its children begin, in turn, their natural succession. Furthermore, Clay says that Tolstoy renders endless variations of the phoenix pattern as he puts each of his protagonists through a series of mock deaths and resurrections. Each death, physical or spiritual, real or symbolic, leads to a rebirth bearing seeds of the next death. And what he's doing here is he's setting up for what he's going to call, and others have called, Tolstoy's integrative design, where all the opposites are in fact integrated and in a symbiotic relationship, especially life and death or war and peace. That's why it's called war and peace, not war or peace. Then we get into the different character studies. He surveys the five main protagonists and presents that hubris that is the linchpin for their phoenix death and rebirth. Pierre's hubris is in assuming that the problem of evil can be solved. Natasha's, at least when we first meet her, is her assumption that no such problem exists, that at any given moment the world will conform to her wishes, that since joy and sorrow do not go together, you may choose between them. But Pierre's hubris has little to do with particular individuals. It is based on his conviction that, since good can be separated from evil, he might discover a program that could defeat the sinner within each of us thereby eventually achieving peace and harmony everywhere. That sounds very much like what Tolstoy was after in his own life. Nothing is ever completely lost. Everything is somehow integrated. The worst that can happen is, and should be, converted into new life. This is a great formulation of the ultimate lesson that Tolstoy wants each of his characters to learn. But to Tolstoy, wisdom is not something acquired suddenly, not a formula figured out once and for all. 
or even an epiphany. It is a creative approach to change. I love that. Tolstoyan wisdom or Tolstoy's conception of wisdom is a creative approach to change. Princess Maria's hubris lies precisely in her pious but silently arrogant assumption that she knows what God is up to, that she is privy to his modus operandi. With Prince Andrew, he is the only one of the five who doesn't learn from his hubris. An individual's failure to develop from folly toward wisdom despite all his opportunities and his efforts to make something of them. This is what Prince Andrew or Prince Andre Bolkonsky learns or doesn't learn. Instead of accepting the fact that nothing lasts and considering it an essential postulate of life, Prince Andre feels defeated by it and turns increasingly toward withdrawal and death as a relief from anxiety and impotence. This, if for nothing else, the five character studies. Well, no, the whole book is great. I highly recommend this. Of all the biographies that I had to choose from, I decided to go with the biography by A.N. Wilson and the more recent biography from Rosamund Bartlett. So I'll start with all of my reading notes from the A.N. Wilson. Rosamund Bartlett's biography has a subtitle that lets us know sort of the unifying theme of her project, and that subtitle is A Russian Life. A.N. Wilson's just has a biography, but if I had to give it a subtitle, it would be Tolstoy, subtitle, The Outsider. It's very illuminating to get a chronology of Tolstoy's life and to get so many details filled in. And I can tell you that as I was reading this, and it's a very smooth, engaging read for a biography, the picture that I had of Tolstoy changed over and over and over and over again. Wilson comments on the project of his book. This book is primarily the story of a novelist, but not of a novelist whose works are self-contained. Rather, it is the history of a great genius whose art grew out of his three uneasy and irresolvable relationships. His relationship with God, his relationship with women, and his relationship with Russia. In all cases, the relationships were stormy, full of contradictions. They were love-hate relationships, and the hate was sometimes rather hard to distinguish from the love. The way that I went about marking up this book and annotating it is in these categories. History, so historical context. Tolstoy the man, which I used red flags for. Tolstoy the reader, which I used green flags for. Tolstoy the writer. Anna Karenina specifically, which I'm not going to go over those since this is a video about War and Peace, but these will be notes for a future video. War and Peace. So let's start with Tolstoy the man. He was born into the very highest social rank. To be a free man in a country where everyone else is in bondage conveys a strange unreality of status. When he died, there were demonstrations all over Russia. Students rioted. Anarchists were rounded up by the police. Thousands of people followed his coffin to its burial place. The life of this author is full of contradictions and puzzles. The paradoxes of Tolstoy are numberless. For instance, this most Russian of novelists was almost entirely influenced not by Russians, but by English and French writers. His vision of Christianity owes much more to American Quakers and French rationalists than it does to Russian Orthodox spirituality. And yet, he believed himself to be speaking, for much of the time, with the authentic voice of the Russian peasant. The great prophet of peace lived in an atmosphere of domestic hatred, perhaps unrivaled in the history of matrimony. And yet, for all these contradictions and paradoxes, the sheer stature of Tolstoy is never diminished. He lost his mother when he was barely two. He could never remember her face, and no portrait of her survives. Both facts are of profound significance in the story of Tolstoy's inner life. The Volkonskys were an ancient family who traced their grand descent Back to Prince Ryurik, they considered themselves grander than the Romanovs. In Tolstoy, consciousness itself was overdeveloped. 
In a non-words-worthian sense, the world was too much with him. The way for all men to cease suffering from any misfortune, to leave off quarreling and being angry, and become continuously happy, this secret he said he had written on a green stick buried by the road at the edge of a certain ravine, at which spot, since my body must be buried somewhere, I have asked to be buried in memory of Nikolenka, his brother. Tolstoy's recollections of his father are full of admiration and affection. He recalls his handsomeness, his frock coat and narrow trousers, or, in the country, his exuberance on the hunting field. But like all aristocratic children of the period, they saw very little of their father. It was the fourth major death in Tolstoy's first 13 years of life, that of his aunt Alexandra. And in terms of his destiny over the next six years, it was the most crucial. The losses of his parents and his grandmother were incalculable, but the loss of his mildly mad aunt Alexandra actually displaced him, his brothers, and his sister. It uprooted them from the familiar scenes of Yasnaya Polyana and Moscow, and it wrenched them away from the one person for whom they all felt the warmest affection, for their aunt Tatiana was in fact only a very distant relative, and she had no legal right over the children yet they would be taken in by her nonetheless. His adolescence was rendered an agony by shyness and by the sense that his thick nose and springy hair made him hideously unattractive to girls. Three years of sleeping with prostitutes left Tolstoy infected with gonorrhea. A VD clinic is a better place than most to form feelings of hatred for one's own body. Inside the house was the green leather sofa where Tolstoy himself was born and where, often at great pain and inconvenience to his wife, he insisted that so many of his children should be brought to birth. This is Tolstoy writing. By some strange chance, no portrait of her, my mother, has been preserved, so that as a real physical being, I cannot picture her to myself. I am in a way glad of this, for in my conception of her, there is only her spiritual figure, and all that I know about her is beautiful. At no stage, really, can one place Tolstoy on any political spectrum, any more than you could fit him into any of the circles of literary movements of his day, or pigeonhole him as a Westerner, or a Westernizer, or a Slavophile. This, then, was the climate in which Tolstoy was growing up, a renaissance such as had never been seen in Russia before, and a system of censorship which vigorously suppressed any signs of independent life among poets, journalist, and novelist. Of all the Russian writers in the last century, he is the one who fits least easily into any intellectual circle or political category. And A.N. Wilson sums up, again, the theme that makes me think that the subtitle should have been The Outsider with this short sentence. From the beginning, he is alone. The next day, he was, by his own confession, stupid and callous enough to go and witness a public execution by guillotine. It was an experience paralleled by Dostoevsky's idiot, Prince Mishkin, Mishkin, who also saw a beheading in France. When Tolstoy returned to finish his letter to Botkin, he had to admit that his whole mood had changed. I've seen many horrible things in war and in the Caucasus, but if a man had been torn to pieces before my eyes, it wouldn't have been so revolting as this ingenious and elegant machine by means of which a strong, hale, and hearty man was killed in an instant. The disgustingness of the guillotine remained for Tolstoy one of the most vivid and life-changing experiences. There is a tendency to think of Tolstoy's desire to live like a peasant as a feature of his middle and later years, a manifestation of his religious post-literary self. But it was always there, and in the years immediately following his return from abroad, this Rousseau-esque identification with the peasants was very strong, and that was uh, around 32 years old. Tolstoy, for all his posturings, was actually on the side of the peasants whom he knew and who he loved. He wanted them to be free. He recounts the very famous anecdote about how when Turgenev proudly produced the newly completed manuscript of his novel, Fathers and Children, he left and then returned back to the drawing room to see what Tolstoy was making of it, and Tolstoy was sound asleep. Thus, just one moment in a very contentious relationship between the two. Tolstoy immediately ordered pistols and sent a second letter announcing that he challenged Turgenev to a duel. 
It is a frightening thought that if Tolstoy had been having this quarrel with Dostoevsky, they would almost certainly have met for this duel, killed one another, and deprived the world of the two greatest novelists of the 19th century. This is one thing that I really liked about A. N. Wilson, is he's not afraid of conjecture or opinion, which really adds a lot of color to the text, while at the same time the scholar in him is clarifying the fact that this is his opinion. They were not even sufficiently well acquainted to know whether they liked one another. This is the young Sophia Bears and Tolstoy. Probably they never did, meaning they never did like one another. He found her strange and fascinating. She found him monstrous and frightening. There was a strong sexual attraction between them. On this basis, they prepared to enter upon one of the most closely documented and one of the most miserable marriages in history. This is because they each kept diaries where they would just pour out everything, no holds barred. And furthermore, from the beginning, they let each other read their diaries. Whew. It was something which bound them together very deeply, this reading of the diaries, even when they felt hatred and dread of one another. She, Sofia, was his reader, and of course much more than that. Tolstoy was plagued all his life by a thoroughgoing skepticism, which amounted to an incapacitating disease. By skepticism here, we are not talking just about a Voltairean view of God or the universe, but a capacity to question the point of doing or feeling anything. It begins with Schopenhauerian, Schopenhauerian pessimism. It can lead in the end to a sort of Hindu detachment. Tolstoy had an extraordinary capacity for learning languages. To his French, German, English, rudimentary Latin, Turkish, and Arabic, with smatterings of Georgian picked up in the Caucasus, he now added ancient Greek. He began with Aesop and Xenophon. Soon he was reading Herodotus and Homer. After only three months of learning the language, he claimed to have mastered a working knowledge of it. Then there's this anecdote about an actual Greek professor who sort of challenged this notion that it, you know, he mastered it after three months. And turns out he pretty much had. Tolstoy, whose nihilism went deeper than Dostoevsky's, and whose egotism was more self-protective. Those who draw an immediate correlation between the suicide of Pirogova and that of Tolstoy's fictional heroine sometimes fail to notice that in the neighbor's suicide there was a motive. In the novel, there is none. Film versions and Precy always try to provide Anna with reasons. This is post-Anna Karenina. Turgenev's novels revel the liberal humanist's ability to recognize life's mystery for what it is and not to worry at it. He, Turgenev, was no metaphysician. For Tolstoy, such questions as why we are here, what is the point of living, is there a god, what is the good, were of consuming importance. He had, during this summer, become obsessed by them. This is around the time that we're transitioning into that post-literary life of Tolstoy's, where he turns away from creative writing and turns to these tractates and brochures, pamphlets and essays, and Turgenev will implore him to please put all that nonsense aside and get back to what he's so good at. He began to read the Gospels deeply and attentively, and this reading had a revolutionary effect upon his life. The progress from artist to sage or holy man, which to Western readers seems embarrassing or a bit of a bore, is a fairly common phenomenon among Russian writers. Leskov did it. Gogol did it. In his own fashion, Dostoevsky get it, did it. We have the contemporary example of Solzhenitsyn. Only by an early death, it seems, such as blessed the careers of Pushkin and Lermontov, can the great Russian writer escape the desire to become a prophet. Tolstoy's life follows this pattern, but, as we should expect, to an exaggerated degree. So exaggerated that it is very hard not to think of his life as falling into two distinct halves, divided by the publication of Anna Karenina. After Anna Karenina, there are no great novels. There were to be many magnificent novellas and short stories from his pen over the next 30 years, and one large work of fiction, Resurrection. 
It was when he realized that being orthodox was incompatible with true Christianity, that he felt a true peace, and he resolved to practice the five great commandments given by Christ in his Sermon on the Mount. The whole bent of Tolstoy's mind is now towards making things clear and simple. The New Testament, however, is neither clear nor simple. It is not really possible to approach it in the way that Tolstoy approached it because it does not yield answers so easily. A scholar might suppose that there is simply a lack of evidence. After 150 years of critical analysis on the Gospels, no one has been able to prove even, even such simple questions as when or where they were written. It is as if they are in fact placed in a unique position, as if their hiddenness and mystery eluded modern scientific analysis. While all these thoughts were brewing, two deaths occurred which were of utmost significance in Tolstoy's life. Dostoevsky's and the Tsars. Dostoevsky died on January 28, 1881, lying on his sofa with the copy of the New Testament which had been given to him by wives of the Decembrists 30 years before when he had been on his way to the prison at Omsk. When Tolstoy heard of the news of Dostoevsky's death, he wrote, I never saw the man and never had any direct relations with him. And suddenly when he died, I realized that he was the very closest, dearest, and most necessary man for me. I was a writer, and all writers are vain and envious. I, at least, was that sort of writer. But it never occurred to me to measure myself against him. Never. We move into the time when people are actually becoming Tolstoyan pilgrims and showing up at his door. The reaction of Tolstoy's wife to the matter was one of simple outrage. She hated the anarchists some of whom had started to write to Tolstoy, even to visit him and hang on his words. She felt a perfectly natural fear that the government would associate Tolstoy with the murderers and revolutionaries, and that this would inevitably bring trouble to the family. All Tolstoy's instincts were repelled by the industrialization of Russia. He shared with John Ruskin and Henry David Thoreau a vision of human life itself being destroyed by the smoke, the noise, the squalor. The old Tolstoy who loved his wife and wrote novels was now a shadowy figure, glimpsed only occasionally. Tolstoy's wife was not the only one to mourn him. The readers of War and Peace and Anna Karenina were waiting in vain for another novel from the great writer's pen. No one was more generous in his mourning than Tolstoy's fellow novelist, Turgenev, whose last letter in the summer of 1883 was an urgent plea to Tolstoy not to abandon art. But... As time grew on and Tolstoy went further and further down this ascetic path, religious seekers, social malcontents, pilgrims and beggars all beat a path to Tolstoy's door. The Tolstoys were quarreling a lot. Tempers were not improved by Tolstoy's successful attempts during the summer of 1884 to abandon one of his greatest passions, smoking tobacco. By this stage, he was also beginning to think that he should give up alcohol and become a vegetarian. Simplicity and humility were now thunderously insisted upon. He was still the owner of vast estates in Samara, and as yet he still received his considerable literary royalties. Such inconsistencies were a source of moral torment to Tolstoy himself, who did genuinely desire to escape it all. For his wife, they were a crazy aberration, and with 11 children and a 12th on the way, it was terrifying that her husband should take this view of money and possessions. The more Tolstoy attempted to imitate Christ, the more violent the atmosphere in their home became. In the 1880s, he had two factors that were really driving him, evangelical simplicity and a deepening misanthropy. The two things came together in his emerging sense that the highest call which could be followed by a human being was one of total celibacy, whether married or not. Although, as we find out, mostly from Sophia's diary, he wasn't celibate with her at all. He preached one thing and constantly contradicted it with his actual behavior. But this is where A.N. Wilson, the level-headed scholar and authority, steps in. And I love this statement he makes. The gap between Tolstoy's ideals and his actual behavior have made those who do not want to understand him dub him as a hypocrite. But a hypocrite is a man who pretends that such gaps do not exist. In Tolstoy, there was no such pretense. 
And this is exactly why we need biographers and critical scholars such as Ann Wilson, Rosamund Bartlett, and so on, is because they actually want to try and unravel all these contradictions, this tangled web, and understand a person. By July 1892, he had set up 246 kitchens. This is during the big famine that was going on in Russia. Feeding 13,000 people daily and 124 special children's kitchens, feeding 3,000 daily. He had personally raised 141,000 rubles for the relief of the poor, which included half a million dollars from America and a quite independent donation from the English Quakers of 26,000 pounds. So despite what we ever think about Tolstoy, he really did so much for the Russian people and really truly in his heart desired to help the poor. In passing, Wilson says that he was always on the lookout for a good game of chess like most Russian men. It was a common joke that there were two czars at the time in Russia, Nicholas II and Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy. Eight years after Tolstoy died, his wife was heard to remark, I lived with Lev Nikolaevich for 48 years, but I never really learned what kind of man he was. Like many of her comments, it is an extremely intelligent one. The more evidence we possess about Tolstoy, the less he makes sense. No doubt, had he made any sort of sense to himself, he would never have become the incomparable artist he was. And I love that because what Ann Wilson is getting at is that the great art often comes out of this internal tension and struggle. As he was dying, one of the sentences which he muttered was, search, always go on searching. In spite of the fact that Andrei Tolstoy had pleaded with the Bishop of Tula to allow them a full Orthodox funeral, permission for this was forbidden by the church authorities. Tolstoy's was therefore the first public burial in Russia since the conversion of St. Vladimir, which was not attended by the rites of the church. And in fact, he is still officially excommunicated from the Russian Orthodox Church to this day. And now let's talk about Tolstoy the reader. His favorite Bible story was that of Joseph and his brethren. He began to read Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a writer who, if this title belongs to anyone, was the greatest single influence on the development of Tolstoy's thought. And that will be challenged and clarified a little bit in the magnificent essay from Isaiah of Berlin that I'll go over at the end of this video. Tolstoy read A Sentimental Journey, that by Lawrence Stern, initially in French, but he was so bowled over by it he called it an immense influence, that he soon set to work to improve his English by translating it from the original into Russian. This was a purely private enterprise. We do have incontrovertible evidence that a sentimental journey was what started Tolstoy off as a writer. He also was reading Dickens's Dombey and Son. In later years, he would come to say that Dickens was his favorite author and David Copperfield his favorite book. During this period, he read, among other things, Uncle Tom's Cabin. He read voraciously Dickens, Lermontov, Goethe, Bleak House, Uncle Tom's Cabin again, Henry Esmond, Schiller's Die Rauber, George Song, Balzac. He read Stendhal's The Charter House of Parma. On March 14th, he went to St. James's Hall in Piccadilly and heard one of Dickens's famous readings from A Christmas Carol. A portrait of the great novelist was always to hang in Tolstoy's study at Yasnaya Polyana. He read and reread Dickens. As an old man, he was to say, Dickens interests me more and more. He spent the summer of 1869 reading the lugubrious philosophical writings of Schopenhauer. I'm certain, he told Fett, that Schopenhauer is the most brilliant of men. We've found out from Sophia's diaries that Tolstoy's method of limbering up before writing fiction of his own was to read an English novel. That is, she knew he was about to start writing some fiction when he would suddenly throw himself headlong into Dickens or Stern, or deep in some favorite trollop, meaning, <laughs> meaning deep inside one of uh, Anthony Trollope's books. He is known to have read The Prime Minister with fascination. Though Tolstoy was temperamentally incapable of reading Dostoevsky's novels and claimed that he had been unable to finish The Brothers Karamazov, he cannot have been unaware of the book's religious substance. 
Again, of the Dickens books, Felix Holt was a particular favorite of Tolstoy's. In a letter he wrote to Chertkoff, who was responsible for a lot of the publication of Tolstoy's writings and came into major conflict with what Tolstoy's wife Sophia was trying to do in getting his complete works published to make money for the family. In any case, he wrote to Chertkoff some months after he had finished, What Then Must We Do? Tolstoy revealed that he had just finished reading Stevens's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and found it very good. And Wilson, of course, is going to draw a parallel here between the split personality in the Stevenson and that in Tolstoy. Maupassant or Dostoevsky? Two authors much on Tolstoy's mind at this time. This is in the sort of late 1880s. Now let's take a look at Tolstoy the writer. Turgenev knew that behind the exercise of fiction, there lies the simple childhood desire to pretend. Tolstoy saw it too in Turgenev and hated the older man's political radicalism. One good way of getting any group of literary men on the raw is to say that you do not see any merit in Shakespeare. Tolstoy would spend many years of his life trying to persuade people that Shakespeare was no good, that Jesus wasn't a Christian, that folk songs were better than Beethoven, and that property is theft. In other words, preaching the important gospel that bronchitis is a metal. And that quote from Tolstoy saying, don't you know bronchitis is a metal, is sort of this faux zen cone that A.N. Wilson believes Tolstoy would use to make himself seem higher-minded and more enlightened than other people, especially other writers. He was always an obsessive corrector and reviser, but it was only after Sophia came into his life that the evidence was kept. They never met Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Instead, like two great monsters, they sniff and pace the ground and never come into contact. It is a great imaginative recasting of the New Testament material. Tolstoy could not approach the Gospels without a compulsion to rewrite them. Though his name was famous abroad, War and Peace and Anna Karenina were barely known in the West. It was through his religious tracts that, for thousands of English readers, Tolstoy burst upon the world. That's interesting to realize, and just another testament to why reading these biographies is so key is, you know, I never realized that, that in the English-speaking world, we came to know the post-literary Tolstoy first. And that goes a long way towards explaining some of my preconceived notions of Tolstoy going into this whole thing. While there are probably more people in the world today than there ever before, than ever before who sympathize in broad outline with Tolstoy's ardent pacifism, with his suspicion of alcohol and tobacco, even with his vegetarianism, there are also probably fewer than ever before who are able to stomach his views about sex. It is this non-literary fact, it is this non-literary fact which probably explains why, why almost everybody misunderstands the masterpiece of his penultimate period, the Kreutzer Sonata. It is against a background of such stories that Tolstoy's religious and political ideas must be seen. A modern Western reader who picks up, say, the kingdom of God is within you, might be forgiven for thinking that its ideas are crazy. But its assaults are not upon the Orthodox Church of today, neutered in some quarters and made a vassal of an atheist state, purged and chastened in other areas by persecution. Rather, Tolstoy was attacking the cruel and powerful instrument of a spiritual of a spiritual despotism. When the word government is synonymous with barbarism, it is understandable why Tolstoy thought it morally imperative to be an anarchist and to write about it. Chekhov saw in Tolstoy a great moral force for good, as well as the greatest of Russian writers. Tolstoy, too, profoundly admired Chekhov's fiction and had copied the story Darling into his daily breviary, The Circle of Reading. After Anna Karenina, Tolstoy apostatized from his view that novels should make us laugh and cry and present us with the illusion of living characters. Instead, he espoused the dreary and narrowing view that an artist's function was to tell the world how it should behave. In Shakespeare, who is the archetypal artist, the man who buries himself in the passions and sympathies of his created characters, Tolstoy met his greatest reproach, the most blatant possible reminder of what he had given up, when, after Anna Karenina, 
he turned to writing works of half-baked religious thought. And now let's take a look at some things that are relevant to War and Peace. In Anna Karenina, he wrote one of the great love stories of the world. But in War and Peace, there was something much grander. Nikolai Rostov's stupidity over gambling in War and Peace was nothing to Tolstoy's. He, Tolstoy, was compelled to go on playing until he had lost his birthright, the very house where he was born. The big house at Yasnaya Polyana was sold and transferred to another site to pay off all these card debts. This is C.S. Lewis on War and Peace. I thought that the strong narrative lust, the passionate itch to see what happened in the end, which novels aroused necessarily, inured the taste for other, better, but less irresistible forms of literary pleasure. Tolstoy, in this book, has changed all that. I have felt everywhere that sublime indifference to the life or death, success or failure of the chief characters, which is not a blank indifference at all, but almost like submission to the will of God. And then A. N. Wilson comments, it is this sublime indifference, a Homeric quality, which was given to Tolstoy both on the field of battle and, much more interestingly, when he had a pen in his hand. When Tolstoy said that War and Peace was not a novel, he was warning readers not merely to lap it up in the same spirit in which they might read installments of David Copperfield or Crime and Punishment. This is not a matter of authorial self-conceit. The degree to which that was or was not felt is an irrelevance here. Tolstoy knew just as Dante and Shakespeare must have known in their day, that he had produced a masterpiece which it would be completely unhelpful to compare with an ordinary serial novel. But whereas we can only conjecture about the growth of Shakespeare's mind, in Tolstoy, the process of alchemy is transparent. Almost every particle of War and Peace bears a relation to something in Tolstoy's personal experience. There is in the whole book hardly an incident, conversation, or character which the commentators are not able to tell us is autobiographical. And in those passages, which are not autobiographical in this sense, there is a conspicuous flatness. I think of Pierre's initiation into the Freemasons, which Tolstoy, not a Mason himself, worked up out of books. It shows. Her brother, Stepan, calculated that by the time the book was finished, Tolstoy's wife had written out the equivalent of seven fair copies of the whole work. Nor was she a mere copyist, for at every stage, after his return from convalescing in Moscow during 1864, she advised and commented upon the work, giving intelligent reflections not only upon the content, but also its manner of presentation and publication. Ian Wilson goes so far as to say it is improbable whether, without his wife's help and guidance, the work would ever have reached a conclusion. And yet, War and Peace went on being read, and it went on being allowed. Stalin would not allow it to be suppressed. As the Bolshevik paradise unfolded and many literary reputations, notably Dostoevsky's, went underground, Tolstoy mysteriously survived. This was partly owing to the pertinacity of his first editor and devoted disciple, Chertkov. But it was also because the straight Russianness of his largest epic was so big a part of everyone's emotional fabric. Though Lenin fulminated against the falsity of Tolstoyan ideas, Tolstoyism, he wrote shortly before the revolution, should be fought all along the line. This did no damage to Tolstoy as a national institution. Tolstoy conceded that in writing his scenes of war, he owed much to the battle scene of Stendhal's The Charter House of Parma. Biographers and literary historians have made surprisingly little of the fact that Dostoevsky's and Tolstoy's masterpieces were both published at the same time, in the same periodical, and by the same editor. Surprisingly little, too, has been made of the fact that there are distinct echoes, each of the other, in both the great books. Tolstoy was never so happy as when he was writing War and Peace. In War and Peace, he had been rearranging and rewriting his country's history as well as his own. If it had not been for Sofia Andreevna, War and Peace would have made him no more money than Katkoff chose to pay him for serialization. She persuaded Tolstoy to stop serializing and wait and sell it as a book. 
in the end, I am so thankful for my time spent reading this. It was highly informative. It was engaging and entertaining. And I loved that Wilson just had the confidence to assert what his goals were and really sort of sort things out for us along the way. But of course, with a figure like Tolstoy, I can't just read one biography. Of all the biographies on Tolstoy that I could have read as my second biography following the A.N. Wilson, I decided to go with the Bartlett biography. I found that this was such a prudent choice because it perfectly complements the A.N. Wilson and vice versa because the sort of standard anecdotes or the most catching and popularized anecdotes about Tolstoy, his life, his person, his writing, is all touched on in the A.N. Wilson. And those things are gone into depth in the A.N. Wilson, whereas Bartlett sort of passes over those and looks at other facets of Tolstoy and around Tolstoy and in his past and in the future after his death and seizes on those to give us a more complete picture of Tolstoy as a full human being. And the subtitle is A Russian Life. And she uses that to sort of frame her biography around all the different archetypes of Russian persona. Wilson is much more focused on Tolstoy, the writer and thinker and genius, and thus also goes into all of his fiction work a lot more deeply. Whereas Bartlett goes way more into, notably, his ABC books, his primers that he was putting together to educate peasant children. And th this was fascinating to read. And also all of his different religious tractates and papers and articles and notices. And Bartlett also takes time for each step of Tolstoy's life. And everything's told linearly in chronological uh, order. She looks at circumstances and people all around Tolstoy and connects dots and digs into different things. The other notable thing about the Bartlett biography is that whereas the A.N. Wilson was written during the time of Soviet Russia, Bartlett now had access to tons of archives and documents that the Soviets would not allow to be open for the public. It actually took me twice as long to read this one, probably because of the density of information as compared to the Wilson. But like I said, you're going to get a much bigger picture of Tolstoy's life. I'm just going to go through my notes just from cover to cover without trying to skip around and do it by category, as I did with the Wilson. In her introduction, she notes that he embodied at different times of his life a myriad Russian archetypes, from the repentant nobleman to the holy fool. Only Russia could have produced a writer like Tolstoy, but only Tolstoy could be likened in almost the same breath to both a czar and a peasant. And then she follows with a succinct statement of her overarching thesis. Tolstoy lived a profoundly Russian life. Stefan Zweig, meanwhile, said that Tolstoy had no face of his own. He possesses the face of the Russian people because in him, the whole of Russia lives and breathes. First of all, he lived the life of his privileged class, educated by private foreign tutors and waited on by serfs. He became a wealthy landowner at the age of 19 and immediately began exhibiting Russian maximalist tendencies by squandering his inheritance on gypsy singers and gambling. Whole villages were sold to pay off his debts, followed by his house. Tolstoy also lived up to the reputation of the depraved Russian landowner by taking advantage of his serf girls, then assumed another classic identity of the Russian noble. He became an army officer. Tolstoy became a writer, the most promising young writer of his generation. Tolstoy inevitably became a member of the intelligentsia, the peculiarly Russian class of people united by their education and usually critical stance towards their government. The deep guilt he now felt before the Russian peasantry, furthermore, made him a repentant nobleman, ashamed at his complicity in the immoral institution of serfdom. She notes that the emotional stability provided by his devoted wife, Sofia, also written and known as Sonia, 
bears enabled him next to become Russia's Homer. War and Peace was written at the happiest time in his life. And so already we see what we've been hearing in all the other critical works and biographical works that Tolstoy is pretty much the epitome of what Walt Whitman was talking about when he said, I'm large, I contain multitudes because I, you know, I contradict myself. Tolstoy contained multitudes of paradox and contradiction. He devised his own system for teaching Russian children from all backgrounds how to read and write by putting together an ABC and several reading primers. He taught himself Greek, then produced his own simplified translations of Aesop's fables. The nomadic spirit runs deep in Russia, and Tolstoy increasingly hankered as time went on to join their ranks. He had long ago started dressing like a peasant, but he soon wanted to dispense with money and private property altogether. But then, as Bartlett notes, from extreme piety, Tolstoy went to extreme nihilism. Home life now became very strained, particularly after Tolstoy renounced the copyright on all his new writings and gave away all his property to his family. By the 1890s, Tolstoy had become the most famous man in Russia, celebrated for a number of compellingly written and explosive tracts, setting out his views on Christianity, the Orthodox Church, and the Russian government, which were read all the more avidly for having been banned. There's nothing like banning books to increase its popularity. They circulated very successfully in Samizdat. One 23-year-old was noted as saying that there was something inexpressibly sincere touching and holy in the whole person of the great man. And we'll see this over and over, that there's just some extraordinary charisma that Tolstoy gave off. And no matter what you thought about him or his views, even towards the end, there was something about, something powerful about his physical presence. The Russian Orthodox Church, of course, excommunicated him. And so Tolstoy joined the illustrious ranks of Russian apostates. But because of his fame, Tolstoy was able to do what few others in Russia could do, speak out. The government was powerless to stop him, as it knew there would be international outrage if he was either arrested or exiled. There was a widespread feeling in Russia in the last decade of Tolstoy's life that he was the real czar. The Chechens admired Tolstoy for making friends with them during his time in the Caucasus. This was indeed highly unusual for Russian officers, who tended to treat natives with contempt, and for writing about them in a positive light. We get a lot more view of Sonia from Bartlett as well, and this is not to say that Wilson didn't do a good job, because in the midst of his biography, he makes very clear what his focus is, and it's not on going deeper into Sonia's life. But here's just a little bit of many places where Bartlett talks about Sonia. Sonia can be forgiven for becoming paranoid and historical in the last year of her husband's life. She can be forgiven a lot, as her husband treated her very badly by any account. Tolstoy's strengths were also his weaknesses, and his attitude towards the female gender is in general not admirable. Sonia did not, like him and their daughters, become vegetarian, nor did she want to dispense with money and private property. She just wanted to maintain the comfortable lifestyle she was used to, Sonia was a talented woman who selflessly put aside whatever interest she might have developed in order to go on burying the children her husband wanted, and help him as his copyist. For long years, she supported a man whose ego often blinded him to the needs of his family, and it was unfair of him to expect her to follow him meekly on his quest to lead a more spiritually enlightened, ascetic life just because he decided it was time to change. She also had her faults, however, and her rigidity stopped her from seeing that she could be just as controlling as Chertkov. And Chertkov is, again, a figure who comes up in Tolstoy's life, who has massive wealth, and he's able to station himself in Britain and get a lot of Tolstoy's work out of Russia, translated into the world. And towards the end of Tolstoy's life, he came to a place where he cherished and loved Chertkov virtually more than Sonia and wanted to give all of his rights to all of his works to Chertkov instead of Sonia and thus rob his family of all of those royalties and, and all that money that would be made after his death. And it was just, it was a mess. 
Bartlett also brings up a lot of Tolstoy's detractors, and I quite liked her quoting Alexander Boot, who was an admirer of Tolstoy the artist, but also the author of an effective hatchet job on Tolstoy the thinker. And you'll see this a lot. People appreciate the novelist in Tolstoy, but really nothing else is admirable. Boot says, he, meaning Tolstoy, wished to be more than a novelist, even one of genius. He wished to be more than a seer or a soothsayer, although that would have been a good start. He wished to be God. He wanted to correct God's mistakes in having allowed the world to become imperfect and sinful. He, Count Tolstoy, set out to usurp God's job. But the job was already taken, and the deity stubbornly hung on to it. Therefore, Tolstoy declared war on God and fought it with every means at his disposal. Alas, though he tried many lines of attack, each disguised by the camouflage of pseudo-Christian verbiage, Tolstoy came off a poor second. By way of revenge, he came, in effect, to deny God the Father, ignore God the Son, and dismiss God the Holy Spirit. No one was allowed to defeat Tolstoy and get away with it. That, that excerpt from Alexander Boot perfectly sums up Tolstoy outside of being just the, the novelist that Turgenev urged him to go back to. Tolstoy's philosophy of nonviolence, however, was revered by Gandhi, Wittgenstein, and Martin Luther King. If for nothing else, Tolstoy should be hailed for trying to improve literacy in a country where only a tiny percentage of the population could read and write at the end of the 19th century, for doing something about the national disaster threatened by famine, and for having the courage to speak some home truths to a complacent and corrupt regime which was indifferent to the poverty of its subjects. So you can't, in the end, and again, you cannot deny the good that came of the post-literary Tolstoy. And we now have a definitive 100-volume edition of Tolstoy's collected works. I think 99 of those were available to Ian Wilson, but now 100 were available to Bartlett. Tolstoy's life is rich and fascinating, but also deeply mythologized, and he himself contributed to the process of mythologization. And so I put a little note that hopefully, since this is in the, in the introduction, hopefully that is a promise to do some demythologizing, and indeed Bartlett does. When Tolstoy describes the position Nikolai Rostov finds himself in after the death of the old count in War and Peace, he is essentially telling the story of his father, who in 1821 took up a very minor appointment in Moscow's military bureaucracy. The magic solution for Tolstoy's father, as for Nikolai Rostov, was a rich bride. In the novel, she appears as Princess Maria Volkonskaya. In real life, she was Princess Maria Volkonskaya. It was through Maria Volkonskaya that Nikolai Ilyich's family came to be connected with Yasnaya Polyana, the country estate which would be irrevocably linked to Tolstoy's name. Compared to the Volkonskys, who were descended from the legendary Scandinavian settler Ryurik, the 9th century founder of Russia, the Tolstoys were actually mere parvenus, as a noble family. Tolstoy's maternal ancestors came from some of the most venerable and distinguished families in Russia. And I'm so glad that I decided to read another biography right on the heels of one, because somehow from the Ian Wilson, I had it in my mind that it was Tolstoy's paternal line that was the deep-rooted nobility. But in fact, it was the maternal line. This is talking about Tolstoy's grandfather. As a student of Voltaire, however, and a child of his time, it is more likely that he simply had no interest in building a church. This did not prevent him from having dozens of theological books in his library, not to mention a 20-volume edition of the Bible and accompanying exegesis. They sat next to works by Racine, Virgil, Montaigne, Rousseau, Homer, Plutarch, and Vasari, to mention just some of the authors collected by Nikolai Sergeyevich. Maria Nikolaevna had a good knowledge of five languages, including Russian, which was not all that common amongst upper-class Russian women at the time, for whom French was their first language. In his memoirs, Tolstoy also records that his mother was an accomplished pianist, artistically sensitive, and a born storyteller. Unfortunately, Tolstoy's mother would die when he was very, very young, and no images or any likenesses or sketches at all of her would be left behind, so he had this sort of 
spiritual attachment and elevated view of his mother that was not unlike Dante's Beatrice. Even in his 80s, Tolstoy could not talk about his mother without crying. On days when he felt particularly melancholy at the end of his life, he still had an intense longing to curl up and be comforted by his mother, who represented for him a supreme image of pure love. And this is about Tolstoy's father. Nikolai Ilyich was a keen reader. He added substantially to the library his youngest son would one day inherit by purchasing quantities of French classics and works about natural history. Tolstoy was later informed by his aunts that his father never bought new books until he had read the ones he already owned. Nikolai Ilyich was also artistically gifted and produced many fine watercolors of idyllic rural landscapes and pen and ink drawings, including a sensitively drawn sketch of a spirited Bashkirian horseman in native costume with bow and arrow. When he was about five years old, his beloved eldest brother Nikolai, then about 11, announced that the secret to human happiness was written on a little green stick, which was buried in the woods a short walk from their house. When the secret was revealed, he told his brothers, People would not only be happy, but they would also cease to be ill and would no longer be angry with each other. At that point, everybody became ant brothers. And so this is this utopian idealized brotherhood and this the, the famous green stick where he would later come to be buried in that same thatch of woods where his brother introduced him to that stick. But this ant brotherhood would be something that brought the, some of the Tolstoy siblings together. Many years later, when he was in his 60s, Tolstoy revealed the books that had made the most impression on him as a small boy. First of all, there were the books which made a great impression on him, and those included A Thousand and One Nights, Pushkin's 1821 poem, Napoleon. Then there was Anton Pogorelsky's story, The Black Hen or the Underground Residence, which made a very great impression on Tolstoy. The works which Tolstoy recorded in 1891 as having made an enormous impression on him as a child were the story of Joseph from the Bible, Russian fairy tales, and the popular folk epics about the semi-historical legendary heroes or bogaters, or bogatars, bogaters, bogaters of old Rus. He was renowned for his physical strength and stamina, spending long periods in the saddle and fighting with bravery while serving the Russian army. He was frequently portrayed in cartoons as a giant amongst the pygmies of contemporary Russian literature, or towering physically over his fellow writers. It is not surprising, then, that many visitors making the pilgrimage to visit the great sage of Yasnaya Polyana and expecting to encounter a giant were disconcerted to discover that Tolstoy was actually quite small. After Tolstoy turned 14 in August 1842, his brothers Nikolai and Sergei took him for the first time to a brothel. After committing the act for the first time that fateful day in Kazan, he had stood by the woman's bed and wept. And that time in his youth in Kazan, he later regretted the absence of moral guidance in his early teenage years because this was when he sort of entered into all the depravity and lustful indulgence that would so mark his life. Tolstoy excelled in his French exam and did well in German, English, Arabic, and Turkish, though he later claimed to have no memory of the last three. He also received good results for mathematics, logic, Russian literature, and religious studies, which, like most people of his background, he did not take seriously at all. Much later, in an early draft of Confession, he wrote that the whole edifice of theology collapsed for him as soon as he took an interest in philosophy when he was 16 and began to see that the catechism was a lie. Tolstoy did poorly in his Latin exam, having been un unable to translate even two lines of an ode by Horace, and even worse in statistics and geography. His performance in history was execrable. Tolstoy's university career was not distinguished, and he ended up leaving. Occasionally, there are references to novels that he enjoyed, in the scant literary, literature documenting his cause and years, such as The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo, two contemporary bestsellers by Alexandre Dumas. But when Tolstoy stumbled upon Pushkin's Eugene Onegin at a friend's house during these years, he was so entranced that he sat up all night reading it and started immediately reading it a second time when he got to the end. Tolstoy later drew up a list of the books which had greatest influence on him between the ages of 14 and 20. The most influential Russian works included, again, Eugene Onegin, 
Lermontov's A Hero of Our Time, Gogol's Dead Souls, Turgenev's A Hunter's Notes. Amongst the foreign volumes, we find Schiller's The Robbers and Stern's Sentimental Journey. Others that made a huge impression on him were Dickens's David Copperfield, The Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel According to St. Matthew, and Rousseau's Confessions and Emile. It was philosophy which most excited the young Tolstoy during his student years, and it was Jean-Jacques Rousseau who probably exercised more influence on Tolstoy than any other thinker over the course of his lifetime. After his rather dismal first year at university, Tolstoy spent the summer of 1845 at Yasnaya Polyana, during which time he did a lot of reading and thinking. He became interested in the ethical ideals of the pre-Christian cynics, Greek philosophers who preached, amongst other things, the virtues of a life without material possessions. For Antoinette, her nephew Lev now became an incomprehensible creature, obsessed with plumbing the depths of human existence, and only happy when he met someone prepared to listen to him hold forth passionately about his ideas. He was never happy with his looks, but his attempts to improve them did not always meet with very successful results. He once conceived the idea of shaving his eyebrows to make them grow back bushier, and ended up almost shaving them off completely. This oscillation between the setting of unrealistic puritanical goals for a future life of purity and self-denial, and the self-mortification which followed his actual pursuit of enjoyment in the present of a hedonistic social life, is the leitmotif of Tolstoy's first diary entry, which he famously began in the university's venereal disease clinic in March 1847. Tolstoy requested permission to leave Kazan University for health and domestic reasons. The study of the Nakaz had fired him with a desire to continue his studies independently and felt that his university curriculum would actually now hinder them. So Tolstoy left without taking a degree, having completed only the first two years of his law course. Tolstoy had grand plans for his new life as a member of Russia's land-owning nobility. He's 19 now, or thereabouts. He wanted to use his time wisely and for a noble and worthwhile purpose. So on the 17th of April, 1847, he set out in his diary what he planned to do over the next two years as the owner of Yasnaya Poliana. He would study French, German, English, Italian, Russian, and Latin, as well as acquire a moderate degree of perfection in music and painting. He would devote himself to history, geography, statistics, mathematics, and natural sciences, practical and theoretical medicine, and farming in all its aspects. He would complete his course of study in law so that he could take his final exam and graduate. He would write a dissertation. He would write essays on all the subjects he was going to study, and he would write down rules. But all those good intentions came to nothing. The very next day, he admitted somewhat sheepishly to himself that he was not actually capable of meeting his own ex expectations. And so he scaled everything back. And Tolstoy is one of those hungry and peripatetic minds who just needs to go from one new thing to another. And each new topic or whatever he would get interested in, he would seize on it and just dig and want to be an expert. And once he had accumulated proficiency, he would sort of grow bored, bored with it and move on. Tolstoy came of age at a very bleak time in Russia's history, which was something he became aware of only gradually. Nicholas I had begun his reign in 1825 by suppressing the Decembrist uprising and his regime had grown more repressive and reactionary as time went on. Tolstoy had his favorites amongst the gypsy girls, but he was chiefly drawn to the gypsies for their sultry, melancholic music and wild dancing. Another source of Tolstoy's dissatisfaction with himself in the summer of 1850 came from his inability to suppress the physical attraction he felt towards the pretty peasant girls on his estate. Like so many Russian landowners during the period, Tolstoy abused the, noble, the nobleman's privilege of owning serfs and exercised his droit de seigneur with peasant girls on a regular basis when he was a young man. He had been working his way through Montesquieu. Now he read Lamartine's newly published Histoire de Girondin, Bernardine de Saint-Pierre's Paul et Virginie, Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther, and Stern's Tristram Shandy. The Cossack lifestyle was certainly an eye-opener for him, 
they lived very close to nature. And so he, he was always attracted to this idea of the peasant lifestyle and the natural lifestyle. In 1855, down in the Crimea, Tolstoy clearly now felt emboldened to extend his reforming plans for the military. For in early March, he began sketching out a plan for modernizing the entire army, not just the artillery's weapons. At the same time that Tolstoy is preoccupied with military matters, he was also thinking deeply about religious questions. On the 4th of March, 1855, he took communion and made a remarkable declaration in his diary about the founding of a new religion. And he would indeed go on to found a new religion, and there would be Tolstoyans cropping up all over the world. I had to look this up and sort of challenge it, because this seems crazy, but Bartlett says Tolstoy, hailed as the first war correspondent, was adept at combining personal impressions conveyed in a conversational intimate tone with the lofty viewpoint of a historian or epic poet able to speak for the nation. This controversy amongst the Russian intelligentsia between the two warring camps of the Slavophiles and the Westernizers had first flared up in the previous decade, and the impassioned public debates about Russia's present and future would continue for the rest of Tolstoy's life. He probably already knew he was not a westernizer like Peter the Great was, but he would typically also come to reject Slavophile ideology and time, even though his preoccupations with traditional forms of native rural life would seem to make him a natural ally. But when it came down to it, Tolstoy's egotism would simply not allow him to become part of a movement in which he and his ideas did not take center stage. In the summer of 1858, another side of Tolstoy's physicality manifested itself when he fell in love, more deeply than he had ever been before, with a young peasant girl from a village six miles from Yasnaya, Pollyanna. Axinia Bazikinya had a largely absent husband, and Tolstoy found it hard to resist her charms. Their relationship was a serious one and lasted for over a year. Later, Axinia gave birth to a son, who was regarded by everyone at Yasnaya Pollyanna as Tolstoy's legitimate son. This would be something that, of course, Sonia would find out from his diaries that would be, as is understandable, uh, a source of much contention. Tolstoy's main mission as an educator was to introduce freedom into the learning experience. So pupils at his school there at Yasnaya Pollyanna were allowed to come and go as they pleased, and there was no corporal punishment. There was a solid curriculum of 12 subjects, but Tolstoy placed great importance on the need for flexibility to suit the needs of his pupils rather than those of the teacher. This was highly innovative at the time. And in fact, Tolstoy would get so interested in innovating education and educating the vast peasant population in Russia that he took trips to different places in Europe, Germany, Britain, to study the way education was done there. While the Ministry of Education approved Tolstoy's pedagogical activities, the Ministry of Internal Affairs took a very different view. Along with Tolstoy's adversaries amongst the landowners in his district, the Ministry of Internal Affairs perceived Tolstoy's schools as hotbeds of anarchy and revolution. The arrival of radical students was the last straw, and a secret police file was opened on Tolstoy in January 1862. In the late 1820s, Andre Bears, Sonia's father, became family doctor to the Turgenevs when the future writer was still a boy and accompanied them to Paris. For the next two years, he devoted himself to further study, Italian opera, and, it seems, Turgenev's redoubtable and unhappily married mother, who bore him an illegitimate child whom she raised as her ward, which makes Sonia Turgenev's half-sister. How about that? I hadn't heard that before. Tolstoy could occupy himself with domestic matters and marital bliss up to a point. But after a while, the prolonged distraction from his intellectual pursuits began to be irksome. Three weeks into their marriage, he confided to his diary, All this time I have been busy with matters which are termed practical, but I am finding this idleness difficult. I cannot respect myself. So I am not satisfied with myself and not clear in my relationships with others. I must work. Tolstoy became passionately interested in bees after he got married. And furthermore, he developed enthusiasms for the most diverse things throughout his life. Games, music, ancient Greek, schools, Japanese pigs, pedagogy, horse hunting, 
too many in fact to count. And that's not including his intellectual and literary interests. They were the most extreme. He was madly passionate about everything at the height of his enthusiasm. And if he could not convince whomever he was talking to of the importance of the activity he was caught up in, he was capable of becoming even hostile to that person. Bartlett tells us that the precision of his vocabulary, overlooked by most translators, tells us a great deal about the rigor he applied in his study of apiculture. And so I like that, how Bartlett, like I said, she ranges onto different paths that others just don't go down. It was with the birth of Sergei that the happiest years of the Tolstoy's marriage began. Lev and Sonia's relationship became stronger and more stable. It was during this time that he wrote the first chapters of War and Peace after trying out 15 different openings. Tolstoy's skewed presentation of history in War and Peace has attracted criticism ever since it was published. Indeed, some of his accounts of the battles in 1812 left some veterans apoplectic with rage at his manipulation of historical sources to suit his own artistic and ideological ends. There is nevertheless a general consensus on the authenticity of his portrayal of the events at Borodino. After coming back from Borodino, Tolstoy finished the part of his novel which culminates with Natasha's seduction by Anatole Kurigan. This comes at the halfway mark in the final version of the novel, at the end of volume two. Tolstoy reg regarded this episode as the crux of the entire work, since it functions as a kind of mirror of Napoleon's violation of Russia, with which it coincides, and he found it extremely difficult to write. I never thought about that when I was reading War and Peace. I didn't think about the parallel of Natasha and Anatole with Russia and Napoleon. Sonia gave birth to four children during the six years Tolstoy was writing War and Peace, and also suffered at least one miscarriage. When she was not looking after their children, Sonia worked willingly as her husband's scribe and thus became intimately involved in his creative life. And this was a setup that they both thoroughly enjoyed. And by all accounts, she seemed to be really good at what she did, helping him to copy out, not just copy out his writing from his illegible hand into fair copies, but also talking with him and helping him shape the work, being a sounding board and input for ideas. Tolstoy worked phenomenally hard during the six years it took to write War and Peace, and Sonia had to bite her lip on the frequent occasions when he was late for dinner. As she records in her autobiography, she would tell herself on such occasions that being on time for meals was too petty a concern for geniuses like her husband, and she did indeed, judging from her diary entries, believe that her husband was a genius. One writer was not exaggerating when he proclaimed that Tolstoy had now become a real lion of literature. This is excerpted from a letter that Turgenev sent to a French publisher to tell him about the phenomenon uh, Lev Tolstoy. And Turgenev said, Lev Tolstoy is the most popular amongst modern Russian writers and War and Peace, if I may be so bold, is one of the most remarkable books of our time. And he goes on to say, the manner in which Count Tolstoy develops his theme is as new as it is original. This is not Walter Scott, and it goes without saying, this is also not Alexandre Dumas. Count Tolstoy is a Russian writer to the core of his being. Chapter 8 begins with an epigram that's taken from Tolstoy's diary in 1870, and he wrote, Poetry is the fire burning in a person's soul. This fire burns, warms, and brings light. There are some people who feel the heat, others who feel the warmth, others who just see the light, and others who do not even see the light. But the true poet cannot help burning painfully and burning others. That's what it is all about. He spent the following summer immersed in German philosophy, then embarked on an intense study of Russian fairy tales and folk epics, with a view to putting together books to help children learn to read. He read Shakespeare and Moliere and started writing a play. He toyed with new ideas for a novel about Peter the Great, and at the same time began contemplating another completely different novel about the predicament of a high society woman in contemporary Russia. He also began learning ancient Greek. But what he really enjoyed was cross-country skiing out in the woods and skating on the big pond below his house. When summer arrived, he worked in the garden, digging up nettles and burdock and tidying up the flower beds. He also took himself off to the fields to spend whole days mowing with the peasants. 
when he was engaged in physical pursuits, Tolstoy could stave off the dark thoughts that threatened to encroach on him during what he called the dead time between writing projects. It was a time of terrible uncertainty. Two years after he finished War and Peace, he still felt so low that he confided in Sergei Yusserov that he had no will to live and had never felt so miserable in all his life. Misreading the symptoms, which at this point her husband himself did not fully understand, Sonia became increasingly anxious for him to start another book. It would be three years before Tolstoy started Anna Karenina, however, and writing it would prove to be as arduous as the writing of War and Peace had been stimulating. This is one of the many just little asides to connect Tolstoy's life to other things going on at the same time, but it struck me that Richard Wagner was engaged with composing his Ring Cycle at the same time Tolstoy was engaged in writing War and Peace. There's something there that sparks my thoughts. Sonia was a devoted mother, and she loved living at Yasnaya Polyana. But she was also a young woman who had grown up in a city, and after a while she began to long for a change of scene, some company, and the chance to go to the occasional soiree. She found the solitude depressing. Tolstoy was never short of new ideas for novels, but what was the point of executing them when the vast majority of the population could not even read? It's a great question. And so then we go into the ABC, the big primer, and it's amazing. We get some facsimiles of the pages that were in it and a lot of detail on how it was composed. It was something totally new for typesetters. They didn't even know how to typeset some of this stuff because Tolstoy was very adamant about the way in which certain things would appear. But he was convinced that that, the ABC book, was the work he would be remembered for. And it rated to him even higher than War and Peace. There was now an intense period of work to finish the three remaining books of the ABC. Typically for Tolstoy, the printing process had begun while he was still writing and adding to his manuscript, but he was an inveterate risk taker and gambler. The new ABC proved to be as successful as the first edition had been a failure. No other textbook, however, was more widely read in pre-revolutionary Russia. The poet Anna Akhmatova was just one of scores of Russians who benefited from Tolstoy's child-centered approach in learning their alphabet. It's fascinating. Tolstoy had conclusively proved that he wanted to improve the deplorable literacy levels in Russia and that he cared deeply about Russian boys and girls of all classes discovering the joys of their native language when they learn to read. And this is so true. Bartlett makes a, a wonderful assertion there because this was not, it's, it was so much work that he put into this. And yet we see clearly that it wasn't for profit, or at least not in the form of selfish gain or monetary gain for himself. He truly cared about these peasants and the illiterate. As Sonia later emphasized, her husband's work was always the most important thing in his life. And she would later actually reprove him for the neglect of their younger children when he became a full-time campaigner on behalf of the oppressed. Unfortunately, as that passage states, Tolstoy went so far down that path trying to help the peasants that he almost completely ignored his family. Neither Tolstoy nor Sonia knew English well. So before the arrival of their English governess that they hired to come educate their own kids, they read their way through Wilkie Collins's A Woman in White. I just thought that was uh, incredible to think about the two of them, Sonia and Tolstoy, uh, working together to read, of all things, A Woman in White. Here's a little fun fact. Tolstoy liked to name his dogs after characters in novels by Dickens. Tolstoy himself certainly contemplated divorce, too, on occasion, but his increasingly troubled marriage was stable and conventional when compared to the marriages of his relatives and friends. And so Bartlett explores not just the diaries of Sonia and Tolstoy, but she surveys all the different marriages around them and close to them and goes into their documents to piece together the way things were at that time. Anna Karenina reflects Tolstoy's engagement with the French novel of adultery, but also his enthusiasm for English fiction, which he highly revered. He once stated quite boldly that English books were the best and that he always found something fresh and new in them. At the age of 49, he became a devout Orthodox communicant, 
been a trenchant critic of the church. He undertook a root and branch study of all the major world religions and wrote a searing work of spiritual autobiography about his quest for the meaning of life. He produced a new translation of the Gospels and set out to follow Christ's teaching. And then he began protesting loudly in the name of that teaching against the Orthodox Church. At the end of the 1880s, Alexander III would brand Tolstoy as a godless nihilist and a dangerous figure who needed to be stopped. The spiritual crisis that Dostoevsky underwent during his years of Siberian exile in the early 1850s resulted in him jettisoning atheism and socialism and embracing Christianity, specifically Russian Orthodox Christianity, with ever greater further. Tolstoy did more or less the opposite. In an oft-quoted passage in his memoirs, this is someone other than Tolstoy, he describes Tolstoy pointing one winter morning to the frosty patterns made on the window pane by the sun, which he compared to popular religious belief. The people see the patterns, Tolstoy explained, whereas I want to look beyond them towards the source of the light. So it's sort of like, that's like Plato's cave theory. Tolstoy wants to go up out of the cave. Or not cave theory, cave uh, analogy. As he moved on past Anna Karenina, Tolstoy wrote to Strykov in October 1880 that he had been misguided all his adult life by equating goodness first with his aspirations to be awarded the St. George Cross, then with the writing of novels and owning land, and finally with having a family, as he now knew that true goodness could only be found in the Gospels. In 1880, Tolstoy began to break with old friends and relatives who were left feeling hurt and confused. During World War I, Tolstoy's Gospel in Brief made a profound impression on Ludwig Wittgenstein, who chanced to find it in a bookshop in Galicia. He later claimed it had virtually kept him alive. I had no, indeed, I had no idea that Wittgenstein pointed to Tolstoy's rewriting of the Gospels as something that kept him from suicide. Bartlett says about Sonia during these tumultuous times later in Tolstoy's life that Perhaps if she had not endured 12 pregnancies, three miscarriages, and ensuing bouts of serious illness, and had not borne the responsibilities of running a large household on her shoulders, she could have followed her husband on his spiritual journey and spent her time reading books. She had grown into adulthood under his tutelage, and now she was expected to renounce all the values he had inculcated in her and meekly follow him but she wondered how it would be possible to eke out an existence on next to no income with eight children to clothe and feed. And this is a great point about the contentions in their marriage. Tolstoy just did this 180 and expected Sonia and his children to follow suit, but he wasn't thinking rationally at all, whereas she was, and she was already performing the role of the wife he had molded early on. Tolstoy consoled himself that autumn by studying Hebrew with a Moscow rabbi, who was rather taken aback to find his pupil arguing with him about the meaning of certain passages of the Old Testament after only a few lessons. This is Tolstoy, the egotist and the autodidact. In the spring of 1884, as he recovered from the exhaustion of completing the initial writing of What I Believe, and then the various stages of proofreading, he learned how to cobble shoes and read Confucius and Lao Tzu. The character of King Lear at the end of Shakespeare's play is English literature's nearest equivalent to the Holy Fool, that peculiarly Russian form of sainthood to which Tolstoy aspired and which is not encountered in any other religious culture. Russia's Holy Fools deliberately challenge social conventions to mock the falsehood of the temporal world unafraid of speaking the truth to all classes, including rulers. Relinquishing all material comforts, they dressed in rags and led ascetic lives, like the vagabond Stronix, voluntarily accepting humiliation and insults in order to conquer their pride and thus achieve greater humility and meekness. Where Tolstoy previously used to have two or three visitors per week in the early 1880s, there were sometimes as many as 35 people a day wanting to see him during the last years of his life when he became a sort of prophet. In 1887, an American critic published an article in Harper's Bazaar about the tumultuous reaction to the sudden arrival of Russian literature in the English-speaking world, describing Tolstoy as the greatest writer of fiction 
living or dead. Tolstoy's main writing project at the end of his life was the compilation of several exhaustive volumes of his daily sayings and maxims from his favorite writers and philosophers. He was in need of their solace, and he was unhappy for much of the last 15 years of his life. He still felt obligations to his family, but found it endlessly painful having to put up with the trappings of his once seigneurial lifestyle when he was longing to take to the road as a penniless and penitent stronach. And as his friend Vladimir Chertkov assumed ever more influence over his affairs, Tolstoy's relationship with his wife steadily deteriorated. And of course, this is referencing that calendar of wisdom or cycle of reading. Bartlett tells us that Sonia's suicide attempts were really just desperate ploys to seek attention. Sonia was exhausted by the stress of caring for six-year-old Venechka, who was frequently sick, and by the struggle to keep her marriage going and raise their four youngest children on her own. What a life. Tolstoy liked folk music and gypsy music and most of Haydn, but otherwise was very selective about approving works by the other major Western European composers. His favorite composer, despite his general animus towards elite Western culture, was by far and away Chopin, which is somewhat ironic given that he was a salon musician par excellence. The excommunication of Tolstoy caused a sensation amongst Russia's educated classes, but it is worth pointing out that many Russian rural priests had scant knowledge of Tolstoy beyond knowing that he was an aristocrat who wrote society novels. The majority of peasants, meanwhile, knew only that he was a count, and thus representative of the nobility who were hated and distrusted. But there was nevertheless a significant number who followed Father Eowen of Kronstadt in believing that Tolstoy was the Antichrist. It is noteworthy that the Brothers Karamazov was the book Tolstoy was reading when he finally left Yasnaya Polyana at the end of his life and went on the last of his many visits to the monastery. That same Father Eowen would write a prayer requesting that Tolstoy die soon. But, as Bartlett points out, it was Father Eowen who died in 1908, not Tolstoy. For his 80th birthday, Charles Wright, librarian at the British Museum, arrived at Yasnaya Poliana with birthday greetings signed by 800 English writers, artists, and public figures, including George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, and Edmund Gose. He also, in January 1908, received his first birthday present, a phonograph sent to him by Thomas Edison. Tolstoy had been tipped for one of the recently introduced Nobel Prizes several times and had published a letter in the Stockholm Tageblatt in 1897 suggesting the Dukabors were more deserving recipients of the prize money. But the Swedish Academy had been repeatedly frightened off by his anarchism. Again, coming back to the contention between Chertkov and Sonia late in Tolstoy's life, in a letter of 1911, she told Tolstoy's newest secretary that she could not tolerate being supplanted in her husband's affections by Chertkov. She had spent 48 years being married to Tolstoy, as the most important person in his life, and now to have her husband tell her that Chertkov was the closest person to him was unbearable. Sonia did not behave well in the last few months of Tolstoy's life, and numerous doctors correctly diagnosed paranoia and hysteria. But, Bartlett tells us, she was not mentally ill. She just felt out of control, usurped, and desperate. She feared poverty, and she feared her name being blackened. Tolstoy's death, in fact, acted as a catalyst for political action. Governments, monarchies, and state authority had already become irrelevant and impotent. The Russian population at large had seized the initiative and was now beginning to write the script. It was a defining moment. The import of these unprecedented events, meaning the unprecedented events that happened as a response to Tolstoy's death, was not lost on one exiled revolutionary in Switzerland, Vladimir Lenin, who wrote three new articles on Tolstoy in November 1910. Tolstoy was still just a mirror of diverse and contradictory impulses in Russia, in his view, in Lenin's view. But the nation had moved on since 1905. Tolstoy had taken giant steps during his lifetime, and his death was one last giant step on the road to revolution. Isaiah Berlin's 1953 essay on Tolstoy's view of history, his theories of history, called The Hedgehog and the Fox, 
is a monumental staple in Tolstoy studies. I read it once before years and years and years and years ago during a course on critical texts and different literary studies across history, and not a lot of it really stuck with me. I mean, it was obviously well written. It was a pleasure to read such prose for its own sake and for its obvious incisive mind and scholarly aptitude, but not having read War and Peace, it didn't really stick. So this time reading it was an immense pleasure because I have faced and immersed myself in the very texts and ideas and arguments and even secondary comments on exactly what Berlin is taking to task here. He superbly handles the contradictions and blindnesses of Tolstoy's theories of history without shying away from the gross flaws and yet not diminishing Tolstoy's abilities as an artist or a thinker. It's a really well-executed balancing act. It provides an incisive explication of Tolstoy's theory by going through all of the pertinent texts and passages in War and Peace and just synthesizes, breaks it down, and presents it to us beautifully. But then Berlin also augments this explication with various authorities from opposing camps who also comment upon Tolstoy's theory of history. And then finally, probably in terms of academia and scholarship, the biggest element, the most notable element, is that Berlin traces the influences and development of Tolstoy's theory to find a source that is not Rousseau or Schopenhauer. It kicks off with a sentence that explains this eye-catching title. There is a line among the fragments of the Greek poet Archilochus, which says, The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. Dante belongs to the first category, meaning the hedgehog. Shakespeare to the second, meaning the fox. Plato, Lucretius, Pascal, Hegel, Dostoevsky, Nietzsche, Isben, Proust are in varying degrees hedgehogs. Herodotus, Aristotle, Montaigne, Erasmus, Moliere, Goethe, Pushkin, Balzac, Joyce are foxes. But when we come to Count Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy and ask this of him, ask whether he belongs to the first category or the second, whether he is a monist or a pluralist, whether his vision is of one or of many, whether he is of a single substance or compounded of heterogeneous elements, there is no clear or immediate answer. I shall confine myself to suggesting that the difficulty may be, at least in part, due to the fact that Tolstoy was himself not unaware of the problem and did his best to falsify the answer. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. The hypothesis I wish to offer is that Tolstoy was by nature a fox, but believed in being a hedgehog. This reminds me of what I said earlier, my comment about reading The Sunset Limited by Cormac McCarthy, that in the Reading McCarthy podcast, someone pointed out that they believe McCarthy believes like white, but wishes he believed like black. The conflict between what he was and what he believed emerges nowhere so clearly as in his view of history, to which some of his most brilliant and most paradoxical pages are devoted. So we're going to go here even beyond what Jeff Love was able to do in his essay on the history bits of War and Peace. Contemporary historians and military specialists, at least one of whom had himself fought in 1812, indignantly complained of inaccuracies of fact and since then, damning evidence has been adduced of falsification of historical detail by the author of War and Peace. So Berlin's not shying away from the truth, from the facts here. He's not trying to view Tolstoy through the rosy glasses. Done apparently by Tolstoy with deliberate intent, in full knowledge of the available original sources and in the known absence of any counter evidence, Falsification perpetrated, it seems, in the interests not so much of an artistic as of an ideological purpose. 
This consensus of historical and aesthetic criticism seems to have set the tone for nearly all later appraisals of the ideological content of War and Peace, and Berlin's going to help break through this straitjacket. Historians of Russian thought tend to label this aspect of Tolstoy as fatalism and move on to the more interesting historical theories of other historical theorists. And I found that I did this too in my commentary, uh, especially in the end after reading the second part of the epilogue, I drew that same conclusion that, okay, it's a determinism, a staunch determinism, determinism, a fatalist framework here. So when I read this early on in the essay, I was hooked. I'm very keen to uh, have my presumptions and conclusions leveled and rebuilt. Tolstoy's interest in history began, began early in his life. It seems to have arisen not from interest in the past as such, but from the desire to penetrate to first causes, to understand how and why things happen as they do and not otherwise, from discontent with those current explanations which do not explain and leave the mind dissatisfied, from a tendency to doubt and place under suspicion and, if need be, reject what does not fully answer the question to go to the root of every matter, at whatever cost. This remained Tolstoy's attitude throughout his entire life, and is scarcely a symptom either of trickery or of superficiality. Tolstoy remained an enemy of transcendentalism from the beginning to the end of his life. He grew up during the heyday of the Hegelian philosophy, which sought to explain all things in terms of historical development, but conceived this process as being ultimately not susceptible to the methods of empirical investigation. History, as it is normally written, usually represents political or public events as the most important, while spiritual or inner events are largely forgotten. Yet, prima facie, it is they, the inner events, that are the most real, the most immediate experience of human beings. They, and only they, are what life, in the last analysis, is made of. Hence, the routine political historians are talking shallow nonsense. This is describing Tolstoy's view. In a letter written while he was working on War and Peace, he said with bitterness that he had no doubt that what the public would like best would be his scenes of social and personal life, his ladies and his gentlemen with their petty intrigues and entertaining conversations and marvelously described small idiosyncrasies. But these are the trivial flowers of life, not the roots. So we see which pieces of War and Peace Tolstoy saw as the most important, yet not unrelated, just as roots are not unrelated to flowers. As an acute literary historian has pointed out, Tolstoy sometimes seems almost deliberately to ignore the historical evidence, and more than once consciously distorts the facts in order to bolster up his favorite thesis. The character of Kutsutsov is a case in point. And then Berlin steps in and says, but Kutsutsov was a real person. And it is all the more instructive to observe the steps by which he transforms in the novel or in the drafts of the novel from the sly, elderly, feeble voluptuary, the corrupt and somewhat sycophantic courtier of the early drafts of War and Peace, which were based on authentic sources, into the unforgettable symbol of the Russian people in all its simplicity, simplicity and intuitive wisdom. And that's very, very interesting to note that in early drafts of War and Peace, he actually presented Kutuzov, for example, historically accurate from the sources that were at his disposal, but then changed him. The final apotheosis of Kutuzov is totally unhistorical for all Tolstoy's repeated professions of his undeviating devotion to the sacred cause of the truth. And now here's a breakdown of Tolstoy's dilemma and beliefs on history, the individual, freedom, determinism, free will, and so on. And Berlin just does such a great job here. The individual is, in some sense, free when he alone is involved. But once he is involved in relationships with others, he is no longer free. He is part of the inexorable stream. Freedom is real, but it is confined to trivial acts. At other times, even this feeble ray of hope is extinguished. 
Tolstoy declares that he cannot admit even small exceptions to the universal law. Causal determinism is either wholly pervasive or it is nothing and chaos reigns. Power and accident are but names for ignorance of the causal chains, but the chains exist whether we feel them or not. We never shall discover all the causal chains that operate. The number of such causes is infinitely great. Historians select an absurdly small portion of them and attribute everything to this arbitrarily chosen tiny section. How would an ideal historical science operate? By using a kind of calculus whereby this differential, the infinitesimals, the infinitely small human and non-human actions and events would be integrated. And in this way, the continuum of history would no longer be distorted by being broken up into arbitrary segments. Tolstoy expresses this notion of calculation by infinitesimals with great lucidity and with his habitual, simple, vivid, precise use of words. Berlin goes on to say that Henri Bergson, who made his name with his theory of reality as a flux fragmented artificially by the natural sciences and thereby distorted and robbed of continuity in life, developed a very similar point at infinitely greater length, less clearly, less plausibly, and with an unnecessary parade of terminology. Tolstoy arrives at no clear conclusion, only at the view, in some respects, like Burke's, that it is better to realize that we understand what goes on as we do, in fact, understand it, than to seek to subvert such common sense beliefs, which at least have the merit of having been tested by long experience, in favor of pseudosciences, which being founded on absurdly inadequate data, are only a snare and a delusion. This is his case against all forms of optimistic rationalism, the natural sciences, liberal theories of progress, German military expertise, French sociology, confident social engineering of all kinds. And this is his reason for inventing a Katuzov who followed his simple Russian untutored instinct, and despised or ignored the, Germans, French, and Itali the German, French, and Italian experts, and for raising him to the status of a national hero, which he has, partly as a result of Tolstoy's portrait in War and Peace, retained ever since. I love this. War and Peace, Karayev tells us. Karayev is, I don't know, somebody, I forgot, uh, a historian. The historian Karayev tells us that War and Peace is a historical poem on the philosophical theme of the duality of human life. Probably the best one sentence summary of War and Peace I've encountered. Tolstoy's concern with history derives from a deeper source than abstract interest in historical method or philosophical objections to given types of historical practice. It seems to spring from something more personal, a bitter, inner conflict between his actual experience and his beliefs, between his vision of life and his theory of what it and he himself ought to be if the vision was to be bearable at all, between the immediate data, which he was too honest and too intelligent to ignore, and the need for an interpretation of them which did not lead to the childish absurdities of all previous views. He saw the manifold objects and situations on earth in their full multiplicity. He grasped their individual essences and what divided them from what they were not, with a clarity to which there is no parallel. Tolstoy perceived reality in its multiplicity as a collection of separate entities round and into which he saw with a clarity and penetration scarcely ever equaled, but he believed only in one vast unitary whole. No author who has ever lived has shown such powers of insight into the variety of life. The differences, the contrasts, the collisions of persons and things and situations, each apprehended in its absolute uniqueness and conveyed with a degree of directness and a precision of concrete imagery to be found in no other writer. Very well said. No one has ever excelled Tolstoy in expressing the specific flavor the exact quality of a feeling, the degree of its oscillation, the ebb and flow, the minute movements, which Turgenev mocked as a mere trick on his part, the inner and outer texture and feel of a look, a thought, a pang of sentiment, 
no less than of a specific situation, of an entire period, of the lives of individuals, families, communities, entire nations. Yet what he believed in was the opposite. He advocated a single embracing vision. He preached not variety, but simplicity. Not many levels of consciousness, but a reduction to some single level. On these subjects, he wrote as an amateur, not as a professional. But let it be remembered that he belonged to the world of great affairs. He was a member of the ruling class of his country and his time, and he knew and understood it completely. He lived in an environment exceptionally crowded with theories and ideas. He examined a great deal of material for war and peace, parenthetical, though, as several Russian scholars have shown, not as much as is sometimes supposed. He traveled a great deal and met many notable public figures in Germany and France. That he read widely and was influenced by what he read cannot be doubted. And now we're about to lead into this unveiling of a deeper and closer source of inspiration for Tolstoy's historical theories. The best avowed of all Tolstoy's literary debts is, of course, that to Stendhal, but Stendhal's not the one. In his celebrated interview in 1901 with Paul Boyer, or Paul Boyer, Tolstoy coupled Stenhall and Rousseau as the two writers to whom he owed most, and added that all he had learnt about war he had learnt from Stenhall's description of the Battle of Waterloo in La Sartreuse de Palme. But there is a figure behind Stenhall, a celebrated writer with whose works Tolstoy was certainly acquainted and to whom he owed a greater debt than is commonly supposed. This figure was the famous Joseph de Maistre, and the full story of his influence on Tolstoy, although it has been noted by students of Tolstoy, and by at least one critic of Maistre, still largely remains to be written. And then we move into an incredible feat of scholarship whereby Berlin backs this claim up and proves it out. Books on him, Maistre began to appear and excited a good deal of discussion in Russian literary and historical circles. Tolstoy possessed the soiree, as well as Maestro's di diplomatic correspondence and letters, and copies of them were to be found in the library at Yasnaya Polyana. It is in any case quite clear that Tolstoy used them extensively in War and Peace. Thus, the celebrated description of Paluchi's intervention in the debate of the Russian general staff at Drissa is reproduced almost verbatim from a letter by Maestro. This is the lesson which Tolstoy says he derived from Stenhall, but the words of Prince Andrei about Austerlitz, we lost because very early on we told ourselves we had lost, as well as the attribution of Russian victory over Napoleon to the strength of the Russian desire to survive, echo Maestro, not Stendhal. This close parallelism between Maestro's and Tolstoy's views about the chaos and uncontrollability of battles and wars with its larger implications for human life generally, together with the contempt of both for the naive explanations provided by academic historians to account for human violence and lust for war, was noted by the eminent French historian Albert Sorel in a little-known lecture to the École de Sciences Politiques delivered on April 7, 1888. Maestra and Tolstoy attached the greatest possible importance to war and conflict. But Maestra, and this is where we're moving into Berlin, showing that there are, in fact, differences between the two. Maestra, like Proudhon after him, and Proudhon is probably the writer after whose book, War and Peace, in French, Tolstoy got his title, glorifies war and declares it to be mysterious and divine, while Tolstoy detests it, detests war, and regards it as in principle explicable if only we knew enough of the many minute causes, the celebrated differential of history. What is it that Pierre has learnt, of which Princess Maria's marriage is an acceptance, that Prince André all his life pursued with such agony? Like Augustine, Tolstoy can only say what it is not, so this is hinting at what is called a negative theology or negative philosophy. His genius is devastatingly destructive. He can only attempt to point towards his goal by exposing the false signposts to it, to isolate the truth by annihilating that which it is not, namely all that can be said in the clear analytical language that corresponds to the all too clear but necessarily limited vision of the foxes, those who see in many instead of one. Like Moses, he must halt at the borders of the promised land. 
I love that analogy. He knows that it exists and can tell us, as no one else has ever told us, all that it is not. Above all, not anything that art or science or civilization or rational criticism can achieve. Despite their deep dissimilarity between Maistre and Tolstoy, and indeed violent opposition to one another, Tolstoy's skeptical realism and Maistre's dogmatic authoritarianism are blood brothers, for both spring from an agonized belief in a single serene vision in which all problems are resolved, all doubts stilled, peace and understanding finally achieved. And Berlin closes his illuminating, powerful, wonderful essay with this. Tolstoy's sense of reality was, until the end, too devastating to be compatible with any moral ideal which he was able to construct out of the fragments into which his intellect shivered the world. And he dedicated all of his vast strength of mind and will to the lifelong denial of this fact. At once insanely proud and filled with self-hatred, omniscient and doubting everything, cold and violently passionate, contemptuous and self-abasing, tormented and detached, surrounded by an adoring family, by devoted followers, by the admiration of the entire civilized world, and yet almost wholly isolated. He is the most tragic of the great writers, a desperate old man, beyond human aid, wandering self-blinded at colonists. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. To close it out, I want to talk about a book that I actually started to read along with War and Peace, but quickly abandoned. Not because this book isn't any good, just because War and Peace was so good and so engaging that I wanted to totally immerse myself in it and put everything else aside. What I'm talking about is Yu Yun Lee's Tolstoy Together, 85 Days of War and Peace. I picked this up as I was just searching for general books on war and peace. And what this represents is a textual bound together form of a collaborative online reading group that Yu Yun Lee headed with a bunch of different writers and critics and scholars and lay readers to go through systematically and read War and Peace together over the course of 85 days. And it's laid out in a format that tells you exactly which parts of War and Peace you should read for each day. And then it has different little sound bites or they're almost like tweets, little blurbs from different people from the time that this actually took place. And it's also interspersed with these great little essays. One of my favorite writers from The New Yorker, Alexandra Schwartz, has an essay in here and a lot of this stuff is funny and then profound and then I mean sometimes even irritating and every now and then she'll even pit two opposing ideas or assertions side by side it's really neat but the only thing that I want to read here to close the video is the very first page which represents the introduction because I could not say this better than Yi Yun Lee. Once upon a time, five people with strong opinions were invited to view an old tree and offer their thoughts. The first one says, I'm a big picture person. At first glance, I can say this tree is too big for its own good. We need to lop off some limbs. The second one says, it's not the architecture of the tree that bothers me, but the parts that make up the whole. Anywhere I direct my attention, I can see 10 or 20 imperfect leaves. The third person says, This tree is much too old to be relevant. Its life began when the world was wrong in many ways. Patriarchal, despotic, undemocratic. Why should we care about something growing out of that history? The fourth one says, The world is still wrong in many ways. A tree like this does little to solve the political, socio-economic, and environmental issues of today. The fifth one says, I'm not a tree person. Roses and nightingales are worthy subjects of my attention, and I consider it an insult to my talent to be asked to look at a tree. Anytime one talks about war and peace, one is reminded of that tree's critics. Fortunately, a majestic tree has no need for a defender.